Part 15 of Lincoln's Yarns and Stories by Alexander K. McClure. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 15. Angels Couldn't Swear It Right. The President was once speaking about an attack made on him by the Congressional Committee on the Conduct of the War for a certain alleged blunder in the Southwest the matter involved being one which had fallen directly under the observation of the army officer to whom he was talking who possessed official evidence completely upsetting all the conclusions of the committee might it not be well for me queried the officer to set this matter right in a letter to some paper stating the facts as they actually transpired oh no replied the president at least not now if i were to try to read much less answer all the attacks made on me this shop might as well be closed for any other business i do the very best i know how the very best i can and i mean to keep doing so until the end if the end brings me out all right what is said against me won't amount to anything if the end brings me out wrong ten thousand angels swearing i was right would make no difference must go and go to stay ward hill layman was president lincoln cerebrus his watchdog guardian friend companion and confidant some days before lincoln's departure for washington to be inaugurated he wrote to layman at bloomington that he desired to see him at once he went to springfield and lincoln said hill on the eleventh i go to washington and i want you to go along with me our friends have already asked me to send you as consul to paris you know i would cheerfully give you anything for which our friends may ask or which you may desire but it looks as if we might have war in that case i want you with me in fact i must have you so get yourself ready and come along it will be handy to have you around if there is to be a fight i want you to help me to do my share of it as you have done in times past you must go and go to stay this is layman's version of it lincoln wasn't buying nominations to a party who wished to be empowered to negotiate reward for promises of influence in the chicago convention eighteen sixty mr lincoln replied no gentlemen i have not asked the nomination and i will not buy it with pledges if i am nominated and elected i shall not go into the presidency as the tool of this man or that man or as the property of any factor or clique he envied the soldier at the front after some very bad news had come in from the army in the field lincoln remarked to schuyler colfax how willingly would i exchange places today with the soldier who sleeps on the ground in the army of the potomac don't trust too far in the campaign of eighteen fifty two lincoln in reply to douglas's speech wherein he spoke of confidence in providence replied let us stand by our candidate uh, general scott as faithfully as he has always stood by our country and i much doubt if we do not perceive a slight abatement of judge douglas's confidence in providence as well as the people i suspect that confidence is not more firmly fixed with the judge than it was with the old woman whose horse ran away with her in a buggy she said as she trusted in providence till the britchin broke and then she didn't know what on earth to do he'd uh, risk the dictatorship lincoln's great generosity to his leaders was shown when in january eighteen sixty three he assigned fighting joe hooker to the command of the army of the potomac hooker had believed in a military dictatorship and it was an open secret that mcclellan might have become such had he possessed the nerve lincoln however was not bothered by this prattle as he did not think enough of it to relieve mcclellan of his command the president said to hooker i have heard in such a way as to believe it of your recently saying that both the army and the government needed a dictator of course it was not for this but in spite of it that i have given you the command only those generals who gain success can be dictators 
what i now ask of you is military success and i will risk the dictatorship lincoln also believed hooker had not given cordial support to general burnside when he was in command of the army in lincoln's own peculiarly plain language he told hooker that he had done a great wrong to the country and to a most meritorious and honorable brother officer major general i reckon at one time the president had the appointment of a large additional number of brigadier and major generals among the immense number of applications mr lincoln came upon one wherein the claims of a certain worthy not in the service at all for a generalship were glowingly set forth but the applicant didn't specify whether he wanted to be brigadier or major general the president observed this difficulty and solved it by a lucid endorsement the clerk on receiving the paper again found written across its back major general i reckon a lincoln would see the tracks judge herndon lincoln's law partner said he never saw lincoln more cheerful than on the day previous to his departure from springfield for washington and judge gillespie who visited him a few days earlier found him in excellent spirits i told him that i believed it would do him good to get down to washington said herndon i know it will lincoln replied i only wish i could have got there to lock the door before the horse was stolen but when i get to the spot i can find the tracks abe give her a sure tip if all the days lincoln attended school were added together they would not make a single year's time and he never studied grammar or geography or any of the higher branches his first teacher in indiana was hazel dorsey who opened a school in a log schoolhouse a mile and a half from the lincoln cabin the building had holes for windows which were covered over with greased paper to admit light the roof was just high enough for a man to stand erect it did not take long to demonstrate that abe was superior to any scholar in his class his next teacher was andrew crawford who taught in the winter of eighteen twenty two to three in the same little schoolhouse abe was an excellent speller and it is said that he liked to show off his knowledge especially if he could help out his less fortunate schoolmates one day the teacher gave out the word defied a large class was on the floor but it seemed that no one would be able to spell it the teacher declared he would keep the whole class in all day and night if defied was not spelled correctly when the word came round to katie roby she was standing where she could see young abe she started d e f and while trying to decide whether to spell the word with an i or a y she noticed that abe had his finger on his eye and a smile on his face and instantly took the hint she spelled the word correctly and school was dismissed the president had knowledge of him lincoln never forgot any one or anything at one of the afternoon receptions at the white house a stranger shook hands with him and as he did so remarked casually that he was elected to congress about the time mr lincoln's term as representative expired which happened many years before yes said the president you are from mentioning the state i remember reading of your election in a newspaper one morning on a steamboat going down to mount vernon at another time a gentleman addressed him saying i presume mr president you have forgotten me no was the prompt reply your name is flood i saw you last twelve years ago at naming the place and the occasion i am glad to see he continued that the flood goes on subsequent to his re-election a deputation of bankers from various sections were introduced one day by the secretary of the treasury after a few moments of general conversation lincoln turned to one of them and said your district did not give me so strong a vote at the last election as it did in eighteen sixty i think sir that you must be mistaken replied the banker i have the impression that your majority was considerably increased at the last election no rejoined the president you fell off about six hundred votes 
then taking down from the bookcase the official canvas of 1860 and 1864 he referred to the vote of the district named and proved to be quite right in his assertion only half a man as president lincoln arm in arm with ex-president buchanan entered the capitol and passed into the senate chamber filled to overflowing with senators members of the diplomatic corps and visitors the contrast between the two men struck every observer mr buchanan was so withered and bowed with age wrote george w julian of indiana who was among the spectators that in contrast with the towering form of mr lincoln he seemed little more than half a man grant congratulated lincoln as soon as the result of the presidential election of eighteen sixty four was known general grant telegraphed from city point his congratulations and added that the election having passed off quietly is a victory worth more to the country than a battle won brutus and caesar london punch persistently maintained throughout the war for the union that the question of what to do with the blacks was the most bothersome of all the problems president lincoln had to solve punch thought the rebellion had its origin in an effort to determine whether there should or should not be slavery in the united states and was fought with this as the main end in view punch of august fifteenth eighteen sixty three contained the cartoon reproduced on this page the title being brutus and caesar president lincoln was pictured as brutus while the ghost of caesar which appeared in the tent of the american brutus during the dark hours of the night was represented in the shape of a husky and anything but ghost-like african whose complexion would tend to make the blackest tar look like skimmed milk in comparison this was the text below the cartoon from the american edition of shakespeare the tent of brutus lincoln knight enter the ghost of caesar brutus wow well, now do tell who's you caesar i am da ebo genus massa lincoln this child am awful impressionable punch's cartoons were decidedly unfriendly in tone toward president lincoln some of them being not only objectionable in the display of bad taste but offensive and vulgar it is true that after the assassination of the president punch in illustrations paid marked and deserved tribute to the memory of the great emancipator but it had little that was good to say of him while he was among the living and engaged in carrying out the great work for which he was destined to win eternal fame how stanton got into the cabinet president lincoln well aware of stanton's unfriendliness was surprised when secretary of the treasury chase told him that stanton had expressed the opinion that the arrest of the confederate commissioners mason and slidell was legal and justified by international law the president asked secretary chase to invite stanton to the white house and stanton came mr lincoln thanked him for the opinion he had expressed and asked him to put it in writing stanton complied the president read it carefully and after putting it away astounded stanton by offering him the portfolio of war stanton was a democrat had been one of the president's most persistent vilifiers and could not realize at first that lincoln meant what he said he managed however to say i am both surprised and embarrassed mr president and would ask a couple of days to consider this most important matter lincoln fully understood what was going on in stanton's mind and then said this is a very critical period in the life of the nation mr stanton as you are well aware and i well know you are as much interested in sustaining the government as myself or any other man this is no time to consider mere party issues the life of the nation is in danger i need the best counsellors around me i have every confidence in your judgment and have concluded to ask you to become one of my counsellors the office of the secretary of war will soon be vacant and i am anxious to have you take mr cameron's place stanton decided to accept abe like his father abe lincoln's father was never at a loss for an answer 
an old neighbor of thomas lincoln abe's father was passing the lincoln farm one day when he saw abe's father grubbing up some hazelnut bushes and said to him why grandpap i thought you wanted to sell your farm and so i do he replied but i ain't going to let my farm know it abe's just like his father the old ones would say no moon at all one of the most notable of lincoln's law cases was that in which he defended william d armstrong charged with murder the case was one which was watched during its progress with intense interest and had a most dramatic ending the defendant was the son of jack and hannah armstrong the father was dead but hannah who had been very motherly and helpful to lincoln during his life at new salem was still living and asked lincoln to defend him young armstrong had been a wild lad and was often in bad company the principal witness had sworn that he saw young armstrong strike the fatal blow the moon being very bright at the time lincoln brought forward the almanac which showed that at the time the murder was committed there was no moon at all in his argument lincoln's speech was so feelingly made that at its close all the men in the jury box were in tears it was just half an hour when the jury returned a verdict of acquittal lincoln would accept no fee except the thanks of the anxious mother abe a superb mimic lincoln's reading in his early days embraced a wide range he was particularly fond of all stories containing fun wit and humor and every one of these he came across he learned by heart thus adding to his personal store he improved as a reciter and retailer of the stories he had read and heard and as the reciter of tales of his own invention and he had ready and eager auditors judge herndon in his abraham lincoln relates that as a mimic lincoln was unequalled an old neighbor said his laugh was striking such awkward gestures belonged to no other man they attracted universal attention from the old and sedate down to the schoolboy then in a few moments he was as calm and thoughtful as a judge on the bench and as ready to give advice on the most important matters fun and gravity grew on him alike why he was called honest abe during the year lincoln was in denton offutt's store at new salem that gentleman whose business was somewhat widely and unwisely spread about the country ceased to prosper in his finances and finally failed the store was shut up the mill was closed and abraham lincoln was out of business the year had been one of great advance in many respects he had made new and valuable acquaintances read many books mastered the grammar of his own tongue won multitudes of friends and became ready for a step still further in advance those who could appreciate brains respected him and those whose ideas of a man related to his muscles were devoted to him it was while he was performing the work of the store that he acquired the sobriquet of honest abe a characterization he never dishonored and an abbreviation that he never outgrew he was judge arbitrator referee umpire authority in all disputes games and matches of man flesh horse flesh a pacificator in all quarrels everybody's friend the best natured the most sensible the most informed the most modest and unassuming the kindest gentlest roughest strongest best fellow in all new salem and the region round about abe's name remained on the sign enduring friendship and love of old associations were prominent characteristics of president lincoln when about to leave springfield for washington he went to the dingy little law office which had sheltered his saddest hours he sat down on the couch and said to his law partner judge herndon billy you and i have been together for more than twenty years and have never passed a word will you let my name stay on the old sign until i come back from washington the tears started to herndon's eyes he put out his hand mr lincoln said he i never will have any other partner while you live 
and to the day of assassination all the doings of the firm were in the name of lincoln and herndon very homely at first sight early in january eighteen sixty one colonel alex k mcclure of philadelphia received a telegram from president-elect lincoln asking him mcclure to visit him at springfield illinois colonel mcclure described his disappointment at first sight of lincoln in these words i went directly from the depot to lincoln's house and rang the bell which was answered by lincoln himself opening the door i doubt whether i wholly concealed my disappointment at meeting him tall gaunt ungainly ill-clad with a homeliness of manner that was unique in itself i confess that my heart sank within me as i remembered that this was the man chosen by a great nation to become its ruler in the gravest period of its history i remember his dress as if it were but yesterday snuff-coloured and slouchy pantaloons open black vest held by a few brass buttons straight or evening dress coat with tightly fitting sleeves to exaggerate his long bony arms and all supplemented by an awkwardness that was uncommon among men of intelligence such was the picture i met in the person of abraham lincoln we sat down in his plainly furnished parlor and were uninterrupted during the nearly four hours that i remained with him and little by little as his earnestness sincerity and candor were developed in conversation i forgot all the grotesque qualities which so confounded me when i first greeted him the man to trust if a man is honest in his mind said lincoln one day long before he became president you are pretty safe in trusting him was gone there to be hitched abe's nephew or one of them related a story in connection with lincoln's first love and rutledge and his subsequent marriage to miss mary todd this nephew was a plain everyday farmer and thought everything of his uncle whose greatness he quite thoroughly appreciated although he did not pose to any extreme as the relative of a president of the united states said he one day in telling his story us children and we had heard uncle abe was a goin to be married asked grandma if lincoln abe never had had a gal afore as she says says he will well abe was never a hand no how to run round visitin much or go with the gals either but he did fall in love with a ann rutledge who lived out near springfield and after she died he'd come home and every time he'd talk about her he cried dreadful he never could talk o her no how but he was just cry and cry like a young feller once they told grandma they was goin to be hitched they haven't promised each other and that is all we ever heard about it but so twas arter uncle abe had got over his mournin he was married to a woman which had lived down in kentuck uncle abe himself told us he was married the next time he came up to our place and we asked him why he didn't bring his wife up to see us he said she's very busy and can't come but we knowed better than that he was too proud to bring her up cause nothing would suit her nohow she wasn't raised the way we was and was a different from us and we heard too she was proud as could be no and he never brought none of the children either but then uncle abe he wasn't to blame we never thought he was stuck up he proposed to save the union replying to an editorial written by horace greeley the president wrote my paramount object is to save the union and not either to save or to destroy slavery if i could save the union without freeing any slave i would do it if i could save it by freeing all the slaves i would do it and if i could do it by freeing some and leaving others alone i would also do that what i do about slavery and the colored race i do because i believe it helps to save this union and what i forbear i forbear because i do not believe it would help to save the union i shall do less whenever i shall believe what i am doing hurts the cause and i shall do more whenever i believe doing more will help the cause the same old rum 
one of president lincoln's friends visiting at the white house was finding considerable fault with the constant agitation in congress of the slavery question he remarked that after the adoption of the emancipation policy he had hoped for something new there was a man down in maine said the president in reply who kept a grocery store and a lot of fellows used to loaf around for their toddy he only gave em new england rum and they drank pretty considerable of it but after a while they began to get tired of that and kept asking for something new something new all the time well one night when the whole crowd were around the grocer brought out his glasses and says he i got something new for you to drink boys now honor bright said they honor bright says he and with that he sets out a jug thar says that's something new it's new england rum says he now remarked the president in conclusion i guess we're a good deal like that crowd and congress is a good deal like that storekeeper saved lincoln's life when mr lincoln was quite a small boy he met with an accident that almost cost him his life he was saved by austin gollaher a young playmate mr gollaher lived to be more than ninety years of age and to the day of his death related with great pride his boyhood association with lincoln yes mr gollaher once said the story that i once saved abraham lincoln's life is true he and i had been going to school together for a year or more and had become greatly attached to each other then school disbanded on account of there being so few scholars and we did not see each other much for a long while one sunday my mother visited the lincolns and i was taken along abe and i played around all day finally we concluded to cross the creek to hunt for some partridges young lincoln had seen the day before the creek was swollen by a recent rain and in crossing on the narrow foot log abe fell in neither of us could swim i got a long pole and held it out to abe who grabbed it and then i pulled him ashore he was almost dead and i was badly scared i rolled and pounded him in good earnest then i got him by the arms and shook him the water meanwhile pouring out of his mouth by this means i succeeded in bringing him to and he was soon all right then a new difficulty confronted us if our mothers discovered our wet clothes they would whip us this we dreaded from experience and determined to avoid it it was june the sun was very warm and we soon dried our clothing by spreading it on the rocks about us we promised never to tell the story and i never did until after lincoln's tragic end would not recall a single word in conversation with some friends at the white house on new year's evening eighteen sixty three president lincoln said concerning his emancipation proclamation the signature looks a little tremulous for my hand was tired but my resolution was firm i told them in september if they did not return to their allegiance and cease murdering our soldiers i would strike at this pillar of their strength and now the promise shall be kept and not one word of it will i ever recall old broom best after all during the time the enemies of general grant were making their bitterest attacks upon him and demanding that the president remove him from command frank leslie's illustrated newspaper of june thirteenth eighteen sixty three came out with the cartoon reproduced the text printed under the picture was to the following effect old abe greeley be hanged i want no more new brooms i began to think that the worst thing about my old ones was in not being handled right the old broom the president holds in his hand is labeled grant the latter had captured fort donelson defeated the confederates at shiloh luca port gibson and other places and had vicksburg in his iron grasp when the demand was made that lincoln depose grant the president answered i can't spare this man he fights grant never lost a battle and when he found the enemy he always fought him mcclellan burnside pope and hooker had been found wanting so lincoln pinned his faith to grant as noted in the cartoon horace greeley editor of the new york tribune thurlow weed and others wanted lincoln to try some other new brooms but president lincoln was wearied with defeats and wanted a few victories to offset them therefore he stood by grant 
who gave him victories. End of part 15. Part 16 of Lincoln's Yarns and Stories by Alexander K. McClure. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 16. God with a little G. Abraham Lincoln, his hand and pen, he will be good, but God knows when. These lines were found written in young Lincoln's own hand at the bottom of a page whereon he had been ciphering. Lincoln always wrote a clear regular fist. In this instance, he evidently did not appreciate the sacredness of the name of the deity when he used a little g. Lincoln once said he did not remember the time when he could not write. Abe's Log It was the custom in Sangamon for the menfolk to gather at noon, and in the evening, when resting in a convenient lane near the mill. They had rolled out a long, peeled log on which they lounged while they whittled and talked. Lincoln had not been long in Sangamon before he joined this circle. At once he became a favorite by his jokes and good humor. As soon as he appeared at the assembly ground, the men would start him to storytelling. So irresistibly droll were his yarns that whenever he'd end up in his unexpected way, the boys on the log would whoop and roll off. The result of the rolling off was to polish the log like a mirror. The men, recognizing Lincoln's part in this polishing, christened their seat Abe's Log. Long after Lincoln had disappeared from Sangamon, Abe's Log remained, and until it had rotted away, people pointed it out and repeated the droll stories of the stranger. It was a fine fizzle. President Lincoln, in company with General Grant, was inspecting the Dutch Gapped Canal at City Point. Grant, do you know what this reminds me of? Out in Springfield, Illinois, there was a blacksmith who, not having much to do, took a piece of soft iron and attempted to weld it into an agricultural implement, but discovered that the iron would not hold out. Then he concluded it would make a claw hammer, but having too much iron attempted to make an axe but decided after working a while that there was not enough iron left. Finally, becoming disgusted, he filled the forge full of coal and brought the iron to a white heat. Then, with his tongs, he lifted it from the bed of coals and, thrusting it into a tub of water nearby, exclaimed, Well, if I can't make anything else of you, I will make a fizzle somehow. I was afraid that was about what we had done with the Dutch Gap Canal said General Grant. A Teetotaler When Lincoln was in the Black Hawk War as captain, the volunteer soldiers drank in with a delight the jests and stories of the tall captain. Aesop's fables were given a new dress, and the tales of the wild adventures that he had brought from Kentucky and Indiana were many, but his inspiration was never stimulated by recourse to the whiskey jug. When his grateful and delighted auditors pressed this on him, he had one reply, Thank you, I never drink it. Not to open shop there. President Lincoln was passing down Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington one day, when a man came running after him, hailed him, and thrust a bundle of papers in his hands. It angered him not a little, and he pitched the papers back, saying, I'm not going to open shop here. We have liberty of all kinds. Lincoln delivered a remarkable speech at Springfield, Illinois, when but 28 years of age, upon the liberty possessed by the people of the United States. In part, he said, In the great journal of things happening under the sun, we, the American people, find our account running under date of the 19th century of the Christian era. We find ourselves in the peaceful possession of the finest portion of the earth as regards extent of territory, fertility of soil, and salubrity of climate. We find ourselves under the government of a system of political institutions conducing more essentially to the ends of civil and religious liberty than any of which history of former times tells us. 
we when mounting the stage of existence found ourselves the legal inheritors of these fundamental blessings we toiled not in the acquisition or establishment of them they are a legacy bequeathed to us by a once hardy brave and patriotic but now lamented and departed race of ancestors theirs was the task and nobly did they perform it to possess themselves us of this goodly land to uprear upon its hills and valleys a political edifice of liberty and equal rights tis ours to transmit these the former unprofaned by the foot of an intruder the latter undecayed by the lapse of time and untorn by usurpation to the generation that fate shall permit the world to know this task gratitude to our fathers justice to ourselves duty to posterity all imperatively require us faithfully to perform how then shall we perform it at what point shall we expect the approach of danger shall we expect some transatlantic military giant to step the ocean and crush us at a blow never all the armies of europe asia and africa combined with all the treasures of the earth our own excepted in their military chest with a bonaparte for a commander could not by force take a drink from the ohio or make a track on the blue ridge in a trial of a thousand years at what point then is this approach of danger to be expected i answer if ever it reach us it must spring up amongst us it cannot come from abroad if destruction be our lot we must ourselves be its author and finisher as a nation of freemen we must live through all time or die by suicide i hope i am not over wary but if i am not there is even now something of ill omen amongst us i mean the increasing disregard for law which pervades the country the disposition to substitute the wild and furious passions in lieu of the sober judgment of courts and the worse than savage mobs for the executive ministers of justice this disposition is awfully fearful in any community and that it now exists in ours though grating to our feelings to admit it it would be a violation of truth and an insult to deny accounts of outrages committed by mobs form the everyday news of the times they have pervaded the country from new england to louisiana they are neither peculiar to the eternal snows of the former nor the burning sun of the latter they are not the creatures of climate neither are they confined to the slaveholding or non-slaveholding states alike they spring up among the pleasure-hunting southerners and the order-loving citizens of the land of steady habits whatever then their cause may be it is common to the whole country many great and good men sufficiently qualified for any task they may undertake may ever be found whose ambition would aspire to nothing beyond a seat in congress a gubernatorial or presidential chair but such belong not to the family of the lion or the tribe of the eagle what think you these places would satisfy an alexander a caesar or a napoleon never towering genius disdains a beaten path it seeks regions hitherto unexplored it seeks no distinction in adding story to story upon the monuments of fame erected to the memory of others it denies that it is glory enough to serve under any chief it scorns to tread in the footpaths of any predecessor however illustrious it thirsts and burns for distinction and if possible it will have it whether at the expense of emancipating the slaves or enslaving free men another reason which once was but which to the same extent is now no more has done much in maintaining our institutions thus far i mean the powerful influence which the interesting scenes of the revolution had upon the passions of the people as distinguished from their judgment but these histories are gone they can be read no more for ever they were a fortress of strength but what the invading foemen could never do the silent artillery of time has done the leveling of the walls 
they were a forest of giant oaks but the all-resisting hurricane swept over them and left only here and there a lone trunk despoiled of its verdure shorn of its foliage unshading and unshaded to murmur in a few more gentle breezes and to combat with its mutilated limbs a few more rude storms then to sink and be no more they were the pillars of the temple of liberty and now that they have crumbled away that temple must fall unless we the descendants supply the places with pillars hewn from the same solid quarry of sober reason passion has helped us but can do so no more it will in future be our enemy reason cold calculating unimpassioned reason must furnish all the materials for our support and defence let those materials be moulded into general intelligence sound morality and in particular a reverence for the constitution and the laws and then our country shall continue to improve and our nation revering his name and permitting no hostile foot to pass or desecrate his resting-place shall be the first to hear the last trump that shall awaken our washington upon these let the proud fabric of freedom rest as the rock of its basis and as truly as has been said of the only greater institution the gates of hell shall not prevail against it tom corwin's latest story one of mr lincoln's warm friends was dr robert bowl of lacon illinois telling of a visit he paid to the white house soon after mr lincoln's inauguration he said i found him the same lincoln as a struggling lawyer and politician that i did in washington as president of the united states yet there was a dignity and self-possession about him in his high official authority i paid him a second call in the evening he had thrown off his reserve somewhat and would walk up and down the room with his hands to his sides and laugh at the joke he was telling or at one that was told to him i remember one story he told to me on this occasion tom corwin of illinois had been down to alexandria virginia that day and had come back and told lincoln a story which pleased him so much that he broke out in a hearty laugh and said i must tell you tom corwin's latest tom met an old man at alexandria who knew george washington and he told tom that george washington often swore now corwin's father had always held the father of our country up as a faultless person and told his son to follow in his footsteps well said corwin when i heard that george washington was addicted to the vices and infirmities of man i felt so relieved that i just shouted for joy catch em and cheat em the lawyers on the circuit traveled by lincoln got together one night and tried him on the charge of accepting fees which tended to lower the established rates it was the understood rule that a lawyer should accept all the clients could be induced to pay the tribunal was known as the augmentorial court ward layman his law partner at the time tells about it lincoln was found guilty and fined for his awful crime against the pockets of his brethren of the bar the fine he paid with good humor and then kept the crowd of lawyers in uproarious laughter until after midnight he persisted in his revolt however declaring that with his consent his firm should never during its life or after its dissolution deserve the reputation enjoyed by those shining lights of the profession catch em and cheat em a juryman's scorn lincoln had assisted in the prosecution of a man who had robbed his neighbors hen roosts jogging home along the highway with the foreman of the jury that had convicted the hen stealer he was complimented by lincoln on the zeal and ability of the prosecution and remarked why when the country was young and i was stronger than i am now i didn't mind packing off a sheep now and again but stealing hens the good man's scorn could not find words to express his opinion of a man who would steal hens he broke to win 
a lawyer who was a stranger to mr lincoln once expressed to general linder the opinion that mr lincoln's practice of telling stories to the jury was a waste of time don't lay that flat renunction to your soul linder answered lincoln is like tansy's horse he breaks to win wanted her children back on the third of january eighteen sixty three harper's weekly appeared with a cartoon representing columbia indignantly demanding of president lincoln and secretary of war stanton that they restore to her those of her sons killed in battle below the picture is the reading matter columbia where are my fifteen thousand sons murdered at fredericksburg lincoln this reminds me of a little joke columbia go tell your joke at springfield the battle of fredericksburg was fought on december thirteenth eighteen sixty two between general burnside commanding the army of the potomac and general lee's force the union troops time and again assaulted the heights where the confederates had taken position but were driven back with frightful losses the enemy being behind breastworks suffered comparatively little at the beginning of the fight the confederate line was broken but the result of the engagement was disastrous to the union cause burnside had one thousand one hundred and fifty two killed nine thousand one hundred and one wounded and three thousand two hundred and thirty four missing a total of thirteen thousand seven hundred and seventy one general lee's losses all told were not much more than five thousand men Burnside had succeeded McClellan in command of the Army of the Potomac, mainly, it was said, through the influence of Secretary of War Stanton. Three months before, McClellan had defeated Lee at Antietam, the bloodiest battle of the war, Lee's losses footing up more than 13,000 men. At Fredericksburg, Burnside had about 120,000 men. At Antietam, McClellan had about 80,000 it has been maintained that burnside should not have fought this battle the chances of success being so few six feet four at seventeen abe's schoolteacher crawford endeavored to teach his pupils some of the manners of the polite society of indiana eighteen twenty three or so this was a part of his system one of the pupils would retire and then come in as a stranger and another pupil would have to introduce him to all the members of the school in what was considered good manners as abe wore a linsey woolsey shirt buckskin breeches which were too short and very tight and low shoes and was tall and awkward he no doubt created considerable merriment when his turn came he was growing at a fearful rate he was fifteen years of age and two years later attained his full height of six feet four inches had respect for the eggs early in eighteen thirty one abe was one of the guests of honor at a boat launching he and two others having built the craft the affair was a notable one people being present from the territory surrounding a large party came from springfield with an ample supply of whiskey to give the boat and its builders a send-off it was a sort of bipartisan mass meeting but there was one prevailing spirit that born of rye and corn speeches were made in the best of feeling some in favor of andrew jackson and some in favor of henry clay abraham lincoln the cook told a number of funny stories and it is recorded that they were not of too refined a character to suit the taste of his audience a slate of hand performer was present and among other trips performed he fried some eggs in lincoln's hat judge herndon says as explanatory to the delay in passing up the hat for the experiment lincoln drolly observed it was out of respect for the eggs not care for my hat how was the milk upset william g green an old-time friend of lincoln was a student at illinois college and one summer brought home with him on a vacation richard yates afterwards governor of illinois and some other boys and in order to entertain them took them up to see lincoln he found him in his usual position and at his usual occupation flat on his back on a cellar door reading a newspaper 
this was the manner in which a president of the united states and a governor of illinois became acquainted with each other green says lincoln repeated the whole of burns and a whole quantity of shakespeare for the entertainment of the college boys and in return was invited to dine with them on bread and milk how he managed to upset his bowl of milk is not a matter of history but the fact is that he did so as is the further fact that green's mother who loved lincoln tried to smooth over the accident and relieve the young man's embarrassment pulled fodder for a book once abe borrowed weems life of washington from joseph crawford a neighbor abe devoured it read it and reread it and when asleep put it by him between the logs of the wall one night a rainstorm wet it through and ruined it i've no money said abe when reporting the disaster to crawford but i'll work it out all right was crawford's response you pull fodder for three days and the book is yourn abe pulled the fodder but he never forgave crawford for putting so much work upon him he never lost an opportunity to crack a joke at his expense and the name blue nose crawford abe applied to him stuck to him throughout his life praises his rival for office when mr lincoln was a candidate for the legislature it was the practice at that date in illinois for two rival candidates to travel over the district together the custom led to much good-natured raillery between them and in such contests lincoln was rarely if ever worsted he could even turn the generosity of a rival to account by his whimsical treatment on one occasion says mr weir a former resident of sangamon county he had driven out from springfield and company with a political opponent to engage in joint debate the carriage it seems belonged to his opponent in addressing the gathering of farmers that met them lincoln was lavish in praise of the generosity of his friend i am too poor to own a carriage he said but my friend has generously invited me to ride with him i want you to vote for me if you will but if not then vote for my opponent for he is a fine man his extravagant and persistent praise of his opponent appealed to the sense of humor in his rural audience to whom his inability to own a carriage was by no means a disqualification one thing abe didn't love lincoln admitted that he was not particularly energetic when it came to real hard work my father said he one day taught me how to work but not to love it i never did like to work and i don't deny it i'd rather read tell stories crack jokes talk laugh anything but work the modesty of genius the opening of the year eighteen sixty found mr lincoln's name freely mentioned in connection with the republican nomination for the presidency to be classed with seward chase mclean and other celebrities was enough to stimulate any illinois lawyer's pride but in mr lincoln's case if it had any such effect he was most artful in concealing it now and then some ardent friend an editor for example would run his name up to the masthead but in all cases he discouraged the attempt in regard to the matter you spoke of he answered one man who proposed his name i beg you will not give it a further mention seriously i do not think i am fit for the presidency why she married him there was a social at lincoln's house in springfield and abe introduced his wife to ward layman his law partner layman tells the story in these words after introducing me to mrs lincoln he left us in conversation i remarked to her that her husband was a great favorite in the eastern part of the state where i had been stopping yes she replied he is a great favorite everywhere he is to be president of the united states some day if i had not thought so i never would have married him for you can see he is not pretty but look at him doesn't he look as if he would make a magnificent president niagara falls written by abraham lincoln the following article on niagara falls in mr lincoln's handwriting was found among his papers after his death niagara falls by what mysterious power is it that millions and millions are drawn from all parts of the world to gaze upon niagara falls 
there is no mystery about the thing itself every effect is just as any intelligent man knowing the causes would anticipate without seeing it if the water moving onward in a great river reaches a point where there is a perpendicular jog of a hundred feet in descent in the bottom of the river it is plain the water will have a violent and continuous plunge at that point it is also plain the water thus plunging will foam and roar and send up a mist continuously in which last during sunshine there will be perpetual rainbows the mere physical of niagara falls is only this yet this is really a very small part of that world's wonder its power to excite reflection and emotion is its great charm the geologist will demonstrate that the plunge or fall was once at lake ontario and thus worn its way back to its present position he will ascertain how fast it is wearing now and so get a basis for determining how long it has been wearing back from lake ontario and finally demonstrate by that that this world is at least fourteen thousand years old a philosopher of a slightly different turn will say niagara falls is only the lip of the basin out of which pours all the surplus water which rains down on two or three hundred thousand square miles of the earth's surface he will estimate with approximate accuracy that five hundred thousand tons of water fall with their full weight a distance of a hundred feet each minute thus exerting a force equal to the lifting of the same weight through the same space in the same time but still there is more it calls up the indefinite past when columbus first sought this continent when christ suffered on the cross when moses led israel through the red sea nay even when adam first came from the hand of his maker then as now niagara was roaring here the eyes of that species of extinct giants whose bones fill the mounds of america have gazed on niagara as ours do now contemporary with the first race of men and older than the first man niagara is strong and fresh to-day as ten thousand years ago the mammoth and mastodon so long dead that fragments of their monstrous bones alone testify that they ever lived have gazed on niagara in that long long time never still for a single moment never dried never froze never slept never rested end of part 16part 17 of lincoln's yarns and stories by alexander k mcclure this librivox recording is in the public domain part 17 made it hot for lincoln a lady relative who lived for two years with the lincolns said that mr lincoln was in the habit of lying on the floor with the back of a chair for a pillow when he read one evening when in this position in the hall a knock was heard at the front door and although in his shirt sleeves he answered the call two ladies were at the door whom he invited into the parlor notifying them in his open familiar way that he would uh, trot the women folk out mrs lincoln from an adjoining room witnessed the lady's entrance and overhearing her husband's jocose expression her indignation was so instantaneous she made the situation exceedingly interesting for him and he was glad to retreat from the house he did not return till very late at night and then slipped quietly in at a rear door wouldn't hold title against him during the rebellion the austrian minister to the united states government introduced to the president a count a subject of the austrian government who was desirous of obtaining a position in the american army being introduced by the accredited minister of austria he required no further recommendation to secure the appointment but fearing that his importance might not be fully appreciated by the republican president the count was particular in impressing the fact upon him that he bore that title and that his family was ancient and highly respectable president lincoln listened with attention until this unnecessary commendation was mentioned 
then with a merry twinkle in his eye he tapped the aristocratic sprig of hereditary nobility on the shoulder in the most fatherly way as if the gentleman had made a confession of some unfortunate circumstance connected with his lineage for which he was in no way responsible and said never mind you shall be treated with just as much consideration for all that i will see to it that your bearing a title shan't hurt you only one life to live a young man living in kentucky had been enticed into the rebel army after a few months he became disgusted and managed to make his way back home soon after his arrival the union officer in command of the military stationed in the town had him arrested as a rebel spy and after a military trial he was condemned to be hanged president lincoln was seen by one of his friends from kentucky who explained his errand and asked for mercy oh yes i understand someone's been crying and worked upon your feelings and you have come here to work on mine his friend then went more into detail and assured him of his belief in the truth of the story after some deliberation mr lincoln evidently scarcely more than half convinced but still preferring to err on the side of mercy replied if a man had more than one life i think a little hanging would not hurt this one but after he is once dead we cannot bring him back no matter how sorry we may be so the boy shall be pardoned and a reprieve was given on the spot couldn't locate his birthplace while the celebrated artist hicks was engaged in painting mr lincoln's portrait just after the former's first nomination for the presidency he asked the great statesman if he could point out the precise spot where he was born lincoln thought the matter over for a day or two and then gave the artist the following memorandum springfield illinois june fourteen eighteen sixty i was born february twelve eighteen o nine in then hardin county kentucky at a point within the now county of la rue a mile or a mile and a half from where rogdon's mill now is my parents being dead and my own memory not serving i know no means of identifying the precise locality it was on nolan's creek a lincoln sambo was afeard in his message to congress in december eighteen sixty four just after his re-election president lincoln in his message of december sixth let himself out in plain unmistakable terms to the effect that the freedmen should never be placed in bondage again frank leslie's illustrated newspaper of december twenty fourth eighteen sixty four printed the cartoon we herewith reproduce the text underneath running in this way uncle abe sambo you are not handsome any more than myself but as to sending you back to your old master i'm not the man to do it and what's more i won't vice president's message congress at the previous sitting had neglected to pass the resolution for the constitutional amendment prohibiting slavery but on the thirty first of january eighteen sixty five the resolution was finally adopted and the united states constitution soon had the new feature as one of its clauses the necessary number of state legislatures approving it president lincoln regarded the passage of this resolution by congress as most important as the amendment in his mind covered whatever defects a rigid construction of the constitution might find in his emancipation proclamation after the latter was issued negroes were allowed to enlist in the army and they fought well and bravely after the war in the reorganization of the regular army four regiments of colored men were provided for the ninth and tenth cavalry and the twenty fourth and twenty fifth infantry in the cartoon sambo has evidently been asking uncle abe as to the probability or possibility of his being again enslaved when money might be used some lincoln enthusiasts in kansas with much more pretensions than power wrote him in march eighteen sixty 
proposing to furnish a Lincoln delegation from the state to the Chicago Convention, and suggesting that Lincoln should pay the legitimate expenses of organizing, electing, and taking to the Convention the promised Lincoln delegates. To this, Lincoln replied that, in the main, the use of money is wrong, but for certain objects in a political contest, the use of some is both right and indispensable. And he added, if you shall be appointed a delegate to Chicago, I will furnish a hundred dollars to bear the expenses of the trip. He heard nothing further from the Kansas man until he saw an announcement in the newspapers that Kansas had elected delegates and instructed them for Seward. Abe was no beauty. Lincoln's military service in the Black Hawk War had increased his popularity at New Salem, and he was put up as a candidate for the legislature. A. Y. Ellis describes his personal appearance at the time as follows. He wore a mixed jean coat, claw hammer style, short in the sleeves, and bobtailed. In fact, it was so short in the tail that he could not sit on it flax and tow linen pantaloons, and a straw hat. I think he wore a vest, but do not remember how it looked. He wore pot-metal boots. He's just beautiful. Lincoln's great love for children easily won their confidence. A little girl who had been told that the president was very homely was taken by her father to see the president at the White House. Lincoln took her upon his knee and chatted with her for a moment in his merry way, when she turned to her father and exclaimed, Oh, Pa, he isn't ugly at all. He's just beautiful. Big enough hog for him. To a curiosity seeker who desired a permit to pass the lines to visit the field of Bull Run after the first battle, Lincoln made the following reply. A man in Cortland County raised a porker of such unusual size that strangers went out of their way to see it. One of them the other day met the old gentleman and inquired about the animal. Well, yes, the old fellow said. I've got such a critter, mighty big un, but I guess I'll have to charge you about a shillin' for looking at him. The stranger looked at the old man for a minute or so, pulled out the desired coin, handed it to him, and started to go off. Hold on, said the other, don't you want to see the hog? No, said the stranger, I have seen as big a hog as I want to see. And you will find that fact the case with yourself, if you should happen to see a few live rebels there, as well as dead ones. Abe offers a speech for something to eat. When Lincoln's special train from Springfield to Washington reached the Illinois state line, there was a stop for dinner. There was such a crowd that Lincoln could scarcely reach the dining room. Gentlemen, said he, as he surveyed the crowd, if you will make me a little path so that I can get through and get something to eat, I will make you a speech when I get back. They understood each other. When complaints were made to President Lincoln by victims of Secretary of War Stanton's harshness, rudeness, and refusal to be obliging, particularly in cases where Secretary Stanton had refused to honor Lincoln's passes through the lines, the President would often remark to this effect, I cannot always be sure that permits given by me ought to be granted. There is an understanding between myself and Stanton that when I send a request to him which cannot consistently be granted, he is to refuse to honor it. This he sometimes does. Few fence rails left. There won't be a tar barrel left in Illinois tonight, said Senator Stephen A. Douglas in Washington to his senatorial friends, who asked him when the news of the nomination of Lincoln reached them, who is this man Lincoln, anyhow? Douglas was right. Not only the tar barrels, but half the fences of the state of Illinois went up in the fire of rejoicing. The Great Snow of 1830-31 In explanation of Lincoln's great popularity, D.W. Bartlett, in his Life and Speeches of Abraham Lincoln, published in 1860, makes this statement of Abe's efficient service to his neighbors in the great snow of 1830-31. 
the deep snow which occurred in eighteen thirty thirty one was one of the chief troubles endured by the early settlers of central and southern illinois its consequences lasted through several years the people were ill prepared to meet it as the weather had been mild and pleasant unprecedentedly so up to christmas when a snowstorm set in which lasted two days something never before known even among the traditions of the indians and never approached in the weather of any winter since the pioneers who came into the state then a territory in eighteen hundred say the average depth of snow was never previous to eighteen thirty more than knee-deep to an ordinary man while it was breast deep all that winter it became crusted over so as in some cases to bear teams cattle and horses perished the winter wheat was killed the meagre stock of provisions ran out and during the three months continuance of the snow ice and continuous cold weather the most wealthy settlers came near starving while some of the poor ones actually did it was in the midst of such scenes that abraham lincoln attained his majority and commenced his career of bold and manly independence communication between house and house was often entirely obstructed for teams so that the young and strong men had to do all the traveling on foot carrying from one neighbor what of his store he could spare to another and bringing back in return something of his store sorely needed men living five ten twenty and thirty miles apart were called neighbors then young lincoln was always ready to perform these acts of humanity and was foremost in the councils of the settlers when their troubles seemed gathering like a thick cloud about them creditor paid debtor's debt a certain rich man in springfield illinois sued a poor attorney for two dollars and fifty cents and lincoln was asked to prosecute the case lincoln urged the creditor to let the matter drop adding you can make nothing out of him and it will cost you a great deal more than the debt to bring suit the creditor was still determined to have his way and threatened to seek some other attorney lincoln then said well if you are determined that suit should be brought i will bring it but my charge will be ten dollars the money was paid him and peremptory orders were given that the suit be brought that day after the client's departure lincoln went out of the office returning in about an hour with an amused look on his face asked what pleased him he replied i brought suit against blank and then hunted him up and told him what i had done handed him half of the ten dollars and he went over to the squire's office he confessed judgment and paid the bill lincoln added that he didn't see any other way to make things satisfactory for his client as well as the other helped out the soldiers judge thomas b bryan of chicago a member of the union defense committee during the war related the following concerning the original copy of the emancipation proclamation i asked mr lincoln for the original draft of the proclamation said judge bryan for the benefit of our sanitary fair in eighteen sixty five he sent it and accompanied it with a note in which he said i had intended to keep this paper but if it will help the soldiers i give it to you the paper was put up at auction and brought three thousand dollars the buyer afterward sold it again to friends of mr lincoln at a greatly advanced price and it was placed in the rooms of the chicago historical society where it was burned in the great fire of eighteen seventy one every fellow for himself an elegantly dressed young virginian assured lincoln that he had done a great deal of hard manual labor in his time much amused at this solemn declaration lincoln said oh yes you virginians shed barrels of perspiration while standing off at a distance and superintending the work your slaves do for you it is different with us here it is every fellow for himself or he doesn't get there butcher knife boys at the poles when young lincoln had fully demonstrated that he was the champion wrestler in the county surrounding new salem 
the men of da gang at clary's grove whose leader abe had downed were his sworn political friends and allies their work at the polls was remarkably effective when the butcher knife boys the huge pawed boys and the half horse half alligator men declared for a candidate the latter was never defeated no second coming for springfield soon after the opening of congress in eighteen sixty one mr shannon from california made the customary call at the white house in the conversation that ensued mr shannon said mr president i met an old friend of yours in california last summer a mr campbell who had a good deal to say of your springfield life ah returned mr lincoln i am glad to hear of him campbell used to be a dry fellow in those days he continued for a time he was secretary of state one day during the legislative vacation a meek cadaverous-looking man with a white neckcloth introduced himself to him at his office and stating that he had been informed that mr c had the letting of the hall of representatives he wished to secure it if possible for a course of lectures he desired to deliver in springfield may i ask said the secretary what is to be the subject of your lectures certainly was the reply with a very solemn expression of countenance the course i wish to deliver is on the second coming of our lord it is of no use said c if you will take my advice you will not waste your time in this city it is my private opinion that if the lord has been in springfield once he will never come the second time how he won a friend j s moulton of chicago a master in chancery and influential in public affairs looked upon the candidacy of mr lincoln for president as something in the nature of a joke he did not rate the illinois man in the same class with the giants of the east in fact he had expressed himself as by no means friendly to the lincoln cause still he had been a good friend to lincoln and had often met him when the springfield lawyer came to chicago mr lincoln heard of moulton's attitude but did not see moulton until after the election when the president-elect came to chicago and was tendered a reception at one of the big hotels moulton went up in the line to pay his respects to the newly elected chief magistrate purely as a formality he explained to his companions as moulton came along the line mr lincoln grasped moulton's hand with his right and with his left took the master of chancery by the shoulder and pulled him out of the line you don't belong in that line moulton said mr lincoln you belong here by me everyone at the reception was a witness to the honoring of moulton from that hour every faculty that moulton possessed was at the service of the president a little act of kindness skillfully bestowed had won him and he stayed on to the end never sued a client if a client did not pay lincoln did not believe in suing for the fee when a fee was paid him his custom was to divide the money into two equal parts put the one part into his pocket and the other into an envelope labeled herndon's share the lincoln household goods it is recorded that when abe was born the household goods of his father consisted of a few cooking utensils a little bedding some carpenter tools and four hundred gallons of the fierce product of the mountain still running the machine one of the cartoon posters issued by the democratic national campaign committee in the fall of eighteen sixty four is given here it had the legend running the machine printed beneath the machine was secretary chase's greenback mill and the mill was turning out paper money by the million to satisfy the demands of greedy contractors uncle abe is pictured as about to tell one of his funny stories of which the scene reminds him secretary of war stanton is receiving a message from the front describing a great victory in which one prisoner and one gun were taken secretary of state seward is handing an order to a messenger for the arrest of a man who had called him a humbug the habeas corpus being suspended throughout the union at that period 
secretary of the navy wells the long-haired long-bearded man at the head of the table is figuring out a naval problem at the side of the table opposite uncle abe are seated two government contractors shouting for more greenbacks and at the extreme left is secretary of the treasury fessenden who succeeded chase when the latter was made chief justice of the united states supreme court who complains that he cannot satisfy the greed of the contractors for more greenbacks although he is grinding away at the mill day and night was boss when necessary lincoln was the actual head of the administration and whenever he chose to do so he controlled secretary of war stanton as well as the other cabinet ministers secretary stanton on one occasion said now mr president those are the facts and you must see that your order cannot be executed lincoln replied in a somewhat positive tone mr secretary i reckon you'll have to execute the order stanton replied with vigor mr president i cannot do it this order is an improper one and i cannot execute it lincoln fixed his eyes upon stanton and in a firm voice and accent that clearly showed his determination said mr secretary it will have to be done it was done rather starve than swindle ward layman once lincoln's law partner relates a story which places lincoln's high sense of honor in a prominent light in a certain case lincoln and layman being retained by a gentleman named scott layman put the fee at two hundred and fifty dollars and scott agreed to pay it says layman scott expected a contest but to his surprise the case was tried inside of twenty minutes our success was complete scott was satisfied and cheerfully paid over the money to me inside the bar lincoln looking on scott then went out and lincoln asked what did you charge that man i told him two hundred and fifty dollars said he layman that is all wrong the service was not worth that sum give him back at least half of it i protested that the fee was fixed in advance that scott was perfectly satisfied and had so expressed himself that may be retorted lincoln with a look of distress and of undisguised displeasure but i am not satisfied this is positively wrong go call him back and return half the money at least or i will not receive one cent of it for my share i did go and scott was astonished when i handed back half the fee this conversation had attracted the attention of the lawyers and the court judge david davis then on our circuit bench afterwards associate justice on the united states supreme bench called lincoln to him the judge never could whisper but in this instant he probably did his best at all events in attempting to whisper to lincoln he trumpeted his rebuke in about these words and in rasping tones that could be heard all over the courtroom lincoln i've been watching you and layman you are impoverishing this bar by your picayune charges of fees and the lawyers have reason to complain of you you are now almost as poor as lazarus and if you don't make people pay you more for your service you will die as poor as job's turkey judge o l davis the leading lawyer in that part of the state promptly applauded this malediction from the bench but lincoln was immovable that money said he comes out of the pocket of a poor demented girl and i would rather starve than swindle her in this manner don't aim too high billy don't shoot too high aim lower and the common people will understand you lincoln once said to a brother lawyer they are the ones you want to reach at least they are the ones you ought to reach the educated and refined people will understand you anyway if you aim too high your idea will go over the heads of the masses and only hit those who need no hitting not much at rail splitting one who afterward became one of lincoln's most devoted friends and adherents tells this story regarding the manner in which lincoln received him when they met for the first time after a comical survey of my fashionable toggery my swallow-tail coat white neckcloth and ruffled shirt 
an astonishing outfit for a young limb of the law in that settlement lincoln said going to try your hand at the law are you i should know at a glance that you were a virginian but i don't think you would succeed in splitting rails that was my occupation at your age and i don't think i've taken as much pleasure in anything else from that day to this end of part seventeen Part 18 of Lincoln's Yarns and Stories by Alexander K. McClure. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 18. Gave the Soldier the Preference. July 27, 1863, Lincoln wrote the Postmaster General. Yesterday, little endorsement of mine went to you in two cases of postmasterships sought for widows whose husbands have fallen in the battles of this war. These cases, occurring on the same day, brought me to reflect more attentively than what I had before done as to what is fairly due from us here in dispensing of patronage toward the men who, by fighting our battles, bear the chief burden of saving our country. My conclusion is that, other claims and qualifications being equal, they have the right, and this is especially applicable to the disabled soldier and the deceased soldier's family. The President was not scared. When told how uneasy all had been at his going to Richmond, Lincoln replied, Why, if anyone else had been President and had gone to Richmond, I would have been alarmed, but I was not scared about myself a bit. Jeff Davis replied to Lincoln. On the 20th of July, 1864, Horace Greeley crossed into Canada to confer with refugee rebels at Niagara. He bore with him this paper from the President to whom it may concern any proposition which embraces the restoration of peace the integrity of the whole union and the abandonment of slavery and which comes by and with an authority that can control the armies now at war with the united states will be received and considered by the executive government of the united states and will be met by liberal terms and other substantial and collateral points and the bearer or bearers thereof shall have safe conduct both ways to this jefferson davis replied we are not fighting for slavery we are fighting for independence lincoln was a gentleman lincoln was compelled to contend with the results of the ill-judged zeal of politicians who forced ahead his flatboat and rail-splitting record with the homely surroundings of his earlier days and thus obscured for the time the other fact that always having the heart he had long since acquired the manners of a true gentleman so too did he suffer from eastern censors who did not take those surroundings into account and allowed nothing for his originality of character one of these critics heard at washington that mr lincoln in speaking at different times of some move or thing said it had petered out that some other one's plan wouldn't jibe and being asked if the war and the cause of the union were not a great care to him replied yes it is a heavy hog to hold the first two phrases are so familiar here in the west that they need no explanation of the last and more pioneer one it may be said that it had a special force and was peculiarly lincoln-like in the way applied by him in the early times in illinois those having hogs did their own killing assisted by their neighbors stripped of its hair one held the carcass nearly perpendicular in the air head down while others put one point of the gambrel bar through a slit in its hawk then over the string pole and the other point through the other hawk and so swung the animal clear of the ground while all this was being done it took a good man to hold the hog greasy warmly moist and weighing some two hundred pounds and often those with the gambrel prolonged the strain being provokingly slow in hopes to make the holder drop his burden this latter thought is again expressed where president lincoln writing of the peace which he hoped would come soon to stay and so come as to be worth the keeping in all future time 
added that while there would be some black men who can remember that with silent tongue and clenched teeth and steady eye and well-poised bayonet they have helped mankind on to this great consummation he feared there would be some white ones unable to forget that with malignant heart and deceitful tongue they had striven to hinder it he had two seemingly opposite elements little understood by strangers and which those in more intimate relations with him find difficult to explain an open boyish tongue when in a happy mood and with this a reserve of power a force of thought that impressed itself without words on observers in his presence with the cares of the nation on his mind he became more meditative and lost much of his lively ways remembered back in illinois his poor relations one of the most beautiful traits of mr lincoln's character was his considerate regard for the poor and obscure relatives he had left plodding along in their humble ways of life wherever upon his circuit he found them he always went to their dwellings ate with them and when convenient made their houses his home he never assumed in their presence the slightest superiority to them he gave them money when they needed it and he had it countless times he was known to leave his companions at the village hotel after a hard day's work in the courtroom and spend the evening with these old friends and companions of his humbler days on one occasion when urged not to go he replied why aunt's heart would be broken if i should leave town without calling upon her yet he was obliged to walk several miles to make the call deserter sins washed out in blood this was the reply made by lincoln to an application for the pardon of a soldier who had shown himself brave in war had been severely wounded but afterward deserted did you say he was once badly wounded then as the scriptures say that in the shedding of blood is the remission of sins i guess we'll have to let him off this time sure cure for boils president lincoln and postmaster general blair were talking of the war blair said the president did you ever know that fright has sometimes proven a cure for boils no mr president how is that well i'll tell you not long ago when a colonel with his cavalry was at the front and the rebs were making things rather lively for us the colonel was ordered out to a reconnaissance he was troubled at the time with a big boil where it made horseback riding decidedly uncomfortable he finally dismounted and ordered the troops forward without him soon he was startled by the rapid reports of pistols and the helter-skelter approach of his troops in full retreat before a yelling rebel force he forgot everything but the yells sprang into his saddle and made capital time over the fence and ditches till safe within the lines the pain from his boil was gone and the boil too and the colonel swore that there was no cure for boils so sure as fright from rebel yells pay for everything when president lincoln issued a military order it was usually expressive as the following shows war department washington july twenty two sixty two first ordered that military commanders within the states of virginia south carolina georgia florida alabama mississippi louisiana texas and arkansas in an orderly manner seize and use any property real or personal which may be necessary or convenient for their several commands for supplies or for other military purposes and that while property may be all stored for proper military objects none shall be destroyed in wantonness or malice second that military and naval commanders shall employ as laborers within and from said states so many persons of african descent as can be advantageously used for military or naval purposes giving them reasonable wages for their labor third that as to both property and persons of african descent accounts shall be kept sufficiently accurate and in detail to show quantities and amounts 
and from whom both property and such persons shall have come as a basis upon which compensation can be made in proper cases and the several departments of this government shall attend to and perform their appropriate parts towards the execution of these orders by order of the president bashful with ladies judge david davis justice of the united states supreme court and united states senator from illinois was one of lincoln's most intimate friends he told this story on abe lincoln was very bashful when in the presence of ladies i remember once we were invited to take tea at a friend's house and while in the parlor i was called to the front gate to see someone when i returned lincoln who had undertaken to entertain the ladies was twisting and squirming in his chair and as bashful as a schoolboy saw humor in everything there was much that was irritating and uncomfortable in the circuit riding of the illinois court but there was more which was amusing to a temperament like lincoln's the freedom the long days in the open air the unexpected if trivial adventures the meeting with wayfarers and settlers all was an entertainment to him he found humor and human interest on the route where his companion saw nothing but commonplaces he saw the ludicrous in an assemblage of fowls said h c whitney one of his fellow itinerants in a man spading his garden in a clothesline full of clothes in a group of boys in a lot of pigs rooting at a mill door in a mother duck teaching her brood to swim in everything and anything specific for foreign rash it was in the latter part of eighteen sixty three that russia offered its friendship to the united states and sent a strong fleet of warships together with munitions of war to this country to be used in any way the president might see fit russia was not friendly to england and france these nations having defeated her in the crimea a few years before as great britain and the emperor of the french were continually bothering him president lincoln used russia's kindly feelings and action as a means of keeping the other two powers named in a neutral state of mind underneath the cartoon we here reproduce which was labeled drawing things to a head and appeared in the issue of harper's weekly of november twenty eighth eighteen sixty three was this dr lincoln to smart boy of the shop mild applications of russian salve for our friends over the way and heavy doses and plenty of it for our southern patient secretary of state seward was the smart boy of the shop and our friend over the way were england and france the latter bothered president lincoln no more but it is a fact that the confederate privateer alabama was manned almost entirely by british seamen also that when the alabama was sunk by the kearsarge in the summer of eighteen sixty four the confederate seamen were picked up by an english vessel taken to southampton and set at liberty favored the other side lincoln was candor itself when conducting his side of a case in court general mason brayman tells this story as an illustration it is well understood by the profession that lawyers do not read authors favoring the opposite side i once heard mr lincoln in the supreme court of illinois reading from a reported case some strong points in favor of his argument reading a little too far and before becoming aware of it plunged into an authority against himself pausing a moment he drew up his shoulders in a comical way and half laughing went on there there may it please the court i reckon i've scratched up a snake but as i'm in for it i guess i'll read it through then in his most ingenious and matchless manner he went on with his argument and won his case convincing the court that it was not much of a snake after all lincoln and the show lincoln was fond of going all by himself to any little show or concert he would often slip away from his fellow lawyers and spend the entire evening at a little magic lantern show intended for children a traveling concert company was always sure of drawing lincoln a mrs hillis a member of the newhall family and a good singer was the only woman who ever seemed to exhibit any liking for him so lincoln said 
he attended a negro minstrel show in chicago once where he heard dixie sung it was entirely new and pleased him greatly mixing and mingling an eastern newspaper writer told how lincoln after his first nomination received callers the majority of them at his law office while talking to two or three gentlemen and standing up a very hard-looking customer rolled in and tumbled into the only vacant chair and the one lately occupied by mr lincoln mr lincoln's keen eye took in the fact but gave no evidence of the notice turning around at last he spoke to the odd specimen holding out his hand at such a distance that our friend had to vacate the chair if he accepted the proffered shake mr lincoln quietly resumed his chair it was a small matter yet one giving proof more positively than a larger event of that peculiar way the man has of mingling with a mixed crowd took part of the blame among the lawyers who traveled the circuit with lincoln was usher f linder whose daughter rose linder wilkinson has left many lincoln reminiscences one case in which mr lincoln was interested concerned a member of my own family said mrs wilkinson my brother dan in the heat of a quarrel shot a young man named ben boyle and was arrested my father was seriously ill with inflammatory rheumatism at the time and could scarcely move hand or foot he certainly could not defend dan i was his secretary and i remember it was but a day or so after the shooting till letters of sympathy began to pour in in the first bundle which i picked up there was a big letter the handwriting on which i recognize as that of mr lincoln the letter was very sympathetic i know how you feel lender it said i can understand your anger as a father added to all the other sentiments but may we not be in a measure to blame we have talked about the defense of criminals before our children about our success in defending them have left the impression that the greater the crime the greater the triumph of securing an acquittal dan knows your success as a criminal lawyer and he depends on you little knowing that of all cases you would be of least value in this he concluded by offering his services an offer which touched my father to tears mr lincoln tried to have dan released on bail but ben boyle's family and friends declared the wounded man would die and feeling had grown so bitter that the judge would not grant any bail so the case was changed to marshall county but as ben finally recovered it was dismissed thought of learning a trade lincoln at one time thought seriously of learning the blacksmith's trade he was without means and felt the immediate necessity of undertaking some business that would give him bread while entertaining this project an event occurred which in his undetermined state of mind seemed to open a way to success in another quarter reuben radford keeper of a small store in the village of new salem had incurred the displeasure of the clary grove boys who exercised their regulating prerogatives by irregularly breaking his windows william g green a friend of young lincoln riding by radford's store soon afterwards was hailed by him and told that he intended to sell out mr green went into the store and offered him at random four hundred dollars for his stock which offer was immediately accepted lincoln happened in the next day and being familiar with the value of the goods mr green proposed to him to take an inventory of the stock to see what sort of a bargain he had made this he did and it was found that the goods were worth six hundred dollars lincoln then made an offer of a hundred and twenty-five for his bargain with the proposition that he and a man named barry as his partner take over green's notes given to radford mr green agreed to the arrangement but radford declined it except on condition that green would be their security green at last assented lincoln was not afraid of the clary grove boys on the contrary they had been his most ardent friends since the time he thrashed jack armstrong champion bully of the grove but their custom was not heavy the business soon became a wreck green had to not only assist in closing it up but pay radford's notes as well 
Lincoln afterwards spoke of these notes, which he finally made good to Green as the national debt. Lincoln defends 15 Mrs. Nations. When Lincoln's sympathies were enlisted in any cause, he worked like a giant to win. At one time, about 1855, he was in attendance upon court at the little town of Clinton, Illinois, and one of the cases on the docket was where 15 women from a neighboring village were defendants, they having been indicted for trespass. Their offense, as duly set forth in the indictment, was that of swooping down upon one tanner, the keeper of a saloon in the village, and knocking in the heads of his barrels. Lincoln was not employed in the case, but sat watching the trial as it proceeded. In defending the ladies, their attorney seemed to evince a little want of tact, and this prompted one of the former to invite Mr. Lincoln to add a few words to the jury if he thought he could aid their cause. He was too gallant to refuse, and their attorney, having consented, he made use of the following argument. In this case, I would change the order of indictment and have it read the state versus Mr. Whiskey instead of the state versus the ladies and touching these there are three laws the law of self-protection the law of the land or statute law and the moral law or law of god first the law of self-protection is a law of necessity as evinced by our forefathers in casting the tea overboard and asserting their right to the pursuit of life liberty and happiness in this case it is the only defense the ladies have for Tanner neither feared God nor regarded man. Second, the law of the land or statute law, and Tanner is recreant to both. Third, the moral law or law of God, and this is probably a law for the violation of which the jury can fix no punishment. Lincoln gave some of his own observations on the ruinous effects of whiskey in society and demanded its early suppression. After he had concluded, the court, without awaiting the return of the jury, dismissed the ladies, saying, Ladies, go home. I will require no bond of you, and if any fine is ever wanted of you, we will let you know. Avoided even appearance of evil. Frank W. Tracy, president of the First National Bank of Springfield, tells a story illustrative of two traits in Mr. Lincoln's character. Shortly after the national banking law went into effect, the First National of Springfield was chartered, and Mr. Tracy wrote to Mr. Lincoln, with whom he was well acquainted in a business way, and tendered him an opportunity to subscribe for some of the stock. In reply to the kindly offer, Mr. Lincoln wrote thanking Mr. Tracy, but at the same time declining to subscribe. He said he recognized that stock in a good national bank would be a good thing to hold, but he did not feel that he ought, as president, profit from a law which had been passed under his administration. He seemed to wish to avoid even the appearance of evil, said Mr. Tracy, in telling of the incident and so the act proved both his unvarying probity and his unfailing policy. War didn't admit of holidays. Lincoln wrote a letter on October 2, 1862, in which he observed, I sincerely wish war was a pleasanter and easier business than it is, but it does not admit of holidays. Neutrality Old John Bull got himself into a precious fine scrape when he went so far as to play double with the North as well as the South during the great American Civil War. In its issue of November 14, 1863, London Punch printed a rather clever cartoon illustrating the predicament Bull had created for himself. John is being lectured by Mrs. North and Mrs. South both good talkers and eminently able to hold their own in either social conversation, parliamentary debate, or political argument, but he bears it with the best grace possible. This is the way the text underneath the picture runs. Mrs. North, how about the Alabama, you wicked old man? Mrs. South, where's my rams? Take back your precious console, there. Punch had a good deal of fun with old John before it was through with him, but as the Confederate privateer Alabama was sent beneath the waves of the ocean at Cherbourg by the Kearsarge, 
and mrs south had no need for any more rams john got out of the difficulty without personal injury it was a tight squeeze though for mrs north was in a fighting humor and prepared to scratch or pull hair the fact that the privateer alabama built at an english shipyard and manned almost entirely by english sailors had managed to do about ten million dollars worth of damage to united states commerce was enough to make any one angry days of gladness passed after the war was well on a patriot woman of the west urged president lincoln to make hospitals at the north where the sick from the army of the mississippi could revive in a more bracing air among other reasons she said feelingly if you grant my petition you will be glad as long as you live with a look of sadness impossible to describe the president said i shall never be glad any more wouldn't take the money lincoln always regarded himself as the friend and protector of unfortunate clients and such he would never press for pay for his services a client named cogdall was unfortunate in business and gave a note in settlement of legal fees soon afterward he met with an accident by which he lost a hand meeting lincoln some time after on the steps of the state house the kind lawyer asked him how he was getting along badly enough replied cogdall i am both broken up in business and crippled then he added i have been thinking about that note of yours lincoln who had probably known all about cogdell's troubles and had prepared himself for the meeting took out his pocket-book and saying with a laugh well you needn't think any more about it handed him the note cogdell protesting lincoln said even if you had the money i would not take it and hurried away end of part eighteen part nineteen of lincoln's yarns and stories by alexander k mcclure this librivox recording is in the public domain part nineteen grant held on all the time dispatch to general grant august seventeenth eighteen sixty four i have seen your dispatch expressing your unwillingness to break your hold where you are neither am i willing hold on with a bulldog grip chewed the cud in solitude as a student if such a term could be applied to lincoln one who did not know him might have called him indolent he would pick up a book and run rapidly over the pages pausing here and there at the end of an hour never more than two or three hours he would close the book stretch himself out on the office lounge and then with hands under his head and eyes shut would digest the mental food he had just taken abe's yankee ingenuity war governor richard yates he was elected governor of illinois in 1860 when lincoln was first elected president told a good story at springfield illinois about lincoln one day the latter was in the sangamon river with his trousers rolled up five feet more or less trying to pilot a flatboat over a mill dam the boat was so full of water that it was hard to manage lincoln got the prow over and then instead of waiting to bail the water out bored a hole through the projecting part and let it run out affording a forcible illustration of the ready ingenuity of the future president lincoln paid homage to washington the martyr president thus spoke of washington in the course of an address washington is the mightiest name on earth long since the mightiest in the cause of civil liberty still mightiest in moral reformation on that name a eulogy is expected it cannot be to add brightness to the sun or glory to the name of washington is alike impossible let none attempt it in solemn awe pronounce the name and in its naked deathless splendor leave it shining on stirred even the reporters lincoln's influence upon his audiences was wonderful he could sway people at will and nothing better illustrates his extraordinary power than the manner in which he stirred up the newspaper reporters by his bloomington speech joseph medell editor of the chicago tribune told the story 
it was my journalistic duty though a delegate to the convention to make a long-hand report of the speeches delivered for the tribune i did make a few paragraphs of what lincoln said in the first eight or ten minutes but i became so absorbed in his magnetic oratory that i forgot myself and ceased to take notes and joined with the convention in cheering and stamping and clapping to the end of his speech i well remember that after lincoln sat down and calm had succeeded the tempest i waked out of a sort of hypnotic trance and then thought of my report for the paper there was nothing written but an abbreviated introduction it was some sort of satisfaction to find that i had not been scooped as all the newspaper men present had been equally carried away by the excitement caused by the wonderful oration and had made no report or sketch of the speech when abe came in when abe was fourteen years of age john hanks journeyed from kentucky to indiana and lived with the lincolns he described abe's habits thus when lincoln and i returned to the house from work he would go to the cupboard, snatch a piece of cornbread, take down a book, sit down on a chair, cock his legs up as high as his head, and read. He and I worked barefooted, grubbed it, plowed, mowed, cradled together, plowed corn, gathered it, and shucked corn. Abe read constantly when he had an opportunity. Eternal Fidelity to the Cause of Liberty During the Harrison presidential campaign of 1840, lincoln said in a speech at springfield illinois many free countries have lost their liberty and ours may lose hers but if she shall be it my proudest plume not that i was last to desert but that i never deserted her i know that the great volcano at washington aroused and directed by the evil spirit that reigns there is belching forth the lava of political corruption in a current broad and deep which is sweeping with frightful velocity over the whole length and breadth of the land bidding fair to leave unscathed no green spot or living thing i cannot deny that all may be swept away broken by it i too may be bow to it i never will the possibility that we may fail in the struggle ought not to deter us from the support of a cause which we believe to be just it shall never deter me if ever i feel the soul within me elevate and expand to those dimensions not wholly unworthy of its almighty architect it is when i contemplate the cause of my country deserted by all the world beside and i standing up boldly alone and hurling defiance at her victorious oppressors here without contemplating consequences before heaven and in the face of the world i swear eternal fidelity to the just cause as i deem it of the land of my life my liberty and my love and who that thinks with me will not fearlessly adopt the oath that i take let none falter who thinks he is right and we may succeed but if after all we shall fail be it so we have the proud consolation of saying to our consciences and to the departed shade of our country's freedom that the cause approved of our judgment and adorned of our hearts in disaster in chains in death we never faltered in defending abe's defalcations lincoln could not rest for an instant under the consciousness that even unwittingly he had defrauded anybody on one occasion while clerking in offutt's store at new salem he sold a woman a little bale of goods amounting by the reckoning to two dollars and twenty cents he received the money and the woman went away on adding the items of the bill again to make himself sure of correctness he found that he had taken six and a quarter cents too much it was night and closing and locking the store he started out on foot a distance of two or three miles for the house of his defrauded customer and delivering to her the sum whose possession had so much troubled him went home satisfied on another occasion just as he was closing the store for the night a woman entered and asked for half a pound of tea the tea was weighed out and paid for and the store was left for the night 
the next morning lincoln when about to begin the duties of the day discovered a four ounce weight on the scales he saw at once that he had made a mistake and shutting the store he took a long walk before breakfast to deliver the remainder of the tea these are very humble incidents but they illustrate the man's perfect conscientiousness his sensitive honesty better perhaps than they would if they were of greater moment he wasn't guileless leonard sweat of chicago whose counsels were doubtless among the most welcome to lincoln in summing up lincoln's character said from the commencement of his life to its close i have sometimes doubted whether he ever asked anybody's advice about anything he would listen to everybody he would hear everybody but he rarely if ever asked for opinions as a politician and as president he arrived at all his conclusions from his own reflections and when his conclusions were once formed he never doubted but what they were right one great public mistake of his lincoln's character as generally received and acquiesced in is that he is considered by the people of this country as a frank guileless and unsophisticated man there never was a greater mistake beneath a smooth surface of candor and apparent declaration of all his thoughts and feelings he exercised the most exalted tact and wisest discrimination he handled and moved men remotely as we do pieces upon a chessboard he retained through life all the friends he ever had and he made the wrath of his enemies to praise him this was not by cunning or intrigue in the low acceptance of the term but by far-seeing reason and discernment he always told only enough of his plans and purposes to induce the belief that he had communicated all yet he reserved enough to have communicated nothing sweet but mild revenge when the united states found that a war with black hawk could not be dodged governor reynolds of illinois issued a call for volunteers and among the companies that immediately responded was one from menard county illinois many of these volunteers were from new salem and clary grove and lincoln being out of business was the first to enlist the company being full the men held a meeting at richmond for the election of officers lincoln had won many hearts and they told him that he must be their captain it was an office to which he did not aspire and for which he felt he had no special fitness but he finally consented to be a candidate there was but one other candidate a mr kirkpatrick who was one of the most influential men of the region previously kirkpatrick had been an employer of lincoln and was so overbearing in his treatment of the young man that the latter left him the simple mode of electing a captain adopted by the company was by placing the candidates apart and telling the men to go and stand with the one they preferred lincoln and his competitor took their positions and then the word was given at least three out of every four went to lincoln at once when it was seen by those who had arranged themselves with the other candidate that lincoln was the choice of the majority of the company they left their places one by one and came over to the successful side until lincoln's opponent in the friendly strife was left standing almost alone i felt badly to see him cut so said a witness of the scene here was an opportunity for revenge the humble laborer was his employer's captain but the opportunity was never improved mr lincoln frequently confessed that no subsequent success of his life had given him half the satisfaction that this election did didn't trust the court in one of his many stories of lincoln his law partner w h herndon told this as illustrating lincoln's shrewdness as a lawyer i was with lincoln once and listened to an oral argument by him in which he rehearsed an extended history of the law it was a carefully prepared and masterly discourse but as i thought entirely useless after he was through and we were walking home i asked him why he went so far back in the history of the law i presumed the court knew enough history that's where you're mistaken was his instant rejoinder 
i dared not just the case on the presumption that the court knows everything in fact i argued it on the presumption that the court didn't know anything a statement which when one reviews the decision of our appellate courts is not so extravagant as one would at first suppose handsomest man on earth one day thaddeus stevens called at the white house with an elderly woman whose son had been in the army but for some offense had been court-martialed and sentenced to death there were some extenuating circumstances and after a full hearing the president turned to stevens and said mr stevens do you think this is a case which will warrant my interference with my knowledge of the facts and the parties was the reply i should have no hesitation in granting a pardon then returned mr lincoln i will pardon him and proceeded forthwith to execute the paper the gratitude of the mother was too deep for expression save by her tears and not a word was said between her and stevens until they were halfway down the stairs on their passage out when she suddenly broke forth in an excited manner with the words i knew it was a copperhead lie what do you refer to madam asked stevens why they told me he was an ugly-looking man she replied with vehemence he is the handsomest man i ever saw in my life that coon came down lincoln's last warning was the title of a cartoon which appeared in harper's weekly on october eleventh eighteen sixty two under the picture was the text now if you don't come down i'll cut the tree from under you this illustration was peculiarly apt as on the first of january eighteen sixty three president lincoln issued his great emancipation proclamation declaring all slaves in the united states forever free old abe was a handy man with the axe having split many thousands of rails with its keen edge as the slavery coon wouldn't heed the warning lincoln did cut the tree from under him and so he came down to the ground with a heavy thump this act of emancipation put an end to the notion of the southern slaveholders that involuntary servitude was one of the sacred institutions on the continent of north america it also demonstrated that lincoln was thoroughly in earnest when he declared that he would not only save the union but that he meant what he said in the speech wherein he asserted this nation cannot exist half slave and half free wrote pieces when very young at fifteen years of age abe wrote pieces or compositions and even some doggerel rhyme which he recited to the great amusement of his playmates one of his first compositions was against cruelty to animals he was very much annoyed and pained at the conduct of the boys who were in the habit of catching terrapins and putting coals of fire on their backs which thoroughly disgusted abraham he would chide us said nat grisby tell us it was wrong and would write against it when eighteen years old abe wrote a piece on national politics and it so pleased a lawyer friend named pritchard that the latter had it printed in an obscure paper thereby adding much to the author's pride abe did not conceal his satisfaction in this piece he wrote among other things the american government is the best form of government for an intelligent people it ought to be kept sound and preserved forever that general education should be fostered and carried all over the country that the constitution should be saved the union perpetuated and the laws revered respected and enforced try to steer her through john a logan and a friend of illinois called upon lincoln at willard's hotel washington february twenty third the morning of his arrival and urged a vigorous firm policy patiently listening lincoln replied seriously but cheerfully as the country has placed me at the helm of the ship i'll try to steer her through grand gloomy and peculiar lincoln was a marked and peculiar young man people talked about him his studious habits his greed for information his thorough mastery of the difficulties of every new position in which he was placed his intelligence on all matters of public concern his unwearying good nature his skill in telling a story his great athletic power his quaint odd ways his uncouth appearance 
all tended to bring him in sharp contrast with the dull mediocrity by which he was surrounded denton offutt his old employer said after having had a conversation with lincoln that the young man had talent enough in him to make a president on the way to gettysburg when lincoln was on his way to the national cemetery at gettysburg an old gentleman told him that his only son fell on little round top at gettysburg and he was going to look at the spot mr lincoln replied you have been called on to make a terrible sacrifice for the union and a visit to that spot i fear will open your wounds afresh but oh my dear sir if we had reached the end of such sacrifices and had nothing left for us to do but to place garlands on the graves of those who have already fallen we could give thanks even midst our tears but when i think of the sacrifices of life yet to be offered and the hearts and homes yet to be made desolate before this dreadful war is over my heart is like lead within me and i feel at times like hiding in deep darkness at one of the stopping places of the train a very beautiful child having a bunch of rosebuds in her hand was lifted up to an open window of the president's car flowered for the president the president stepped to the window took the rosebuds bent down and kissed the child saying you are a sweet little rosebud yourself i hope your life will open into perpetual beauty and goodness stood up the longest there was a rough gallantry among the young people and lincoln's old comrades and friends in indiana have left many tales of how he went to see the girls of how he brought in the biggest backlog and made the brightest fire of how the young people sitting around it watching the way the sparks flew told their fortunes he helped pare apples shell corn and crack nuts he took the girls to meeting and to spelling school though he was not often allowed to take part in the spelling match for the one who chose first always chose a blinken and that was equivalent to winning as the others knew that he would stand up the longest a mortifying experience a lady reader or elocutionist came to springfield in eighteen fifty seven a large crowd greeted her among other things she recited nothing to wear a piece in which is described the perplexities that beset miss flora mcflimsey in her efforts to appear fashionable in the midst of one stanza in which no effort is made to say anything particularly amusing and during the reading of which the audience manifested the most respectful silence and attention some one in the rear seats burst out with a loud coarse laugh a sudden and explosive guffaw it startled the speaker and audience and kindled a storm of unsuppressed laughter and applause everybody looked back to ascertain the cause of the demonstration and were greatly surprised to find that it was mr lincoln he blushed and squirmed with the awkward diffidence of a schoolboy what caused him to laugh no one was able to explain he was doubtless wrapped up in a brown study and recalling some amusing episode indulged in laughter without realizing his surroundings the experience mortified him greatly no halfway business soon after mr lincoln began to practice law at springfield he was engaged in a criminal case in which it was thought there was little chance of success throwing all his powers into it he came off victorious and promptly received for his services five hundred dollars a legal friend calling upon him the next morning found him sitting before a table upon which his money was spread out counting it over and over look here judge said he see what a heap of money i've got from this case did you ever see anything like it why i never had so much money in my life before put it all together then crossing his arms upon the table his manner sobering down he added i have got just five hundred dollars if it were only seven hundred and fifty i would go directly and purchase a quarter section of land and settle it upon my old stepmother his friend said that if the deficiency was all he needed he would loan him the amount taking his note to which mr lincoln instantly acceded his friend then said 
lincoln i would do just what you have indicated your stepmother is getting old and will not probably live many years i would settle the property upon her for her use during her lifetime to revert to you upon her death with much feeling mr lincoln replied i shall do no such thing it is a poor return at best for all the good woman's devotion and fidelity to me and there is not going to be any halfway business about it and so saying he gathered up his money and proceeded forthwith to carry his long-cherished purpose into execution discouraged litigation lincoln believed in preventing unnecessary litigation and carried out this in his practice who was your guardian he asked a young man who came to him to complain that a part of the property left him had been withheld enoch kingsbury replied the young man i know mr kingsbury said lincoln and he is not the man to have cheated you out of a cent and i can't take the case and advise you to drop the subject and it was dropped going home to get ready edwin m stanton was one of the attorneys in the great reaper patent case heard in cincinnati in eighteen fifty five lincoln also having been retained the latter was rather anxious to deliver the argument on the general propositions of law applicable to the case but it being decided to have mr stanton do this the westerner made no complaint speaking of stanton's argument and the view lincoln took of it ralph emerson a young lawyer who was present at the trial said the final summing up on our side was by mr stanton and though he took but about three hours in his delivery he had devoted as many if not more weeks to its preparation it was very able and mr lincoln was throughout the whole of it a rapt listener mr stanton closed his speech in a flight of impassioned eloquence then the court adjourned for the day and mr lincoln invited me to take a long walk with him for block after block he walked rapidly forward not saying a word evidently deeply dejected at last he turned suddenly to me exclaiming emerson i am going home a pause i am going home to study law why i exclaimed to mr lincoln you stand at the head of the bar in illinois now what are you talking about ah yes he said i do occupy a good position there and i think that i can get along with the way things are done there now but these college trained men who have devoted their whole lives to study are coming west don't you see and they study their cases as we never do they have got as far as cincinnati now they will soon be in illinois another long pause then stopping and turning towards me his countenance suddenly assuming that look of strong determination which those who knew him best sometimes saw upon his face he exclaimed i am going home to study law i am as good as any of them and when they get out to illinois i will be ready for them the rail sputter repairing the union the cartoon given here in facsimile was one of the posters which decorated the picturesque presidential campaign of 1864 and assisted in making the period previous to the vote casting a lively and memorable one this poster was a lithograph and as the title the rail splitter at work repairing the union would indicate the president is using the vice presidential candidate on the republican national ticket andrew johnson as an aide in the work johnson was in early life a tailor and he is pictured as busily engaged in sewing up the rents made in the map of the union by the secessionist both men are thoroughly in earnest and as history relates the torn places in the union map were stitched together so nicely that no one could have told by mere observation that a tear had ever been made andrew johnson who succeeded lincoln upon the assassination of the latter was a remarkable man born in north carolina he removed to tennessee when young was congressman governor and united states senator being made military governor of his state in eighteen sixty two a strong staunch union man he was nominated for the vice presidency on the lincoln ticket to conciliate the war democrats 
after serving out his term as president he was again elected united states senator from tennessee but he died shortly after taking his seat but he was just the sort of man to assist uncle abe in sewing up the torn places in the union map and as military governor of tennessee was a powerful factor in winning friends in the south to the union cause end of part nineteen part twenty of lincoln's yarns and stories by alexander k mcclure this librivox recording is in the public domain part twenty find out for yourselves several of us lawyers remarked one of his colleagues in the eastern end of the circuit annoyed lincoln once while he was holding court for davis by attempting to defend against a note to which there were many makers we had no legal but a good moral defence but what we wanted most of all was to stave it off till the next term of court by one expedient or another we uh, bothered the court about it till late on saturday the day of adjournment he adjourned for supper with nothing left but this case to dispose of after supper he heard our twaddle for nearly an hour and then made this odd entry l d chadden versus j d beasley et al april term eighteen fifty six champaign county court plea in abatement by b z green a defendant not served filed saturday at eleven o'clock a m april twenty fourth eighteen fifty six stricken from the files by order of court demurrer to declaration if there ever was one overruled defendants who are served now at eight o'clock p m of the last day of the term ask to plead to the merits which is denied by the court on the ground that the offer comes too late and therefore as by neil dechet judgment is rendered for plaintiff clerk assess damages a lincoln judge pro tem the lawyer who reads this singular entry will appreciate its oddity if no one else does after making it one of the lawyers on recovering from his astonishment ventured to inquire well lincoln how can we get this case up again lincoln eyed him quizzically for a moment and then answered you have all been so mighty smart about this case you can find out how to take it up again yourselves rough on the negro mr lincoln one day was talking with the rev dr sunderland about the emancipation proclamation and the future of the negro suddenly a ripple of amusement broke the solemn tone of his voice as for the negroes doctor and what is going to become of them i told ben wade the other day that it made me think of a story i read in one of my first books aesop's fables it was an old edition and had curious rough wood cuts one of which showed three white men scrubbing a negro in a potash kettle filled with cold water the text explained that the men thought that by scrubbing the negro they might make him white just about the time they thought they were succeeding he took cold and died now i am afraid that by the time we get through this war the negro will catch cold and die challenged all comers personal encounters were of frequent occurrence in gentryville in early days and the prestige of having thrashed an opponent gave the victor marked social distinction green b taylor with whom abe worked the greater part of one winter on a farm furnished an account of the noted fight between john johnston abe's stepbrother and william grigsby in which stirring drama abe himself played an important role before the curtain was rung down taylor's father was the second for johnston and william witten officiated in a similar capacity for grigsby they had a terrible fight related taylor and it soon became apparent that grigsby was too much for lincoln's man johnston after they had fought a long time without interference it having been agreed not to break the ring abe burst through caught grigsby threw him off and some feet away there grigsby stood proud as lucifer and swinging a bottle of liquor over his head swore he was the big buck of the lick 
If anyone doubts it, he shouted, he has only to come on and wet his horns. A general engagement followed this challenge, but at the end of hostilities the field was cleared and the wounded retired amid the exultant shouts of their victors. Government Rests in Public Opinion Lincoln delivered a speech at a Republican banquet at Chicago, December 10, 1856, just after the presidential campaign of that year, in which he said, Our government rests in public opinion. Whoever can change public opinion can change the government practically just so much. Public opinion on any subject always has a central idea, from which all its minor thoughts radiate. That central idea in our political public opinion at the beginning was, and until recently has continued to be, the equality of man. And although it has always submitted patiently to whatever of inequality there seemed to be as a matter of actual necessity, its constant working has been a steady progress towards the practical equality of all men. Let every one who really believes and is resolved that free society is not and shall not be a failure, and who can conscientiously declare that in the past contest he has done only what he thought best, let every such one have charity to believe that every other one can say as much. Thus let bygones be bygones, let party differences as nothing be, and with steady eye on the real issue, let us re-inaugurate the good old central ideas of the Republic. We can do it. The human heart is with us. God is with us. We shall never be able to declare that all states as states are equal, nor yet that all citizens are equal, but to renew the broader, better declaration, including both these and much more, that all men are created equal. Hurry might make trouble up to the very last moment of the life of the confederacy the london punch had its fling at the united states in a cartoon printed february eighteenth eighteen sixty five labeled the threatening notice punch intimates that uncle sam is in somewhat of a hurry to serve justice on john bull regarding the contentions in connection with the northern border of the united states lincoln however as attorney for his revered uncle advises caution accordingly he tells his uncle according to the text under the picture attorney lincoln now uncle sam you're in a darned hurry to serve this here notice on john bull now it's my duty as your attorney to tell you that you may drive him to go over to that cuss davis uncle sam considers in this instance president lincoln is given credit for judgment and common sense his advice to his uncle sam to be prudent being sound there was trouble all along the canadian border during the war while canada was the refuge of northern conspirators and southern spies who at times crossed the line and inflicted great damage upon the states bordering on it the plot to seize the great lake cities chicago milwaukee detroit Cleveland, Buffalo, and others, was figured out in Canada by the Southerners and Northern Allies. President Lincoln, in his message to Congress in December 1864, said the United States had given notice to England that at the end of six months this country would, if necessary, increase its naval armament upon the lakes. What Great Britain feared was the abrogation by the United States of all treaties regarding Canada. By previous stipulation, the United States and England were each to have but one war vessel on the Great Lakes. Saw himself dead. This story cannot be repeated in Lincoln's own language, although he told it often enough to intimate friends but as it was never taken down by a stenographer in the martyred president's exact words the reader must accept a simple narration of the strange occurrence it was not long after the first nomination of lincoln for the presidency when he saw or imagined he saw the startling apparition one day feeling weary he threw himself upon a lounge in one of the rooms of his house at springfield to rest 
opposite the lounge upon which he was lying was a large long mirror and he could easily see the reflection of his form full length suddenly he saw or imagined he saw two lincolns in the mirror each lying full length upon the lounge but they differed strangely in appearance one was the natural lincoln full of life vigor energy and strength the other was a dead lincoln the face white as marble the limbs nerveless and lifeless the body inert and still lincoln was so impressed with this vision which he considered merely an optical illusion that he arose put on his hat and went out for a walk returning to the house he determined to test the matter again and the result was the same as before he distinctly saw the two lincolns one living and the other dead he said nothing to his wife about this she being at that time in a nervous condition and apprehensive that some accident would surely befall her husband she was particularly fearful that he might be the victim of an assassin lincoln always made light of her fears but yet he was never easy in his mind afterwards to more thoroughly test the so-called optical illusion and prove beyond the shadow of a doubt whether it was a mere fanciful creation of the brain or a reflection upon the broad face of the mirror which might be seen at any time lincoln made frequent experiments each and every time the result was the same he could not get away from the two lincolns one living and the other dead lincoln never saw this forbidding reflection while in the white house time after time he placed a couch in front of a mirror at a distance from the glass where he could view his entire length while lying down but the looking-glass in the executive mansion was faithful to its trust and only the living lincoln was observable the late ward lehman once a law partner of lincoln and marshal of the district of columbia during his first administration tells in his recollections of abraham lincoln of the dreams the president had all foretelling death lehman was lincoln's most intimate friend being practically his bodyguard and slept in the white house in reference to lincoln's death dreams he says how it may be asked could he make life tolerable burdened as he was with that portentous horror which though visionary and of trifling import in our eyes was by his interpretation a premonition of impending doom i answer in a word his sense of duty to his country his belief that the inevitable is right and his innate and irrepressible humour but the most startling incident in the life of mr lincoln was a dream he had only a few days before his assassination to him it was a thing of deadly import and certainly no vision was ever fashioned more exactly like a dread reality coupled with other dreams with the mirror scene and with other incidents there was something about it so amazingly real so true to the actual tragedy which occurred soon after that more than mortal strength and wisdom would have been required to let it pass without a shudder or a pang after worrying over it for some days mr lincoln seemed no longer able to keep the secret i give it as nearly in his own words as i can from notes which i made immediately after its recital there were only two or three persons present the president was in a melancholy meditative mood and had been silent for some time mrs lincoln who was present rallied him on his solemn visage and want of spirit this seemed to arouse him and without seeming to notice her sally he said in slow and measured tones it seems strange how much there is in the bible about dreams there are i think some sixteen chapters in the old testament and four or five in the new in which dreams are mentioned and there are many other passages scattered throughout the book which refer to visions in the old days god and his angels came to men in their sleep and made themselves known in dreams mrs lincoln here remarked why you look dreadfully solemn do you believe in dreams 
i can't say that i do returned mr lincoln but i had one the other night which has haunted me ever since after it occurred the first time i opened the bible and strange as it may appear it was at the twenty-eighth chapter of genesis which relates the wonderful dream jacob had i turned to other passages and seemed to encounter a dream or a vision wherever i looked i kept on turning the leaves of the old book and everywhere my eyes fell upon passages recording matters strangely in keeping with my own thoughts supernatural visitations dreams visions etc he now looked so serious and disturbed that mrs lincoln exclaimed oh you frighten me what is the matter i am afraid said mr lincoln observing the effect his words had upon his wife that i have done wrong to mention the subject at all but somehow the thing has got possession of me and like banquo's ghost it will not down this only inflamed mrs lincoln's curiosity the more and while bravely disclaiming any belief in dreams she strongly urged him to tell the dream which seemed to have such a hold upon him being seconded in this by another listener mr lincoln hesitated but at length commenced very deliberately his brow overcast with a shade of melancholy about ten days ago said he i retired very late i had been up waiting for important dispatches from the front i could not have been long in bed when i fell into a slumber for i was weary i soon began to dream there seemed to be a death-like stillness about me then i heard subdued sobs as if a number of people were weeping i thought i left my bed and wandered downstairs there the silence was broken by the same pitiful sobbing but the mourners were invisible i went from room to room no living person was in sight but the same mournful sounds of distress met me as i passed along it was light in all the rooms every object was familiar to me but where were all the people who were grieving as if their hearts would break i was puzzled and alarmed what could be the meaning of all this determined to find the cause of a state of things so mysterious and so shocking i kept on until i arrived at the east room which i entered there i met with a sickening surprise before me was a catafalque on which rested a corpse wrapped in funeral vestments around it were stationed soldiers who were acting as guards and there was a throng of people some gazing mournfully upon the corpse whose face was covered others weeping pitifully who is dead in the white house i demanded of one of the soldiers the president was his answer he was killed by an assassin then came a loud burst of grief from the crowd which awoke me from my dream i slept no more that night and although it was only a dream i have been strangely annoyed by it ever since that is horrid said mrs lincoln i wish you had not told it i am glad i don't believe in dreams or i should be in terror from this time forth well responded mr lincoln thoughtfully it is only a dream mary let us say no more about it and try to forget it this dream was so horrible so real and so in keeping with other dreams and threatening presentiments of his that mr lincoln was profoundly disturbed by it during its recital he was grave gloomy and at times visibly pale but perfectly calm he spoke slowly with measured accents and deep feeling in conversations with me he referred to it afterwards closing one with this quotation from hamlet to sleep perchance to dream ay there's the rub with a strong accent upon the last three words once the president alluded to this terrible dream with some show of playful humor hill said he your apprehension of harm to me from some hidden enemy is downright foolishness for a long time you have been trying to keep somebody the lord knows who from killing me don't you see how it will turn out in this dream it was not me but some other fellow that was killed it seems that this ghostly assassin tried his hand on someone else and this reminds me of an old farmer in illinois whose family were made sick by eating greens 
some poisonous herb had got into the mess and members of the family were in danger of dying there was a half-witted boy in the family called jake and always afterward when they had greens the old man would say now afore we risk these greens let us try em on jake if he stands em we're all right just so with me as long as this imaginary assassin continues to exercise himself on others i can stand it he then became serious and said well let it go i think the lord in his own good time and way will work this out all right god knows what is best these words he spoke with a sigh and rather in a tone of soliloquy as if hardly noting my presence mr lincoln had another remarkable dream which was repeated so frequently during his occupancy of the white house that he came to regard it as a welcome visitor it was of a pleasing and promising character having nothing in it of the horrible it was always an omen of a union victory and came with unerring certainty just before every military or naval engagement where our arms were crowned with success in this dream he saw a ship sailing away rapidly badly damaged and our victorious vessels in close pursuit he saw also the close of a battle on land the enemy routed and our forces in possession of vantage ground of inestimable importance mr lincoln stated it as a fact that he had this dream just before the battles of antietam gettysburg and other signal engagements throughout the war the last time mr lincoln had this dream was the night before his assassination on the morning of that lamentable day there was a cabinet meeting at which general grant was present during an interval of general discussion the president asked general grant if he had any news from general sherman who was then confronting johnston the reply was in the negative but the general added that he was in hourly expectation of a dispatch announcing johnston's surrender mr lincoln then with great impressiveness said we shall hear very soon and the news will be important general grant asked him why he thought so because said mr lincoln i had a dream last night and ever since this war began i have had the same dream just before every event of great national importance it portends some important events which will happen very soon on the night of the fateful fourteenth of april eighteen sixty five mrs lincoln's first exclamation after the president was shot was his dream was prophetic lincoln was a believer in certain phases of the supernatural assured as he undoubtedly was by omens which to his mind were conclusive that he would rise to greatness and power he was as firmly convinced by the same tokens that he would be suddenly cut off at the height of his career and the fullness of his fame he always believed that he would fall by the hand of an assassin mr lincoln had this further idea dreams being natural occurrences in the strictest sense he held that their best interpreters are the common people and this accounts in great measure for the profound respect he always had for the collective wisdom of plain people the children of nature he called them touching matters belonging to the domain of psychical mysteries there was some basis of truth he believed for whatever obtained a general credence among these uh, children of nature concerning uh, presentiments and dreams mr lincoln had a philosophy of his own which strangely as it may appear was in perfect harmony with his character in all other respects he was no dabbler in divination astrology horoscopy prophecy ghostly lore or witcheries of any sort every little helped as the time drew near at which mr lincoln said he would issue the emancipation proclamation some clergymen who feared the president might change his mind called on him to urge him to keep his promise we were ushered into the cabinet room says dr sunderland it was very dim but one gas jet burning as we entered mr lincoln was standing at the farther end of the long table which filled the centre of the room 
as i stood by the door i am so very short that i was obliged to look up to see the president mr robbins introduced me and i began at once by saying i have come mr president to anticipate the new year with my respects and if i may to say to you a word about the serious condition of this country go ahead doctor replied the president every little helps but i was too much in earnest to laugh at his sally at my smallness about to lay down the burden president lincoln at times said he felt sure his life would end with the war a correspondent of a boston paper had an interview with him in july eighteen sixty four and wrote regarding it the president told me he was certain he would not outlast the rebellion as will be remembered there was dissension then among the republican leaders many of his best friends had deserted him and were talking of an opposition convention to nominate another candidate and universal gloom was among the people the north was tired of the war and supposed an honorable peace attainable mr lincoln knew it was not that any peace at that time would be only disunion speaking of it he said i have faith in the people they will not consent to disunion the danger is they are misled let them know the truth and the country is safe he looked haggard and careworn and further on in the interview i remarked on his appearance you are wearing yourself out with work i can't work less he answered but it isn't that work never troubled me things look badly and i can't avoid anxiety personally i care nothing about a re-election but if our divisions defeat us i fear for the country when i suggested that right must eventually triumph he replied i grant that but i may never live to see it i feel a presentiment that i shall not outlast the rebellion when it is all over my work will be done he never intimated however that he expected to be assassinated lincoln would have preferred death horace greeley said some time after the death of president lincoln after the civil war began lincoln's tenacity of purpose paralleled his former immobility i believe he would have been nearly the last if not the very last man in america to recognize the southern confederacy had its armies been triumphant he would have preferred death punch and his little picture london punch was not satisfied with anything president lincoln did on december third eighteen sixty four after mr lincoln's re-election to the presidency a cartoon appeared in one of the pages of that genial publication the reproduction being printed here labeled the federal phoenix it attracted great attention at the time and was particularly pleasing to the enemies of the united states as it showed lincoln as the phoenix arising from the ashes of the federal constitution the public credit the freedom of the press state rights and the commerce of the north american republic president lincoln's endorsement by the people of the united states meant that the confederacy was to be crushed no matter what the cost that the union of states was to be preserved and that state rights was a thing of the past punch wished to create the impression that president lincoln's re-election was a personal victory that he would set up a despotism with himself at its head and trample upon the constitution of the united states and all the rights the citizens of the republic ever possessed the result showed that punch was suffering from an acute attack of needless alarm end of part twenty part twenty one of lincoln's yarns and stories by alexander k mcclure this librivox recording is in the public domain part twenty one fascinated by the wonderful lincoln was particularly fascinated by the wonderful happenings recorded in history he loved to read of those mighty events which had been foretold and often brooded upon these subjects his early conviction upon occult matters led him to read all books tending to strengthen these convictions the following lines in byron's dream were frequently quoted by him 
sleep hath its own world a boundary between the things misnamed death and existence sleep hath its own world and a wide realm of wild reality and dreams in their development have breath and tears and tortures and the touch of joy they leave a weight upon our waking thoughts they take a weight from off our waking toils they do divide our being those with whom he was associated in his early youth and young manhood and with whom he was always in cordial sympathy were thorough believers in presentiments and dreams and so lincoln drifted on through years of toil and exceptional hardship meditative aspiring certain of his star but appalled at times by its malignant aspect many times prior to his first election to the presidency he was both elated and alarmed by what seemed to him a rent in the veil which hides from mortal view what the future holds he saw or thought he saw a vision of glory and of blood himself the central figure in a scene which his fancy transformed from giddy enchantment to the most appalling tragedy why don't they come the suspense of the days when the capital was isolated the expected troops not arriving and an hourly attack feared wore on mr lincoln greatly i began to believe he said bitterly one day to some massachusetts soldiers that there is no north the seventh regiment is a myth rhode island is another you are the only real thing and again after pacing the floor of his deserted office for half an hour he was heard to exclaim to himself in an anguished tone why don't they come why don't they come grant's brand of whiskey lincoln was not a man of impulse and did nothing upon the spur of the moment action with him was the result of deliberation and study he took nothing for granted he judged men by their performances and not their speech if a general lost battles lincoln lost confidence in him if a commander was successful lincoln put him where he would be of the most service to the country grant is a drunkard asserted powerful and influential politicians to the president at the white house time after time he is not himself half the time he can't be relied upon and it is a shame to have such a man in command of an army so grant gets drunk does he queried lincoln addressing himself to one of the particularly active detractors of the soldier who at that period was inflicting heavy damage upon the confederates yes he does and i can prove it was the reply well returned lincoln with the faintest suspicion of a twinkle in his eye you needn't waste your time getting proof you just find out to oblige me what brand of whiskey grant drinks because i want to send a barrel of it to each one of my generals that ended the crusade against grant so far as the question of drinking was concerned his financial standing a new york firm applied to abraham lincoln some years before he became president for information as to the financial standing of one of his neighbors mr lincoln replied i am well acquainted with mr blank and know his circumstances first of all he has a wife and baby together they ought to be worth fifty thousand dollars to any man secondly he has an office in which there is a table worth a dollar fifty and three chairs worth mm, say a dollar last of all there is in one corner a large rat hole which will bear looking into respectfully a lincoln the dandy and the boys president lincoln appointed as consul to a south american country a young man from ohio who was a dandy a wag met the new appointee on his way to the white house to thank the president he was dressed in the most extravagant style the wag horrified him by telling him that the country to which he was assigned was noted chiefly for the bugs that abounded there and made life unbearable they'll bore a hole clean through you before a week has passed was the comforting assurance of the wag as they parted at the white house steps the new consul approached lincoln with disappointment clearly written all over his face 
instead of joyously thanking the president he told him the wag story of the bugs i am informed mr president he said that the place is full of vermin and that they could eat me up in a week's time well young man replied lincoln if that's true all i've got to say is that if such a thing happened they would leave a mighty good suit of clothes behind some ugly old lawyer a w swan of albuquerque new mexico told this story on lincoln being an eyewitness of the scene one day president lincoln was met in the park between the white house and the war department by an irate private soldier who was swearing in a high key cursing the government from the president down mr lincoln paused and asked him what was the matter matter enough was the reply i want my money i've been discharged here and can't get my pay mr lincoln asked if he had his papers saying that he used to practice law in a small way and possibly could help him my friend and i stepped behind some convenient shrubbery where we could watch the result mr lincoln took the papers from the hands of the crippled soldier and sat down with him at the foot of a convenient tree where he examined them carefully and writing a line on the back told the soldier to take them to mr potts chief clerk of the war department who would doubtless attend to the matter at once after mr lincoln had left the soldier we stepped out and asked him if he knew whom he had been talking with some ugly old fellow who pretends to be a lawyer was the reply my companion asked to see the papers and on their being handed to him pointed to the endorsement they had received this endorsement read mr potts attend to this man's case at once and see that he gets his pay a l good memory of names the following story illustrates the power of mr lincoln's memory of names and faces when he was a comparatively young man and a candidate for the illinois legislature he made a personal canvass of the district while swinging around the circle he stopped one day and took dinner with a farmer in sangamon county years afterward when mr lincoln had become president a soldier came to call on him at the white house at the first glance the chief executive said yes i remember you used to live on the danville road i took dinner with you when i was running for the legislature i recollect that we stood talking out at the barnyard gate while i sharpened my jackknife yes drawled the soldier you did but say wherever did you put that whetstone i looked for it a dozen times but i never could find it after the day you used it we allowed as how maybe you took along with you oh no said lincoln looking serious and pushing away a lot of documents of state from the desk in front of him no i put it on top of that gatepost that high one well exclaimed the visitor maybe you did couldn't anybody else have put it there and none of us ever thought of looking there for it the soldier was then on his way home and when he got there the first thing he did was to look for the whetstone and sure enough there it was just where lincoln had laid it fifteen years before the honest fellow wrote a letter to the chief magistrate telling him that the whetstone had been found and would never be lost again settled out of court when abe lincoln used to be drifting around the country practicing law in fulton and meanard counties illinois an old fellow met him going to lewiston riding a horse which while it was a serviceable enough animal was not of the kind to be truthfully called a fine saddler it was a weather-beaten nag patient and plodding and it toiled along with abe and abe's books tucked away in saddle-bags lay heavy on the horse's flank hello uncle tommy said abe hello abe responded uncle tommy i'm powerful glad to see you abe for i'm gwine to have something for you at lewiston court i reckon how's that uncle tommy said abe well jim adams his land runs long o mine and he's pesterin me a heap and i got to get the law on jim i reckon uncle tommy you haven't had any fights with jim have you no he's a fair to middle neighbor isn't he only tolerable abe he's been a neighbor of yours for a long time hasn't he nigh on fifteen year part of that time you get along all right don't you i reckon we do abe 
well now uncle tommy you see this horse of mine he isn't as good a horse as i could straddle and i sometimes get out of patience with him but i know his faults he does fairly well as horses go and it might take me a long time to get used to some other horses faults for all horses have faults you and uncle jimmy must put up with each other as i and my horse do with one another i reckon abe said uncle tommy as he bit off about four ounces of missouri plug i reckon you're about right and abe lincoln with a smile on his gaunt face rode on toward lewiston the five points sunday school when mr lincoln visited new york in eighteen sixty he felt a great interest in many of the institutions for reforming criminals and saving the young from a life of crime among others he visited unattended the five points house of industry and the superintendent of the sabbath school there gave the following account of the event one sunday morning i saw a tall remarkable-looking man enter the room and take a seat among us he listened with fixed attention to our exercises and his countenance expressed such genuine interest that i approached him and suggested that he might be willing to say something to the children he accepted the invitation with evident pleasure and coming forward began a simple address which at once fascinated every little hearer and hushed the room into silence his language was strikingly beautiful and his tones musical with intense feeling the little faces would droop into sad conviction when he uttered sentences of warning and would brighten into sunshine as he spoke cheerful words of promise once or twice he attempted to close his remarks but the imperative shouts of go on oh do go on would compel him to resume as i looked upon the gaunt and sinewy frame of the stranger and marked his powerful head and determined features now touched into softness by the impressions of the moment i felt an irrepressible curiosity to learn something more about him and while he was quietly leaving the room i begged to know his name he courteously replied it is abraham lincoln from illinois sentinel obeyed orders a slight variation of the traditional sentry story is related by c c buell it was a cold blustery winter night says mr buell mr lincoln emerged from the front door his lank figure bent over as he drew tightly about his shoulders the shawl which he employed for such protection for he was on his way to the war department at the west corner of the grounds where in times of battle he was wont to get the midnight dispatches from the field as the blast struck him he thought of the numbness of the pacing sentry and turning to him said young man you've got a cold job to-night step inside and stand guard there my orders keep me out here the soldier replied yes said the president in his argumentative tone but your duty can be performed just as well inside as out here and you'll oblige me by going in i have been stationed outside the soldier answered and resumed his beat hold on there said mr lincoln as he turned back again it occurs to me that i am commander-in-chief of the army and i order you to go inside why lincoln growed whiskers perhaps the majority of people in the united states don't know why lincoln growed whiskers after his first nomination for the presidency before that time his face was clean-shaven in the beautiful village of westfield chautauqua county new york there lived in eighteen sixty little grace Bedell. during the campaign of that year she saw a portrait of lincoln for which she felt the love and reverence that was common in republican families and his smooth homely face rather disappointed her she said to her mother i think mother that mr lincoln would look better if he wore whiskers and i mean to write and tell him so the mother gave her permission grace's father was a republican her two brothers were democrats grace wrote at once to the hon abraham lincoln esq springfield illinois in which she told him how old she was and where she lived that she was a republican that she thought he would make a good president but would look better if he would let his whiskers grow 
if he would do so she would try to coax her brothers to vote for him she thought the rail fence around the picture of his cabin was very pretty if you have not time to answer my letter will you allow your little girl to reply for you lincoln was much pleased with the letter and decided to answer it which he did at once as follows springfield illinois october nineteenth eighteen sixty miss grace Bettle. my dear little miss your very agreeable letter of the fifteenth is received i regret the necessity of saying that i have no daughter i have three sons one seventeen one nine and one seven years of age they with their mother constitute my whole family as to the whiskers having never worn any do you not think people would call it a piece of silly affectation if i should begin it now your very sincere well-wisher a lincoln when on the journey to washington to be inaugurated lincoln's train stopped at westfield he recollected his little correspondent and spoke of her to ex-lieutenant governor george w patterson who called out and asked if grace Bettel was present there was a large surging mass of people gathered about the train but grace was discovered at a distance the crowd opened a pathway to the coach and she came timidly but gladly to the president-elect who told her that she might see that he had allowed his whiskers to grow at her request then reaching out his long arms he drew her up to him and kissed her the act drew an enthusiastic demonstration of approval from the multitude grace married a kansas banker and became grace Bettle billings lincoln as a dancer lincoln made his first appearance in society when he was first sent to springfield illinois as a member of the state legislature it was not an imposing figure which he cut in a ballroom but still he was occasionally to be found there miss mary todd who afterward became his wife was the magnet which drew the tall awkward young man from his den one evening lincoln approached miss todd and said in his peculiar idiom miss todd i should like to dance with you the worst way the young woman accepted the inevitable and hobbled around the room with him when she returned to her seat one of her companions asked mischievously well mary did he dance with you the worst way yes she answered the very worst simply practical humanity an instance of young lincoln's practical humanity at an early period of his life is recorded in this way one evening while returning from a raising in his wide neighborhood with a number of companions he discovered a stray horse with saddle and bridle upon him the horse was recognized as belonging to a man who was accustomed to get drunk and it was suspected at once that he was not far off a short search only was necessary to confirm the belief the poor drunkard was found in a perfectly helpless condition upon the chilly ground abraham's companions urged the cowardly policy of leaving him to his fate but young lincoln would not hear to the proposition at his request the miserable sot was lifted on his shoulders and he actually carried him eighty rods to the nearest house sending word to his father that he should not be back that night with the reason for his absence he attended and nursed the man until the morning and had the pleasure of believing that he had saved his life happy figures of speech on one occasion exasperated at the discrepancy between the aggregate of troops forwarded to mcclellan and the number that same general reported as having received lincoln exclaimed sending men to that army is like shoveling fleas across the barnyard half of them never get there to a politician who had criticized his course he wrote would you have me drop the war where it is or would you prosecute it in future with elder stock squirts charged with rosewater when on his first arrival in washington as president he found himself besieged by office seekers while the war was breaking out he said i feel like a man letting lodgings at one end of his house while the other end is on fire a few rhythmic shots 
Lord Lehman, Marshal of the District of Columbia during Lincoln's time in Washington, accompanied the President everywhere. He was a good singer, and when Lincoln was in one of his melancholy moods, would fire a few rhythmic shots at the President to cheer the latter. Lincoln keenly relished nonsense in the shape of witty or comic ditties. A parody of A Life on the Ocean Wave was always pleasing to him. Oh, a life on the ocean wave and a home on the rolling deep, with rattlins fried three times a day and a leaky old berth for to sleep, where the gray-beard cockroach roams on thoughts of kind intent, and the raving bedbug comes, the road the cockroach went. Lincoln could not control his laughter when he heard songs of this sort. He was fond of negro melodies, too, and the blue-tailed fly was a great favorite with him. He often called for that buzzing ballad when he and Lehman were alone, and he wanted to throw off the weight of public and private cares. The ballad of the blue-tailed fly contained two verses which ran, when i was young i used to wait at massa's table and hand a plate and pass the bottle when he was dry and brush away the blue-tailed fly oh massa's dead oh let him rest dey say all things am for the best but i can't forget until i die oh massa and the blue-tailed fly while humorous songs delighted the president he also loved to listen to patriotic airs and ballads containing sentiment he was fond of hearing the sword of bunker hill ben bolt and uh, the lament of the irish emigrant his preference of the verses in the latter was this i'm lonely now mary for the poor make no new friends but oh they love the better still the few our father sends and you were all i had mary my blessing and my pride there's nothing left to care for now since my poor mary died those who knew Lincoln were well aware he was incapable of so monstrous an act as that of wantonly insulting the dead, as was charged in the infamous libel, which asserted that he listened to a comic song on the field of Antietam before the dead were buried. Old Man Glenn's Religion Mr. Lincoln once remarked to a friend that his religion was like that of an old man named Glenn in Indiana, whom he heard speak at a church meeting, and who said, When I do good, I feel good. When I do bad, I feel bad. And that's my religion. Mrs. Lincoln herself has said that Mr. Lincoln had no faith, no faith in the usual acceptance of those words. He never joined a church, but still, as I believe, he was a religious man by nature. He first seemed to think about the subject when our boy Willie died, and then, more than ever, about the time he went to Gettysburg. But it was a kind of poetry in his nature, and he never was a technical Christian. Last Acts of Mercy during the afternoon preceding his assassination the president signed a pardon for a soldier sentenced to be shot for desertion remarking as he did so well i think the boy can do us more good above ground than underground he also approved an application for the discharge on taking the oath of allegiance of a rebel prisoner in whose petition he wrote let it be done this act of mercy was his last official order just like seward the first corps of the army commanded by general reynolds was once reviewed by the president on a beautiful plain at the north of potomac creek about eight miles from hooker's headquarters the party rode thither in an ambulance over a rough corduroy road and as they passed over some of the more difficult portions of the jolting way the ambulance driver who sat well in front occasionally let fly a volley of suppressed oaths at his wild team of six mules finally mr lincoln leaning forward touched the man on the shoulder and said excuse me my friend are you an episcopalian the man greatly startled looked round and replied no mr president i am a methodist well said lincoln i thought you must be an episcopalian because you swear just like governor seward who is a church warder a cheerful prospect the first night after the departure of president-elect lincoln from springfield on his way to washington was spent in indianapolis 
governor yates o h browning jesse k dubois o m hatch josiah allen of indiana and others after taking leave of mr lincoln to return to their respective homes took ward layman into a room locked the door and proceeded in the most solemn and impressive manner to instruct him as to his duties as the special guardian of mr lincoln's person during the rest of his journey to washington layman tells the story as follows the lesson was concluded by uncle jesse as mr dubois was commonly called who said now layman we have regarded you as the tom hire of illinois with morrissey attachment we entrust the sacred life of mr lincoln to your keeping and if you don't protect it never return to illinois for we will murder you on sight thought god would have told him professor jonathan baldwin turner was one of the few men to whom mr lincoln confided his intention to issue the proclamation of emancipation mr lincoln told his illinois friend of the visit of a delegation to him who claimed to have a message from god that the war would not be successful without the freeing of the negroes to whom mr lincoln replied is it not a little strange that he should tell this to you who have so little to do with it and should not have told me who has a great deal to do with it at the same time he informed professor turner he had his proclamation in his pocket end of part twenty one part twenty two of lincoln's yarns and stories by alexander k mcclure this librivox recording is in the public domain part twenty two lincoln and a bible hero a writer who heard mr lincoln's famous speech delivered in new york after his nomination for president has left this record of the event when lincoln rose to speak i was greatly disappointed he was tall tall oh so tall and so angular and awkward that i had for an instant a feeling of pity for so ungainly a man he began in a low tone of voice as if he were used to speaking out of doors and was afraid of speaking too loud he said mr chairman instead of mr chairman and employed many other words with an old-fashioned pronunciation i said to myself old fellow you won't do it is all very well for the wild west but this will never go down in new york but pretty soon he began to get into the subject he straightened up made regular and graceful gestures his face lighted as with inward fire the whole man was transfigured i forgot the clothing his personal appearance and his individual peculiarities presently forgetting myself i was on my feet with the rest yelling like a wild indian cheering the wonderful man in the close parts of his argument you could hear the gentle sizzling of the gas burners when he reached a climax the thunders of applause were terrific it was a great speech when i came out of the hall my face was glowing with excitement and my frame all a quiver a friend with his eyes aglow asked me what i thought of abe lincoln the rail splitter i said he's the greatest man since st paul and i think so yet boy was cared for president lincoln one day noticed a small pale delicate looking boy about thirteen years old among the number in the white house antechamber the president saw him standing there looking so feeble and faint and said come here my boy and tell me what you want the boy advanced placed his hand on the arm of the president's chair and with a bowed head and timid accents said mr president i have been a drummer boy in a regiment for two years and my colonel got angry with me and turned me off i was taken sick and have been a long time in the hospital the president discovered that the boy had no home no father he had died in the army no mother i have no father no mother no brothers no sisters and bursting into tears no friends nobody cares for me lincoln's eyes filled with tears and the boy's heart was soon made glad by a request to certain officials to care for this poor boy the jury acquitted him 
one of the most noted murder cases in which lincoln defended the accused was tried in august eighteen fifty nine the victim crafton was a student in his own law office the defendant peachy harrison was a grandson of rev peter cartwright both were connected with the best families in the county they were brothers-in-law and had always been friends senator john m palmer and general john a mcclellan were on the side of the prosecution among those who represented the defendant were lincoln and senator shelby m Collum. the two young men had engaged in a political quarrel and crafton was stabbed to death by harrison the tragic pathos of a case which involved the deepest affections of almost an entire community reached its climax in the appearance in court of the venerable peter cartwright lincoln had beaten him for congress in eighteen forty six eccentric and aggressive as he was he was honored far and wide and when he arose to take the witness stand his white hair crowned with his cruel sorrow the most indifferent spectator felt that his examination would be unbearable it fell to lincoln to question cartwright with the rarest gentleness he began to put his question how long have you known the prisoner cartwright's head dropped on his breast for a moment then straightening himself he passed his hand across his eyes and answered in a deep quavering voice i have known him since a babe he laughed and cried on my knee the examination ended by lincoln drawing from the witness the story of how crafton had said to him just before his death i am dying i will soon part with all i love on earth and i want you to say to my slayer that i forgive him i want to leave this earth with a forgiveness of all who have in any way injured me this examination made a profound impression on the jury lincoln closed his argument by picturing the scene anew appealing to the jury to practice the same forgiving spirit that the murdered man had shown on his deathbed it was undoubtedly to his handling of the grandfather's evidence that harrison's acquittal was due took nothing but money during the war congress appropriated ten thousand dollars to be expended by the president in defending united states marshals in cases of arrests and seizures where the legality of their actions was tested in the courts previously the marshals sought the assistance of the attorney general in defending them but when they found that the president had a fund for that purpose they sought to control the money in speaking of these marshals one day mr lincoln said they are like a man in illinois whose cabin was burned down and according to the kindly custom of early days in the west his neighbors all contributed something to start him again in his case they had been so liberal that he soon found himself better off than before the fire and he got proud one day a neighbor brought him a bag of oats but the fellow refused it with scorn no said he i'm not taking oats now i take nothing but money naughty boy had to take his medicine the resistance to the military draft of eighteen sixty three by the city of new york the result of which was the killing of several thousand persons was illustrated on august twenty ninth eighteen sixty three by frank leslie's illustrated newspaper over the title of the naughty boy gotham who would not take the draft beneath was also the text mammy lincoln there now you bad boy acting that way when your little sister pen state of pennsylvania takes hers like a lady horatio seymour was then governor of new york and a prominent the war is a failure advocate he was in albany the state capital when the riots broke out in the city of new york july thirteenth and after the mob had burned the colored orphan asylum and killed several hundred negroes came to the city he had only soft words for the rioters promising them that the draft should be suspended then the government sent several regiments of veterans fresh from the field of gettysburg where they had assisted in defeating lee these troops made short work of the brutal ruffians shooting down three thousand or so of them and the rioting was subdued the naughty boy gotham had to take his medicine after all 
but as the spirit of opposition to the war was still rampant the president issued a proclamation suspending the writ of habeas corpus in all the states of the union where the government had control this had a quieting effect upon those who were doing what they could in obstructing the government would blow them to h mr lincoln had advised lieutenant general winfield scott commanding the united states army of the threats of violence on inauguration day eighteen sixty one general scott was sick in bed at washington when adjutant general thomas mather of illinois called upon him in president-elect lincoln's behalf and the veteran commander was much wrought up said he to general mather present my compliments to mr lincoln when you return to springfield and tell him i expect him to come on to washington as soon as he is ready say to him that i will look after those maryland and virginia rangers myself i will plant cannon at both ends of pennsylvania avenue and if any of them show their heads or raise a finger i'll blow them to h yankee goodness of heart one day when the president was with the troops who were fighting at the front the wounded both union and confederate began to pour in as one stretcher was passing lincoln he heard the voice of a lad calling to his mother in agonizing tones his great heart filled he forgot the crisis of the hour stopping the carriers he knelt and bending over him asked what can i do for you my poor child oh you will do nothing for me he replied you are a yankee i cannot hope that my message to my mother will ever reach her lincoln in tears his voice full of tenderest love convinced the boy of his sincerity and he gave his good-bye words without reserve the president directed them copied and ordered that they be sent that night with a flag of truce into the enemy's lines walked as he talked when mr lincoln made his famous humorous speech in congress ridiculing general cass he began to speak from notes but as he warmed up he left his desk and his notes to stride down the alley toward the speaker's chair occasionally as he would complete a sentence amid shouts of laughter he would return up the alley to his desk consult his notes take a sip of water and start off again mr lincoln received many congratulations at the close democrats joining the whigs in their complimentary comments one democrat however who had been nicknamed sausage sawyer didn't enthuse at all sawyer asked an eastern representative how did you like the lanky illinoisan speech very able wasn't it well replied sawyer the speech was pretty good but i hope he won't charge mileage on his travels while delivering it the song did the business the virginia illinois inquirer of march one eighteen seventy nine tells this story john mcnamer was buried last sunday near petersburg meanard county a long while ago he was assessor and treasurer of the county for several successive terms mr mcnamer was an early settler in that section and before the town of petersburg was laid out in business in old salem a village that existed many years ago two miles south of the present site of petersburg abe lincoln was then postmaster of the place and sold whiskey to its inhabitants there are old-timers yet living in meanard who bought many a jug of corn juice from old abe when he lived at salem it was here that ann rutledge dwelt and in whose grave lincoln wrote that his heart was buried as the story runs the fair and gentle ann was originally john mcnamer's sweetheart but abe took a shine to the young lady and succeeded in heading off mcnamer and won her affections but ann rutledge died and lincoln went to springfield where he some time afterwards married it is related that during the war a lady belonging to a prominent kentucky family visited washington to beg for her son's pardon who was then in prison under sentence of death for belonging to a band of guerrillas who had committed many murders and outrages with the mother was her daughter a beautiful young lady who was an accomplished musician mr lincoln received the visitors in his usual kind manner and the mother made known the object of her visit accompanying her plea with tears and sobs and all the customary romantic incidents 
there were probably extenuating circumstances in favor of the young rebel prisoner and while the president seemed to be deeply pondering the young lady moved to a piano nearby and taking a seat commenced to sing gentle annie a very sweet and pathetic ballad which before the war was a familiar song in almost every household in the union and is not yet entirely forgotten for that matter it is to be presumed that the young lady sang the song with more plaintiveness and effect than old abe had ever heard it in springfield during its rendition he arose from his seat crossed the room to a window in the westward through which he gazed for several minutes with a sad far-away look which has so often been noted as one of his peculiarities his memory no doubt went back to the days of his humble life on the sagamon and with visions of old salem and its rustic people who once gathered in his primitive store came a picture of the gentle annie of his youth whose ashes had rested for many long years under the wild flowers and brambles of the old rural burying ground but whose spirit then perhaps guided him to the side of mercy be that as it may president lincoln drew a large red silk handkerchief from his coat pocket with which he wiped his face vigorously then he turned advanced quickly to his desk wrote a brief note which he handed to the lady and informed her that it was the pardon she sought the scene was no doubt touching in a great degree and proves that a nice song well sung has often a powerful influence in recalling tender recollections it proves also that abraham lincoln was a man of fine feelings and that if the occurrence was a put-up job on the lady's part it accomplished the purpose all the same a free-for-all lincoln made a political speech at papsville illinois when a candidate for the legislature the first time a free-for-all fight began soon after the opening of the meeting and lincoln noticing one of his friends about to succumb to the energetic attack of an infuriated ruffian edged his way through the crowd and seizing the bully by the neck and the seat of his trousers threw him by means of his strength and long arms as one witness stoutly insists twelve feet away returning to the stand and throwing aside his hat he inaugurated his campaign with the following brief but pertinent declaration fellow citizens i presume you all know who i am i am humble abraham lincoln i have been solicited by many friends to become a candidate for the legislature my politics are short and sweet like the old woman's dance and i am in favor of the national bank i am in favor of the internal improvement system and a high protective tariff these are my sentiments if elected i shall be thankful if not it will be all the same three infernal bores one day when president lincoln was alone and busily engaged on an important subject involving vexation and anxiety he was disturbed by the unwarranted intrusion of three men who without apology proceeded to lay their claim before him the spokesman of the three reminded the president that they were the owners of some torpedo or other warlike invention which if the government would only adopt would soon crush the rebellion now said the spokesman we have been here to see you time and again you have referred us to the secretary of war the chief of ordnance and the general of the army and they give us no satisfaction we have been kept here waiting till money and patience are exhausted and we now come to demand of you a final reply to our application mr lincoln listened to this insolent tirade and at its close the old twinkle came into his eye you three gentlemen remind me of a story i once heard said he of a poor little boy out west who had lost his mother his father wanted to give him a religious education and so placed him in the family of a clergyman whom he directed to instruct the little fellow carefully in the scriptures every day the boy had to commit to memory and recite one chapter of the bible things proceeded smoothly until they reached that chapter which details the story of the trial of shadrach meshach and abednego in the fiery furnace when asked to repeat these three names the boy said he had forgotten them his teacher told him that he must learn them 
and gave him another day to do so the next day the boy again forgot them now said the teacher you have again failed to remember those names and you can go no farther until you have learned them i will give you another day on this lesson and if you don't repeat the names i will punish you a third time the boy came to recite and got down to the stumbling block when the clergyman said now tell me the names of the men in the fiery furnace oh said the boy here comes those three infernal boars i wish the devil had them having received their final answer the three patriots retired and at the cabinet meeting which followed the president in high good humor related how he had dismissed his unwelcome visitors lincoln's men were hustlers in the chicago convention of eighteen sixty the fight for seward was maintained with desperate resolve until the final ballot was taken thurlow weed was the seward leader and he was simply incomparable as a master in handling a convention with him were governor morgan henry j raymond of the new york times with william m everts as chairman of the new york delegation whose speech nominating seward was the most impressive utterance of his life the bates men bates was afterwards lincoln's attorney general were led by frank blair the only republican congressman from a slave state who was nothing if not heroic aided by his brother montgomery afterwards lincoln's postmaster general who was a politician of uncommon cunning with him was horace greeley who was chairman of the delegation from the then almost inaccessible state of oregon it was lincoln's friends however who were the hustlers of that battle they had men for sober counsel like david davis men of supreme sagacity like leonard sweat men of tireless effort like norman b judd and they had what was more important than all a seething multitude wild with enthusiasm for old abe a slow horse on one occasion when mr lincoln was going to attend a political convention one of his rivals a liveryman provided him with a slow horse hoping that he would not reach his destination in time mr lincoln got there however and when he returned with the horse he said you keep this horse for funerals don't you oh no replied the liveryman well i'm glad of that for if you did you'd never get a corpse to the grave in time for the resurrection dodging browsing presidents general mcclellan after being put in command of the army resented any interference by the president lincoln in his anxiety to know the details of the work in the army went frequently to mcclellan's headquarters that the president had a serious purpose in these visits mcclellan did not see i enclose a card just received from a lincoln he wrote to his wife one day it shows too much deference to be seen outside in another letter to mrs mcclellan he spoke of being interrupted by the president and secretary seward who had nothing in particular to say and again of concealing himself to dodge all enemies in shape of browsing presidents etc i am becoming daily more disgusted with this administration perfectly sick of it he wrote early in october and a few days later i was obliged to attend a meeting of the cabinet at eight p m and was bored and annoyed there are some of the greatest geese in the cabinet i have ever seen enough to tax the patience of job a greenback legend at a cabinet meeting once the advisability of putting a legend on greenbacks similar to the in god we trust legend on the silver coins was discussed and the president was asked what his view was he replied if you are going to put a legend on the greenback i would suggest that of peter and paul silver and gold we have not but what we have will give you god's best gift to man in one of mr lincoln's notable religious utterances was his reply to a deputation of colored people at baltimore who presented him a bible he said in regard to the great book i have only to say it is the best gift which god has ever given man all the good from the savior of the world is communicated to us through this book but for this book we could not know right from wrong all those things desirable to man 
are contained in it scalping in the black hawk war when lincoln was president he told this story of the black hawk war the only time he ever saw blood in this campaign was one morning when marching up a little valley that makes into the rock river bottom to reinforce a squad of outposts that were thought to be in danger they came upon the tent occupied by the other party just at sunrise the men had neglected to place any guard at night and had been slaughtered in their sleep as the reinforcing party came up the slope on which the camp had been made lincoln saw them all lying with their heads towards the rising sun and the round red spot that marked where they had been scalped gleamed more redly yet in the ruddy light of the sun this scene years afterwards he recalled with a shudder matrimonial advice for a while during the civil war general fremont was without a command one day in discussing fremont's case with george w julian president lincoln said he did not know where to place him and that it reminds him of the old man who advised his son to take a wife to which the young man responded all right whose wife shall i take owed lots of money on april fourteenth eighteen sixty five a few hours previous to his assassination president lincoln sent a message by congressman schuyler colfax vice president during general grant's first term to the miners in the rocky mountains and the regions bounded by the pacific ocean in which he said now that the rebellion is overthrown and we know pretty nearly the amount of our national debt the more gold and silver we mine we make the payment of that debt so much easier now i am going to encourage that in every possible way we shall have hundreds of thousands of disbanded soldiers and many have feared that their return home in such great numbers might paralyze industry by furnishing suddenly a greater supply of labor than there will be demand for i am going to try to attract them to the hidden wealth of our mountain ranges where there is room enough for all immigration which even the war has not stopped will land upon our shores hundreds of thousands more per year from overcrowded europe i intend to point them to the gold and silver that await for them in the west tell the miners for me that i shall promote their interest to the utmost of my ability because their prosperity as the prosperity of the nation and said he his eye kindling with enthusiasm we shall prove in a very few years that we are indeed the treasury of the world on the lord's side president lincoln made a significant remark to a clergyman in the early days of the war let us have faith mr president said the minister that the lord is on our side in this great struggle mr lincoln quietly answered i am not at all concerned about that for i know that the lord is always on the side of the right but it is my constant anxiety and prayer that i and this nation may be on the lord's side End of part 22part 23 of lincoln's yarns and stories by alexander k mcclure this librivox recording is in the public domain part 23 wanted to be near abe it was lincoln's custom to hold an informal reception once a week each caller taking his turn upon one of these eventful days an old friend from illinois stood in line for almost an hour at last he was so near the president his voice could reach him and calling out to his old associate he startled everyone by exclaiming hello abe how are you i'm in line and have come for an orifice too lincoln singled out the man with the stentorian voice and recognizing a particularly old friend one whose wife had befriended him at a peculiarly trying time the president responded to his greeting in a cordial manner and told him to hang on to himself and not kick the traces keep in line and you'll soon get here they met and shook hands with the old fervor and renewed their friendship the informal reception over lincoln sent for his old friend and the latter began to urge his claims 
after having given him some good advice lincoln kindly told him he was incapable of holding any such position as he asked for the disappointment of the illinois friend was plainly shown and with a perceptible tremor in his voice he said martha's dead the gal is married and i've gubbed jim the forty then looking at lincoln he came a little nearer and almost whispered i knowed i wasn't edicated enough to get the place but i kind of want to stay where i can see abe lincoln he was given employment in the white house grounds afterwards the president said these brief interviews stripped of even the semblance of ceremony give me a better insight into the real character of the person and his true reason for seeking one got his foot in it william h seward idol of the republicans of the east six months after lincoln had made his divided house speech delivered an address at rochester new york containing this famous sentence it is an irrepressible conflict between opposing and enduring forces and it means that the united states must and will sooner or later become either entirely a slaveholding nation or entirely a free labor nation seward who had simply followed in lincoln's steps was defeated for the presidential nomination at the republican national convention of eighteen sixty because he was too radical and lincoln who was still radicaler was named saved by a letter the chief interest of the illinois campaign of eighteen forty three lay in the race for congress in the capital district which was between hardin fiery eloquent and impetuous democrat and lincoln plain practical and ennobled whig the world knows the result lincoln was elected it is not so much his election as the manner in which he secured his nomination with which we have to deal before that ever memorable spring lincoln vacillated between the courts of springfield rated as a plain honest logical whig with no ambition higher politically than to occupy some good home office late in the fall of eighteen forty two his name began to be mentioned in connection with congressional aspirations which fact greatly annoyed the leaders of his political party who had already selected as the Whig candidate E. D. Baker, afterward the gallant colonel who fell so bravely and died such an honorable death on the battlefield of Ball's Bluff. Despite all efforts of his opponents within his party, the name of the gaunt rail splitter was hailed with acclaim by the masses, to whom he had endured himself by his witticisms, honest tongue, and quaint philosophy when on the stump or mingling with them in their homes the convention which met in early spring in the city of springfield was to be composed of the usual number of delegates the contest for the nomination was spirited and exciting a few weeks before the meeting of the convention the fact was found by the leaders that the advantage lay with lincoln and that unless they pulled some very fine wires nothing could save baker they attempted to play the game that was so often won by convincing delegates under instructions for lincoln to violate them and vote for baker they had apparently succeeded the best laid plans of mice and men gang off a glay so it was in this case two days before the convention lincoln received an intimation of this and late at night wrote the following letter the letter was addressed to martin morris who resided at petersburg an intimate friend of his and by him circulated among those who were instructed for him at the county convention it had the desired effect the convention met the scheme of the conspirators miscarried lincoln was nominated and made a vigorous canvass and was triumphantly elected thus paving the way for his more extended and brilliant conquests this letter lincoln had often told his friends gave him ultimately the chief magistracy of the nation he has also said that had he been beaten before the convention he would have been forever obscured the following is a verbatim copy of the epistle april fourteenth eighteen forty three friend morris 
i have heard it intimated that baker is trying to get you or miles or both of you to violate the instructions of the meeting that appointed you and to go for him i have insisted and still insist that this cannot be true sure baker would not do the like as well might harden ask me to vote for him in the convention again it is said there will be an attempt to get instructions in your county requiring you to go for baker this is all wrong upon the same rule why might i not fly from the decision against me at sagamon and get up instructions to their delegates to go for me there are at least twelve hundred whigs in the county that took no part and yet i would as soon stick my head in the fire as attempt it besides if any one should get the nomination by such extraordinary means all harmony in the district would inevitably be lost honest whigs and very nearly all of them are honest would not quietly abide such enormities i repeat such an attempt on baker's part cannot be true write me at springfield how the matter is don't show or speak of this letter a lincoln mr morris did show the letter and mr lincoln always thanked his stars that he did his favorite poem mr lincoln's favorite poem was oh why should the spirit of mortal be proud written by william knox a scotchman although mr lincoln never knew the author's name he once said to a friend this poem has been a great favorite with me for years it was first shown to me when a young man by a friend i afterwards saw it and cut it from a newspaper and learned it by heart i would give a great deal to know who wrote it but i have never been able to ascertain oh why should the spirit of mortal be proud like a swift fleeing meteor a fast flying cloud a flash of the lightning a break of the wave he passeth from life to his rest in the grave the leaves of the oak and the willow shall fade be scattered around and together be laid and the young and the old and the low and the high shall moulder to dust and together shall lie the infant a mother attended and loved the mother that infant's affection who proved the husband that mother and infant who blessed each all are away to their dwellings of rest the maid on whose cheek on whose brow in whose eye shone beauty and pleasure her triumphs are by and the memory of those who loved her and praised are alike from the minds of the living erased the hand of the king that the sceptre hath borne the brow of the priest that the mitre hath worn the eye of the sage and the heart of the brave are hidden and lost in the depths of the grave the peasant whose lot was to sow and to reap the herdsman who climbed with his goats up the steep the beggar who wandered in search of his bread have faded away like the grass that we tread the saint who enjoyed the communion of heaven the sinner who dared to remain unforgiven the wise and the foolish the guilty and just have quietly mingled their bones in the dust so the multitude goes like the flower or the weed that withers away to let others succeed so the multitude comes even those we behold to repeat every tale that has often been told for we are the same our fathers have been we see the same sights our fathers have seen we drink the same stream we view the same sun and run the same course our fathers have run the thoughts we are thinking our fathers would think from the death we are shrinking our fathers would shrink to the life we are clinging they also would cling but it speeds from us all like a bird on the wing they loved but the story we cannot unfold they scorned but the heart of the haughty is cold they grieved but no wail from their slumber will come they joyed but the tongue of their gladness is dumb they died ay they died and we things that are now that walk on the turf that lies o'er their brow and make in their dwellings a transient abode meet the things that they met on their pilgrimage road yea hope and despondency pleasure and pain are mingled together in sunshine and rain and the smile and the tear the song and the dirge 
still follow each other like surge upon surge tis the wink of an eye tis the draught of a breath from the blossom of health to the paleness of death from the gilded saloon to the bier and the shroud oh why should the spirit of mortal be proud five-legged calf president lincoln had great doubt as to his right to emancipate the slaves under the war power in discussing the question he used to like the case to that of the boy who when asked how many legs his calf would have if he called its tail a leg replied five to which the prompt response was made that calling the tail a leg would not make it a leg a stagecoach story the following is told by thomas h nelson of terre haute indiana who was appointed minister to chile by lincoln judge abram hammond afterwards governor of indiana and myself arranged to go from terre haute to indianapolis in a stagecoach as we stepped in we discovered that the entire back seat was occupied by a long lank individual whose head seemed to protrude from one end of the coach and his feet from the other he was the sole occupant and was sleeping soundly hammond slapped him familiarly on the shoulder and asked him if he had chartered the coach that day certainly not and he at once took the front seat politely giving us the place of honor and comfort an odd-looking fellow he was with a twenty-five cent hat without vest or cravat regarding him as a good subject for merriment we perpetrated several jokes he took them all with utmost innocence and good nature and joined in the laugh although at his own expense after an astounding display of wordy pyrotechnics the dazed and bewildered stranger asked what will be the upshot of this comet business late in the evening we reached indianapolis and hurried to browning's hotel losing sight of the stranger altogether we retired to our room to brush our clothes in a few minutes i descended to the portico and there descried our long gloomy fellow-traveller in the centre of an admiring group of lawyers among whom were judges mclean and huntington albert s white and richard w thompson who seemed to be amused and interested in the story he was telling i inquired of browning the landlord who he was abraham lincoln of illinois a member of congress was his response i was thunderstruck at the announcement i hastened upstairs and told hammond the startling news and together we emerged from the hotel by a back door and went down an alley to another house thus avoiding further contact with our distinguished fellow-traveller years afterward when the president-elect was on his way to washington i was in the same hotel looking over the distinguished party when a long arm reached to my shoulder and a shrill voice exclaimed hello nelson do you think after all the whole world is going to follow the darn thing off the words were my own in answer to his question in the stagecoach the speaker was abraham lincoln the four hundred gathered there lincoln had periods while clerking in the new salem grocery store during which there was nothing for him to do and was therefore in circumstances that made laziness almost inevitable had people come to him for goods they would have found him willing to sell them he sold all that he could doubtless the store soon became the social centre of the village if the people did not care or were unable to buy goods they liked to go where they could talk with their neighbors and listen to stories these lincoln gave them in abundance and of a rare sort it was in these gatherings of the four hundred at the village store that lincoln got his training as a debater public questions were discussed there daily and nightly and lincoln always took a prominent part in the discussions many of the debaters came to consider abe lincoln as about the smartest man in the village only level-headed men wanted lincoln wanted men of level heads for important commands not infrequently he gave his general advice he appreciated hooker's bravery dash and activity but was fearful of the results of what he denominated swashing around this was one of his telegrams to hooker 
and now beware of rashness beware of rashness but with energy and sleepless vigilance go forward and give us victories his faith in the monitor when the confederate ironclad merrimac was sent against the union vessels in hampton roads president lincoln expressed his belief in the monitor to captain fox the adviser of captain ericsson who constructed the monitor we have three of the most effective vessels in hampton roads and any number of small craft that will hang on the stern of the merrimac like small dogs on the haunches of a bear they may not be able to tear her down but they will interfere with the comfort of her voyage her trial trip will not be a pleasure trip i am certain we have had a big share of bad luck lately but i do not believe the future has any such misfortunes in store for us as you anticipate said captain fox if the merrimac does not sink our ships who is to prevent her from dropping her anchor in the potomac where that steamer lies pointing to a steamer at anchor below the long bridge and throwing her hundred pound shells into this room or battering down the walls of the capitol the almighty captain answered the president excitedly but without the least affectation i expect setbacks defeats we have had them and shall have them they are common to all wars but i have not the slightest fear of any result which shall fatally impair our military and naval strength or give other powers any right to interfere in our quarrel the destruction of the capital would do both i do not fear it for this is god's fight and he will win it in his own good time he will take care that our enemies will not push us too far speaking of ironclads said the president you do not seem to take the little monitor into account i believe in the monitor and her commander if captain warden does not give a good account of the monitor and of himself i shall have made a mistake in following my judgment for the first time since i have been here captain i have not made a mistake in following my clear judgment of men since this war began i followed that judgment when i gave warden the command of the monitor i would make the appointment over again to-day the monitor should be in hampton roads now she left new york eight days ago after the captain had again presented what he considered the possibilities of failure the president replied oh no no captain i respect your judgment as you have reason to know but this time you are all wrong the monitor was one of my inspirations i believed in her firmly when that energetic contractor first showed me ericsson's plans captain ericsson's plain but rather enthusiastic demonstration made my conversion permanent it was called a floating battery then i called it a raft i caught some of the inventor's enthusiasm and it has been growing upon me i thought then and i am confident now it is just what we want i am sure that the monitor is still afloat and that she will yet give a good account of herself sometimes i think she may be the veritable sling with a stone that will yet smite the merrimac philistine in the forehead soon was the president's judgment verified for the fight of the monitor and merrimac changed all the conditions of naval warfare after the victory was gained the presiding captain fox and others went on board the monitor and captain warden was requested by the president to narrate the history of the encounter captain warden did so in a modest manner and apologized for not being able better to provide for his guests the president smilingly responded some charitable people say that old bourbon is an indispensable element in the fighting qualities of some of our generals in the field but captain after the account that we have heard to-day no one will say that any dutch courage is needed on board the monitor it never has been sir modestly observed the captain captain fox then gave a description of what he saw of the engagement and described it as indescribably grand then turning to the president he continued 
now standing here on the deck of this battle-scarred vessel the first genuine ironclad the victor in the first fight of ironclads let me make a confession and perform an act of simple justice i never fully believed in armored vessels until i saw this battle i know all the facts which united to give us the monitor i withhold no credit from captain ericsson her inventor but i know that the country is principally indebted for the construction of the vessel to president lincoln and for the success of her trial to captain warden her commander her only imperfection at one time a certain major hill charged lincoln with making defamatory remarks regarding mrs hill hill was insulting in his language to lincoln who never lost his temper when he saw his chance to edge a word in lincoln denied emphatically using the language or anything like that attributed to him he entertained he insisted a high regard for mrs hill and the only thing he knew to her discredit was the fact that she was major hill's wife the old lady's prophecy among those who called to congratulate mr lincoln upon his nomination for president was an old lady very plainly dressed she knew mr lincoln but mr lincoln did not at first recognize her then she undertook to recall to his memory certain incidents connected with his ride upon the circuit especially his dining at her house upon the road at different times then he remembered her and her home having fixed her own place in his recollection she tried to recall to him a certain scanty dinner of bread and milk that he once ate at her house he could not remember it on the contrary he only remembered that he had always fared well at her house well she said one day you came along after we had got through dinner and we had eaten up everything and i could give you nothing but a bowl of bread and milk and you ate it and when you got up you said it was good enough for the president of the united states the good woman had come in from the country making a journey of eight or ten miles to relate to mr lincoln this incident which in her mind had doubtless taken the form of a prophecy mr lincoln placed the honest creature at her ease chatted with her of old times and dismissed her in the most happy frame of mind how the town of lincoln illinois was named the story of naming the town of lincoln the county seat of logan county illinois is thus given on good authority the first railroad had been built through the county and a station was about to be located there lincoln virgil hitchcock colonel r b latham and several others were sitting on a pile of ties and talking about moving a county seat from mount pulaski mr lincoln rose and started to walk away when colonel latham said lincoln if you will help us to get the county seat here we will call the place lincoln all right latham he replied colonel latham then deeded him a lot on the west side of the courthouse and he owned it at the time he was elected president old jeff's big nightmare jeff davis had a large and threatening nightmare in november eighteen sixty four and what he saw in his troubled dreams was the long and lanky figure of abraham lincoln who had just been endorsed by the people of the united states for another term in the white house at washington the cartoon reproduced here is from the issue of frank leslie's illustrated newspaper of december third eighteen sixty four it being entitled jeff davis's november nightmare davis had been told that mcclellan the war is a failure candidate for the presidency would have no difficulty whatever in defeating lincoln that negotiations with the confederate officials for the cessation of hostilities would be entered into as soon as mcclellan was seated in the chief executive's chair that the confederacy would in all probability be recognized as an independent government by the washington administration that the sacred institution of slavery would continue to do business at the old stand that the confederacy would be one of the great nations of the world and have all the state rights and other things it wanted with absolutely no interference whatever upon the part of the north therefore lincoln's re-election was a rough rude shock to davis 
who had not prepared himself for such an event six months from the date of that nightmare dream he was a prisoner in the hands of the union forces and the confederacy was a thing of the past lincoln's last official act probably the last official act of president lincoln's life was the signing of the commission reappointing alvin saunders governor of nebraska i saw mr lincoln regarding the matter said governor saunders and he told me to go home that he would attend to it all right i left washington on the morning of the fourteenth and while en route the news of the assassination on the evening of the same day reached me i immediately wired back to find out what had become of my commission and was told that the room had not been opened when it was opened the document was found lying on the desk mr lincoln signed it just before leaving for the theatre that fatal evening and left it lying there unfolded a note was found below the document as follows rather a lengthy commission bestowing upon mr alvin saunders the official authority of governor of the territory of nebraska then came lincoln's signature which with one exception that of a penciled message on the back of a card sent up by a friend as mr lincoln was dressing for the theatre was the very last signature of the martyred president the lad needed the sleep a personal friend of president lincoln is authority for this i called on him one day in the early part of the war he had just written a pardon for a young man who had been sentenced to be shot for sleeping at his post he remarked as he read it to me i could not think of going into eternity with the blood of the poor young man on my skirts and then he added it is not to be wondered at that a boy raised on a farm probably in the habit of going to bed at dark should when required to watch fall asleep and i cannot consent to shoot him for such an act massa lincoln a like de lord by the act of emancipation president lincoln built for himself forever the first place in the affections of the african race in this country the love and reverence manifested for him by many of these people has on some occasions almost reached adoration one day colonel mckay of new york who had been one of a committee to investigate the condition of the freedmen upon his return from hilton head and beaufort called upon the president and in the course of the interview said that up to the time of the arrival among them in the south of the union forces they had no knowledge of any other power their masters fled upon the approach of our soldiers and this gave the slaves the conception of a power greater than their masters exercised this power they called massa lincum colonel mckay said their place of worship was a large building they called the praise house and the leader of the meeting a venerable black man was known as the praise man on a certain day when there was quite a large gathering of the people considerable confusion was created by different persons attempting to tell who and what massa lincum was in the midst of the excitement the white-headed leader commanded silence brethren said he you don't know nothing what you're talking about now you just listen to me massa lincoln he everywhere he know everything then solemnly looking up he added he walked the earth like the lord how lincoln took the news one of lincoln's most dearly loved friends united states senator edward d baker of oregon colonel of the seventy first pennsylvania a former townsman of mr lincoln was killed at the battle of ball's bluff in october eighteen sixty one the president went to general mcclellan's headquarters to hear the news and a friend thus described the effect it had upon him we could hear the click of the telegraph in the adjoining room and low conversation between the president and general mcclellan succeeded by silence excepting the click click of the instrument which went on with its tale of disaster five minutes passed and then mr lincoln unattended with bowed head and tears rolling down his furrowed cheeks his face pale and wan his breast heaving with emotion passed through the room he almost fell as he stepped into the street 
we sprang involuntarily from our seats to render assistance but he did not fall with both hands pressed upon his heart he walked down the street not returning the salute of the sentinel pacing his beat before the door end of part twenty three part twenty four of lincoln's yarns and stories by alexander k mcclure this librivox recording is in the public domain part twenty four profanity as a safety valve lincoln never indulged in profanity but confessed that when lee was beaten at malvern hill after seven days of fighting and richmond but twelve miles away was at mcclellan's mercy he felt very much like swearing when he learned that the union general had retired to harrison's landing lee was so confident his opponent would not go to richmond that he took his army into maryland a move he would not have made had an energetic fighting man been in mcclellan's place it is true mcclellan followed and defeated lee in the bloodiest battle of the war antietam afterwards following him into virginia but lincoln could not bring himself to forgive the general's inaction before richmond why we won at gettysburg president lincoln said to general sickles just after the victory of gettysburg the fact is general in the stress and pinch of the campaign there i went to my room and got down on my knees and prayed god almighty for victory at gettysburg i told him that this was his country and the war was his war but that we really couldn't stand another fredericksburg or chancellorsville and then and there i made a solemn vow with my maker that if he would stand by you boys at gettysburg i would stand by him and he did and i will and after this i felt that god almighty had taken the whole thing into his hands had to wait for him president lincoln having arranged to go to new york was late for his train much to the disgust of those who were to accompany him and all were compelled to wait several hours until the next train steamed out of the station president lincoln was much amused at the dissatisfaction displayed and then ventured the remark that the situation reminded him of a little story said he out in illinois a convict who had murdered his cellmate was sentenced to be hanged on the day set for the execution crowds lined the roads leading to the spot where the scaffold had been erected and there was much jostling and excitement the condemned man took matters coolly and as one batch of perspiring anxious men rushed past the cart in which he was riding he called out don't be in a hurry boys you've got plenty of time there won't be any fun until i get there that's the condition of things now concluded the president there won't be any fun at new york until i get there president and cabinet joined in prayer on the day of the news of general lee's surrender at appomattox courthouse was received so an intimate friend of president lincoln relates the cabinet meeting was held an hour earlier than usual neither the president nor any member of the cabinet was able for a time to give utterance to his feelings at the suggestion of mr lincoln all dropped on their knees and offered in silence and in tears their humble and heartfelt acknowledgments to the almighty for the triumph he had granted to the national cause believed he was a christian mr lincoln was much impressed with the devotion and earnestness of purpose manifested by a certain lady of the christian commission during the war and on one occasion after she had discharged the object of her visit said to her madam i have formed a high opinion of your christian character and now as we are alone i have a mind to ask you to give me in brief your idea of what constitutes a true religious experience the lady replied at some length stating that in her judgment it consisted of a conviction of one's own sinfulness and weakness and a personal need of the saviour for strength and support that views of mere doctrine might and would differ 
but when one was really brought to feel his need of divine help and to seek the aid of the holy spirit for strength and guidance it was satisfactory evidence of his having been born again this was the substance of her reply when she had concluded mr lincoln was very thoughtful for a few moments he at length said very earnestly if what you have told me is really a correct view of this great subject i think i can say with sincerity that i hope i am a christian i had lived he continued until my boy willie died without fully realizing these things that blow overwhelmed me it showed me my weakness as i had never felt it before and if i can take what you have stated as a test i think i can safely say that i know something of that change of which you speak and i will further add that it has been my intention for some time at a suitable opportunity to make a public religious profession with the help of god mr lincoln once remarked to mr noah brooks one of his most intimate personal friends i should be the most presumptuous blockhead upon this footstool if i for one day thought that i could discharge the duties which have come upon me since i came to this place without the aid and enlightenment of one who is stronger and wiser than all others he said on another occasion i am very sure that if i do not go away from here a wiser man i shall go away a better man from having learned here what a very poor sort of a man i am turned tears to smiles one night schuyler colfax left all other business to go to the white house to ask the president to respite the son of a constituent who was sentenced to be shot at davenport for desertion mr lincoln heard the story with his usual patience though he was wearied out with incessant calls and anxious for rest and then replied some of our generals complain that i impair discipline and subordination in the army by my pardons and respites but it makes me rested after a hard day's work if i can find some good excuse for saving a man's life and i go to bed happy as i think how joyous the signing of my name will make him and his family and his friends and with a happy smile beaming over that care furrowed face he signed that name that saved that life lincoln's last written words as the president and mrs lincoln were leaving the white house a few minutes before eight o'clock on the evening of april fourteenth eighteen sixty five lincoln wrote this note allow mr ashman and friend to come to see me at nine o'clock a m tomorrow april fifteenth eighteen sixty five women plead for pardons one day during the war an attractively and handsomely dressed woman called on president lincoln to procure the release from prison of a relation in whom she professed the deepest interest she was a good talker and her winning ways seemed to make a deep impression on the president after listening to her story he wrote a few words on a card this woman dear stanton is a little smarter than she looks to be enclosed it in an envelope and directed her to take it to the secretary of war on the same day another woman called more humble in appearance more plainly clad it was the old story father and son both in the army the former in prison could not the latter be discharged from the army and sent home to help his mother a few strokes of the pen a gentle nod of the head and the little woman her eyes filling with tears and expressing a grateful acknowledgment her tongue could not utter passed out a lady so thankful for the release of her husband was in the act of kneeling in thankfulness get up he said don't kneel to me but thank god and go an old lady for the same reason came forward with tears in her eyes to express her gratitude Goodbye, mr lincoln said she i shall probably never see you again till we meet in heaven she had the president's hand in hers and he was deeply moved he instantly took her right hand in both of his and following her to the door said i am afraid with all my troubles i shall never get to the resting place you speak of but if i do i am sure i shall find you that you wish me to get there is i believe the best wish you could make for me good-bye 
then the president remarked to a friend it is more than many can often say that in doing right one has made two people happy in one day speed die when i may i want it said of me by those who know me best that i have always plucked a thistle and planted a flower when i thought a flower would grow lincoln wished to see richmond the president remarked to admiral david d porter while on board the flagship malvern on the james river in front of richmond the day the city surrendered thank god that i have lived to see this it seems to me that i have been dreaming a horrid dream for four years and now the nightmare is gone i wish to see richmond spoken like a christian frederick douglass told in these words of his first interview with president lincoln i approached him with trepidation as to how this great man might receive me but one word and look from him banished all my fears and set me perfectly at ease i have often said since that meeting that it was much easier to see and converse with a great man than it was with a small man on that occasion he said douglas you need not tell me who you are mr seward has told me all about you i then saw that there was no reason to tell him my personal story however interesting it might be to myself or others so i told him at once the object of my visit it was to get some expression from him upon three points one equal pay to colored soldiers two their promotion when they had earned it on the battlefield three should they be taken prisoners and enslaved or hanged as jefferson davis had threatened an equal number of confederate prisoners should be executed within our lines a declaration to that effect i thought would prevent the execution of the rebel threat to all but the last president lincoln assented he argued however that neither equal pay nor promotion could be granted at once he said that in view of existing prejudices it was a great step forward to employ colored troops at all that it was necessary to avoid everything that would offend this prejudice and increase opposition to the measure he detailed the steps by which white soldiers were reconciled to the employment of colored soldiers how these were first employed as laborers how it was thought they should not be armed or uniformed like white soldiers how they should only be made to wear a peculiar uniform how they should be employed to hold forts and arsenals in sickly locations and not enter the field like other soldiers with all these restrictions and limitations he easily made me see that much would be gained when the colored man loomed before the country as a full-fledged united states soldier to fight flourish or fall in defense of the united republic the great soul of lincoln halted only when he came to the point of retaliation the thought of hanging men in cold blood even though the rebels should murder a few of the colored prisoners was a horror from which he shrank oh douglas i cannot do that if i could get hold of the actual murderers of colored prisoners i would retaliate but to hang those who have no hand in such murders i cannot the contemplation of such an act brought to his countenance such an expression of sadness and pity that it made it hard for me to press my point though i told him it would tend to save rather than destroy life he however insisted that this work of blood once begun would be hard to stop that such violence would beget violence he argued more like a disciple of christ than a commander-in-chief of the army and navy of a warlike nation already involved in a terrible war how sad and strange the fate of this great and good man the savior of his country the embodiment of human charity whose heart though strong was as tender as a heart of childhood who always tempered justice with mercy who sought to supplant the sword with counsel of reason to suppress passion by kindness and moderation who had a sigh for every human grief and a tear for every human woe should at last perish by the hand of a desperate assassin against whom no thought of malice had ever entered his heart lincoln goes in when the quakers are out 
one of the campaign songs of eighteen sixty which will never be forgotten was whittier's the quakers are out give the flags to the winds set the hills all aflame make way for the man with the patriarch's name away with misgivings away with all doubt for lincoln goes in when the quakers are out speaking of this song with which he was greatly pleased one day at the white house the president said it reminds me of a little story i heard years ago out in illinois a political campaign was on and the atmosphere was kept at a high temperature several fights had already occurred many men having been seriously hurt and the prospects were that the result would be close one of the candidates was a professional politician with a huge wart on his nose this disfigurement having earned for him the nickname of warty his opponent was a young lawyer who wore biled shirts while shaved by a barber and had his clothes made to fit him now warty was of quaker stock and around election time made a great parade of the fact when there were no campaigns in progress he was anything but quakerish in his language or actions the young lawyer didn't know what the inside of a meeting-house looked like well the night before election day the two candidates came together at a joint debate both being on the speaker's platform the young lawyer had to speak after warty and his reputation suffered at the hands of the quaker who told the many friends present what a wicked fellow the young man was never went to church swore drank smoked and gambled after warty had finished the other arose and faced the audience i'm not a good man said he and what my opponent has said about me is true enough but i'm always the same i don't profess religion when i run for office and then turn around and associate with bad people when the campaign's over i'm no hypocrite i don't sing many psalms neither does my opponent and talking about singing i'd just like to hear my friend who is running against me sing the song for the benefit of this audience i heard him sing the night after he was nominated i yield the floor to him of course warty refused his quaker supporters grew suspicious and when they turned out at the polls the following day they voted for the wicked young lawyer so it's true that when the quakers are out the man they support is apt to go in had confidence in him but general blank asked for more men said secretary of war stanton to the president one day showing the latter a telegram from the commander named appealing for reinforcements i guess he's killed off enough men hasn't he queried the president i don't mean confederates our own men what's the use in sending volunteers down to him if they're only used to fill graves his dispatch seems to imply that in his opinion you have not the confidence in him he thinks he deserves the war secretary went on to say as he looked over the telegram again oh was the president's reply he needn't lose any of his sleep on that account just telegram him to that effect also that i don't propose to send him any more men how hominy was originated during the progress of a cabinet meeting the subject of food for the men in the army happened to come up from that the conversation changed to the study of the latin language i studied latin once said mr lincoln in a casual way were you interested in it asked mr seward the secretary of state well yes i saw some very curious things was the president's rejoinder what asked secretary seward well there's the word hominy for instance we have just ordered a lot of that stuff for the troops i see how the word originated i notice it came from the latin word homo a man when we decline homo it is homo a man hominus of man hominy for man so you see hominy being for man comes from the latin i guess those soldiers who don't know latin will get along with it all right though i won't rest real easy until i hear from the commissary department on it his ideas old after all one day while listening to one of the wise men who had called at the white house to unload a large cargo of advice the president interjected a remark to the effect that he had a great reverence for learning 
this is not president lincoln explained because i am not an educated man i feel the need of reading it is a loss to a man not to have grown up among books men of force the visitor answered can get on pretty well without books they do their own thinking instead of adopting what other men think yes said mr lincoln but books serve to show a man that those original thoughts of his aren't very new after all this was a point the caller was not willing to debate and so he cut his call short lincoln's first speech lincoln made his first speech when he was a mere boy going barefoot his trousers held up by one suspender and his shock of hair sticking through a hole in the crown of his cheap straw hat abe in company with dennis hanks attended a political meeting which was addressed by a typical stump speaker one of those loud-voiced fellows who shouted at the top of his voice and waved his arms wildly at the conclusion of the speech which did not meet the views either of abe or dennis the latter declared that abe could make a better speech than that whereupon he got a dry goods box and called on abe to reply to the campaign orator lincoln threw his old straw hat on the ground and mounting the dry goods box delivered a speech which held the attention of the crowd and won him considerable applause even the campaign orator admitted that it was a fine speech and answered every point of his own oration dennis hanks who thought abe was about the greatest man that ever lived was delighted and he often told how young abe got the better of the trained campaign speaker abe wanted no sneakin around it was in eighteen thirty when abe was just twenty-one years of age that the lincoln family moved from gentryville indiana to near decatur illinois their household goods being packed in a wagon drawn by four oxen driven by abe the winter previous the latter had worked in a country store at gentryville and before undertaking the journey he invested all the money he had some thirty dollars in notions such as needles pins thread buttons and other domestic necessities these he sold to families along the route and made a profit of about one hundred per cent this mercantile adventure of his youth reminded the president of a very clever story while the members of the cabinet were one day solemnly debating a rather serious international problem the president was in the minority as was frequently the case and he was in a hole as he afterwards expressed it he didn't want to argue the points raised preferring to settle the matter in a hurry and an apt story was his only salvation suddenly the president's face brightened gentlemen said he addressing those seated at the cabinet table the situation just now reminds me of a fix i got into some thirty years or so ago when i was peddling notions on the way from indiana to illinois i didn't have a large stock but i charged large prices and i made money perhaps you don't see what i'm driving at secretary of state seward was wearing a most gloomy expression of countenance secretary of war stanton was savage and inclined to be morose secretary of the treasury chase was indifferent and cynical while the others of the presidential advisers resigned themselves to the hearing of the inevitable story i don't propose to argue this matter the president went on to say because arguments have no effect upon men whose opinions are fixed and whose minds are made up but this little story of mine will make some things which now are in the dark show up more clearly there was another pause and the cabinet officers maintaining their previous silence began wondering if the president himself really knew what he was driving at just before we left indiana and crossed into illinois continued mr lincoln solemnly speaking in a grave tone of voice we came across a small farmhouse full of nothing but children these ranged in years from seventeen years to seventeen months and all were in tears the mother of the family was red-headed and red-faced and the whip she held in her right hand led to the inference that she had been chastising her brood the father of the family a meek-looking mild-mannered tow-headed chap was standing in the front doorway awaiting to all appearances his turn to feel the thong 
i thought there wasn't much use in asking the head of that house if she wanted any notions she was too busy it was evident an insurrection had been in progress but it was pretty well quelled when i got there the mother had about suppressed it with an iron hand but she was not running any risks she kept a keen and wary eye upon all the children not forgetting an occasional glance at the old man in the doorway she saw me as i came up and from her look i thought she was of the opinion that i intended to interfere advancing to the doorway and roughly pushing her husband aside she demanded my business nothing madam i answered as gently as possible i merely dropped in as i came along to see how things were going well you needn't wait was the reply in an irritated way there's trouble here and lots of it too but i can manage my own affairs without the help of outsiders this is just a family row but i'll teach these brats their place if i have to lick the hide off every one of them i don't do much talking but i run this house and i don't want no one sneaking round trying to find out how i do it either that's the case here with us the president said in conclusion we must let the other nations know that we propose to settle our family row in our own way and teach these brats their places the seceding states if we have to lick the hides off of each and every one of them and like the old woman we don't want any sneaking around by other countries who would like to find out how we are to do it either now seward you write some diplomatic notes to that effect and the cabinet session closed didn't even need stilts as the president considered it his duty to keep in touch with all the improvements in the armament of the vessels belonging to the united states navy he was necessarily interested in the various types of these floating fortresses not only was it required of the navy department to furnish seagoing warships deep draft vessels for the great rivers and the lakes but this department also found use for little gunboats which could creep along in the shallowest of water and attack the confederates in by places and swamps the consequence of the interest taken by mr lincoln in the navy was that he was besieged day and night by steamboat contractors each one eager to sell his product to the washington government all sorts of experiments were tried some being dire failures while others were more than fairly successful more than once had these tiny war vessels proved themselves of great service and the united states government had a large number of them built there was one particular contractor who bothered the president more than all the others put together he was constantly impressing upon mr lincoln the great superiority of his boats because they would run in such shallow water oh yes replied the president i've no doubt they'll run anywhere where the ground is a little moist how do you get out of this place it seems to me remarked the president one day while reading over some of the appealing telegrams sent to the war department by general mcclellan that mcclellan has been wandering around and has sort of got lost he's been hollering for help ever since he went south want somebody to come to his deliverance and get him out of the place he's got into he reminds me of the story of a man out in illinois who in company with a number of friends visited the state penitentiary they wandered all through the institution and saw everything but just about the time to depart this particular man became separated from his friends and couldn't find his way out he roamed up and down one corridor after another becoming more desperate all the time when at last he came across a convict who was looking out from between the bars of his cell door here was salvation at last hurrying up to the prisoner he hastily asked say how do you get out of this place end of a part twenty four part twenty five of lincoln's yarns and stories by alexander k mcclure this librivox recording is in the public domain part twenty five tad introduces our friends president lincoln often avoided interviews with delegations representing various states especially when he knew the objects of their errands and was aware he could not grant their requests this was the case with several commissioners from kentucky who were put off from day to day 
they were about to give up in despair and were leaving the white house lobby their speech being interspersed with vehement and uncomplimentary terms concerning old abe when tad happened along he caught at these words and asked one of them if they wanted to see old abe laughing at the same time yes he replied wait a minute said tad and rushed into his father's office said he papa may i introduce some friends to you his father always indulgent and ready to make him happy kindly said yes my son i will see your friends tad went to the kentuckians again and asked a very dignified-looking gentleman of the party his name he was told his name he then said come gentlemen and they followed him leading them to the president tad with much dignity said papa let me introduce to you judge blank of kentucky and quickly added now judge you introduce the other gentleman the introductions were gone through with and they turned out to be the gentleman mr lincoln had been avoiding for a week mr lincoln reached for the boy took him in his lap kissed him and told him it was all right and that he had introduced his friend like a little gentleman as he was tad was eleven years old at this time the president was pleased with tad's diplomacy and often laughed at the incident as he told others of it one day while caressing the boy he asked him why he called these gentlemen his friends well said tad i had seen them so often and they looked so good and sorry and they were from kentucky that i thought they must be our friends that is right my son said mr lincoln i would have the whole human race your friends and mine if it were possible mixed up worse than before the president told a story which most beautifully illustrated the muddled situation of affairs at the time mcclellan's fate was hanging in the balance mcclellan's work was not satisfactory but the president hesitated to remove him the general was so slow that the confederates marched all around him and to add to the dilemma the president could not find a suitable man to take mcclellan's place the latter was a political as well as a military factor his friends threatened that if he was removed many war democrats would cast their influence with the south etc it was altogether a sad mix-up and the president for a time was at his wit's end he was assailed on all sides with advice but none of it was worth acting upon this situation reminds me said the president at a cabinet meeting one day not long before the appointment of general halleck as mcclellan's successor in command of the union forces of a union man in kentucky whose two sons enlisted in the federal army his wife was of confederate sympathies his nearest neighbor was a confederate in feeling and his two sons were fighting under lee this neighbor's wife was a union woman and it nearly broke her heart to know that her sons were arrayed against the union finally the two men after each had talked the matter over with his wife agreed to obtain divorces this they did and the union man and the union woman were wedded as were the confederate man and the confederate woman the men swapped wives in short but this didn't seem to help matters any for the sons of the union woman were still fighting for the south and the sons of the confederate woman continued in the federal army the union husband couldn't get along with his union wife and the confederate husband and his confederate wife couldn't agree upon anything being forever fussing and quarreling it's the same with the army it doesn't seem worth while to secure divorces and then marry the army and mcclellan to others for they won't get along any better than they do now and there'll only be a new set of heartaches started i think we'd better wait perhaps a real fighting general will come along some of these days and then we'll all be happy if you go to mixing in a mix-up you only make the muddle worse long abe's feet protruded over george m pullman the great sleeping car builder once told a joke in which lincoln was the prominent figure in fact there wouldn't have been any joke had it not been for long abe at the time of the occurrence which was the foundation for the joke and pullman admitted that the latter was on him pullman was the conductor of his only sleeping car 
the latter was an experiment and pullman was doing everything possible to get the railroads to take hold of it one night said pullman in telling the story as we were about going out of chicago this was long before lincoln was what you might call a renowned man a long lean ugly man with a wart on his cheek came into the depot he paid me fifty cents and half a berth was assigned him then he took off his coat and vest and hung them up and they fitted the peg about as well as they fitted him then he kicked off his boots which were of surprising length turned into the berth and undoubtedly having an easy conscience was sleeping like a healthy baby before the car left the depot pretty soon along came another passenger and paid his fifty cents in two minutes he was back at me angry as a wet hen there's a man in that berth of mine said he hotly and he's about ten feet high how am i going to sleep there i'd like to know go and look at him in i went mad too the tall lank man's knees were under his chin his arms were stretched across the bed and his feet were stored comfortably for him i shook him until he awoke and then told him if he wanted the whole berth he would have to pay a dollar my dear sir said the tall man a contract is a contract i have paid you fifty cents for half this berth and as you see i'm occupying it there's the other half pointing to a strip about six inches wide sell that and don't disturb me again and so saying the man with the wart on his face went to sleep again he was abraham lincoln and he never grew any shorter afterward we became great friends and often laughed over the incident could lick any man in the crowd when the enemies of general grant were bothering the president with emphatic and repeated demands that the silent man be removed from command mr lincoln remained firm he would not consent to lose the services of so valuable a soldier grant fights said he in response to the charges made that grant was a butcher a drunkard an incompetent and a general who did not know his business that reminds me of a story president lincoln said one day to a delegation of the grant is no good style out in my state of illinois there was a man nominated for sheriff of the county he was a good man for the office brave determined and honest but not much of an orator in fact he couldn't talk at all he couldn't make a speech to save his life his friends knew he was a man who would preserve the peace of the county and perform the duties evolving upon him all right but the people of the county didn't know it they wanted him to come out boldly on the platform at political meetings and state his convictions and principles they had been used to speeches from candidates and were somewhat suspicious of a man who was afraid to open his mouth at last the candidate consented to make a speech and his friends were delighted the candidate was on hand and when he was called upon advanced to the front and faced the crowd there was a glitter in his eye that wasn't pleasing and the way he walked out to the front of the stand showed that he knew just what he wanted to say feller citizens was his beginning the words spoken quietly i'm not a speaking man i ain't no orator and i never stood up before a lot of people in my life before i'm not going to make no speech except to say that i can lick any man in the crowd his way to a child's heart charles e anthony's one meeting with mr lincoln presents an interesting contrast to those of the men who shared the emancipator's interest in public affairs it was in the latter part of the winter of eighteen sixty one a short time before mr lincoln left for his inauguration at washington judge anthony went to the sherman house where the president-elect was stopping and took with him his son charles then but a little boy charles played about the room as a child will looking at whatever interested him for the time and when the interview with his father was over he was ready to go but mr lincoln ever interested in little children called the lad to him and took him upon his great knee my impression of him all the time i had been playing about the room said mr anthony was that he was a terribly homely man i was rather repelled but no sooner did he speak to me than the expression of his face changed completely or rather my view of it changed 
it at once became kindly and attractive he asked me some questions seeming instantly to find in the turmoil of all the great questions that must have been heavy upon him the very ones that would go to the thought of a child i answered him without hesitation and after a moment he patted my shoulder and said well you'll be a man before your mother yet and put me down i had never before heard the homely old expression and it puzzled me for a time after a moment i understood it but he looked at me while i was puzzling over it and seemed to be amused as no doubt he was the incident simply illustrates the ease and readiness with which lincoln could turn from the mighty questions before the nations give a moment's interested attention to a child and return at once to matters of state left it the women to howl about me don piat one of the brightest newspaper writers in the country told a good story on the president in regard to the refusal of the latter to sanction the death penalty in cases of desertion from the union army there was far more policy in this course said piat than kind feeling to assert the contrary is to detract from lincoln's force of character as well as intellect our war president was not lost in his high admiration of brigadiers and major generals and had a positive dislike for their methods and the despotism upon which an army is based he knew that he was dependent upon volunteers for soldiers and to force upon such men as those the stern discipline of the regular army was to render the service unpopular and it pleased him to be the source of mercy as well as the fountain of honor in this direction i was sitting with general dan tyler of connecticut in the antechamber of the war department shortly after the adjournment of the buell court of inquiry of which we had been members when president lincoln came in from the room of secretary stanton seeing us he said well gentlemen have you any matter worth reporting i think so mr president replied general tyler we had it proven that bragg with less than ten thousand men drove your eighty three thousand men under buell back from before chattanooga down to the ohio at louisville marched around us twice then doubled us up at perryville and finally got out of the state of kentucky with all his blunder now tyler returned the president what is the meaning of all this what is the lesson don't our men march as well and fight as well as these rebels if not there is a fault somewhere we are all the same family same sort yes there is a lesson replied general tyler we are of the same sort but subject to different handling bragg's little force was superior to our larger number because he had it under control if a man left his ranks he was punished if he deserted he was shot we had nothing of that sort if we attempt to shoot a deserter you pardon him and our army is without discipline the president looked perplexed why do you interfere continued general tyler congress has taken from you all responsibility yes answered the president impatiently congress has taken the responsibility and left the women to howl all about me and so he strode away he'd ruin all the other convicts one of the droll stories brought into play by the president as an ally in support of his contention proved most effective politics was rife among the generals of the union army and there was more wire pulling to prevent the advancement of fellow commanders than the laying of plans to defeat the confederates in battle however when it so happened that the name of a particularly unpopular general was sent to the senate for confirmation the protest against his promotion was almost unanimous the nomination didn't seem to please anyone generals who were enemies before conferred together for the purpose of bringing every possible influence to bear upon the senate and securing the rejection of the hated leader's name the president was surprised he had never known such unanimity before you remind me said the president to a delegation of officers which called upon him one day to present a fresh protest to him regarding the nomination of a visit a certain governor paid to the penitentiary of his state 
it had been announced that the governor would hear the story of every inmate of the institution and was prepared to rectify either by commutation or pardon any wrongs that had been done to any prisoner one by one the convicts appeared before his excellency and each one maintained that he was an innocent man who had been sent to prison because the police didn't like him or his friends and relatives wanted his property or he was too popular etc etc the last prisoner to appear was an individual who was not at all prepossessing his face was against him his eyes were shifty he didn't have the appearance of an honest man and he didn't act like one well asked the governor impatiently i suppose you're innocent like the rest of these fellows no governor was the unexpected answer i was guilty of the crime they charged against me and i got just what i deserved when he had recovered from his astonishment the governor looking the fellow squarely in the face remarked with emphasis i'll have to pardon you because i don't want to leave so bad a man as you are in the company of such innocent sufferers as i have discovered your fellow convicts to be you might corrupt them and teach them wicked tricks as soon as i get back to the capital i'll have the papers made out you gentlemen continued the president ought to be glad that so bad a man as you represent this officer to be is to get his promotion for then you won't be forced to associate with him and suffer the contamination of his presence and influence i will do all i can to have the senate confirm him and he was confirmed in a hopeless minority the president was often in opposition to the general public sentiment of the north upon certain questions of policy but he bided his time and things usually came out as he wanted them it was lincoln's opinion from the first that apology and reparation to england must be made by the united states because of the arrest upon the high seas of the confederate commissioners mason and slidell the country however the northern states was wild for a conflict with england one war at a time quietly remarked the president at a cabinet meeting where he found the majority of his advisers unfavorably disposed to backing down but one member of the cabinet was a really strong supporter of the president in his attitude i am reminded the president said after the various arguments had been put forward by the members of the cabinet of a fellow out in my state of illinois who happened to stray into a church while a revival meeting was in progress to be truthful this individual was not entirely sober and with that instinct which seems to impel all men in his condition to assume a prominent part in proceedings he walked up the aisle to the very front pew all noticed him but he did not care for a while he joined audibly in the singing said amen at the close of the prayers but drowsiness overcoming him he went to sleep before the meeting closed the pastor asked the usual question who are on the lord's side and the congregation arose en masse when he asked who are on the side of the devil the sleeper was about waking up he heard a portion of the interrogatory and seeing the minister on his feet arose i don't exactly understand the question he said but i'll stand by you parson to the last but it seems to me he added that we're in a hopeless minority i'm in a hopeless minority now said the president and i'll have to admit it did ye ask morrissey yet john morrissey the noted prize fighter was the boss of tammany hall during the civil war period it pleased his fancy to go to congress and his obedient constituents sent him there morrissey was such an absolute despot that the new york city democracy could not make a move without his consent and many of the tammanyites were so afraid of him that they would not even enter into business ventures without consulting the autocrat president lincoln had been seriously annoyed by some of his generals who were afraid to make the slightest move before asking advice from washington one commander in particular was so cautious that he telegraphed the war department upon the slightest pretext the result being that his troops were lying in camp doing nothing when they should have been in the field 
this general reminds me the president said one day while talking to secretary stanton at the war department of a story i once heard about a tammany man he happened to meet a friend also a member of tammany on the street and in the course of the talk the friend who was beaming with smiles and good nature told the other tammanyite that he was going to be married this first tammany man looked more serious than men usually do upon hearing of the impending happiness of a friend in fact his face seemed to take on a look of anxiety and worry ain't you glad to know that i'm going to be married demanded the second tammanyite somewhat in a huff of course i am was the reply but putting his mouth close to the ear of the other have you asked morrissey yet now this general of whom we are speaking wouldn't dare order out the guard without asking morrissey concluded the president got the laugh on douglas at one time when lincoln and douglas were stumping illinois they met at a certain town and it was agreed that they would have a joint debate Douglas was the first speaker, and in the course of his talk remarked that in early life his father, who he said was an excellent cooper by trade, apprenticed him out to learn the cabinet business. This was too good for Lincoln to let pass, so when his turn came to reply, he said, I had understood before that Mr. Douglas had been bound out to learn the cabinet-making business, which is all well enough, but I was not aware until now that his father was a cooper i have no doubt however that he was one and i am certain also that he was a very good one for here lincoln gently bowed toward douglas he has made one of the best whiskey casts i've ever seen as douglas was a short heavy set man and occasionally imbibed the pith of the joke was at once apparent and most heartily enjoyed by all on another occasion douglas made a point against lincoln by telling the crowd that when he first knew lincoln he was a grocery keeper and sold whiskey cigars etc mr l he said was a very good bartender this brought the laugh on lincoln whose reply however soon came and then the laugh was on the other side what mr douglas has said gentlemen replied lincoln is true enough i did keep a grocery and i did sell cotton candles and cigars and sometimes whiskey but i remember in those days that mr douglas was one of my best customers i can also say this that i have since left my side of the counter while mr douglas still sticks to his this brought such a storm of cheers and laughter that douglas was unable to reply fixed up a bit for the city folks mrs lincoln knew her husband was not pretty but she liked to have him presentable when he appeared before the public stephen fisk in when lincoln was first inaugurated tells of mrs lincoln's anxiety to have the president-elect smoothed down a little when receiving a delegation that was to greet them upon reaching new york city the train stopped writes mr fisk and through the windows immense crowds could be seen the cheering drowning the blowing off of steam of the locomotive then mrs lincoln opened her handbag and said abraham i must fix you up a bit for these city folks mr lincoln gently lifted her upon the seat before him she parted combed and brushed his hair and arranged his black necktie do i look nice now mother he affectionately asked well you'll do abraham replied mrs lincoln critically so he kissed her and lifted her down from the seat and turned to meet mayor wood courtly and suave and to have his hand shaken by the other new york officials even rebels ought to be saved the rev mr shrigley of philadelphia a universalist had been nominated for hospital chaplain and a protesting delegation went to washington to see president lincoln on the subject we have called mr president to confer with you in regard to the appointment of mr shrigley of philadelphia as hospital chaplain the president responded oh yes gentlemen i have sent his name to the senate and he will no doubt be confirmed at an early date one of the young men replied we have not come to ask for the appointment but to solicit you to withdraw the nomination ah said lincoln that alters the case but on what grounds do you wish the nomination withdrawn 
the answer was mr shrigley is not sound in his theological opinions the president inquired on what question is the gentleman unsound response he does not believe in endless punishment not only so sir but he believes that even the rebels themselves will be finally saved is that so inquired the president the members of the committee responded yes yes well gentlemen if that be so and there is any way under heaven whereby the rebels can be saved then for god's sake and their sakes let the man be appointed the rev mr shrigley was appointed and served until the close of the war end of part twenty five part twenty six of lincoln's yarns and stories by alexander k mcclure this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 26. Try to do what seemed best. John M. Palmer, Major General in the Volunteer Army, Governor of the State of Illinois, and United States Senator from the Sucker State, became acquainted with Lincoln in 1839, and the last time he saw the President was at the White House in February 1865. Senator Palmer told the story of his interview as follows i had come to washington at the request of the governor to complain that illinois had been credited with eighteen thousand too few troops i saw mr lincoln one afternoon and he asked me to come again in the morning next morning i sat in the anteroom while several officers were relieved at length i was told to enter the president's room mr lincoln was in the hands of the barber come in palmer he called out come in you're home folks i can shave before you i couldn't before those others and i have to do it some time we chatted about various matters and at length i said well mr lincoln if anybody had told me that in a great crisis like this the people were going out to a little one-horse town and pick out a one-horse lawyer for president i wouldn't have believed it mr lincoln whirled about in his chair his face white with lather a towel under his chin at first i thought he was angry sweeping the barber away he leaned forward and placing one hand on my knee said neither would i but it was time when a man with a policy would have been fatal to the country i have never had a policy i have simply tried to do what seemed best each day as each day came holding a candle to the czar england was anything but pleased when the czar alexander of russia showed his friendship for the united states by sending a strong fleet to this country with the accompanying suggestion that uncle sam through his representative president lincoln could do whatever he saw fit with the ironclads and the munitions of war they had stowed away in their holds london punch on november seventh eighteen sixty three printed the cartoon shown on this page the text under the picture reading in this way holding a candle to the blank much the same thing of course this was a covert sneer intended to convey the impression that president lincoln in order to secure the support and friendship of the emperor of russia as long as the war of the rebellion lasted was willing to do all sorts of menial offices even to the extent of holding the candle and lighting his most gracious majesty the white czar to his imperial bedchamber it is a somewhat remarkable fact that the emperor alexander who tendered inestimable aid to the president of the united states was the lincoln of russia having given freedom to millions of serfs in his empire and further than that he was like lincoln the victim of assassination he was literally blown to pieces by a bomb thrown under his carriage while riding through the streets near the winter palace at st petersburg nashville was not surrendered i was told a mighty good story said the president one day at a cabinet meeting by colonel granville moody the fighting methodist parson as they used to call him in tennessee i happened to meet moody in philadelphia where he was attending a conference the story was about andy johnson and general buell colonel moody happened to be in nashville the day it was reported that buell had decided to evacuate the city the rebels strongly reinforced were said to be within two days march of the capital 
of course the city was greatly excited moody said he went in search of johnson at the edge of the evening and found him at his office closeted with two gentlemen who were walking the floor with him one on each side as he entered they retired leaving him alone with johnson who came up to him manifesting intense feeling and said moody we are sold out buell is a traitor he is going to evacuate the city and in forty-eight hours we will all be in the hands of the rebels then he commenced pacing the floor again twisting his hands and chafing like a caged tiger utterly insensible to his friend's entreaties to become calm and suddenly he turned and said moody can you pray that is my business sir as a minister of the gospel returned the colonel well moody i wish you would pray said johnson and instantly both went down upon their knees at opposite sides of the room as the prayer waxed fervent johnson began to respond in true methodist style presently he crawled over on his hands and knees to moody's side and put his arms over him manifesting the deepest emotion closing the prayer with a hearty amen from each they arose johnson took a long breath and said with emphasis moody i feel better shortly afterward he asked will you stand by me certainly i will was the answer well moody i can depend upon you you are one in a hundred thousand he then commenced pacing the floor again suddenly he wheeled the current of his thought having changed and said oh moody i don't want you to think i have become a religious man because i ask you to pray i am sorry to say it i am not and never pretended to be religious no one knows this better than you but moody there is one thing about it i do believe in almighty god and i believe also in the bible and i say damn me if nashville shall be surrendered and nashville was not surrendered he couldn't wait for the colonel general fisk attending a reception at the white house saw waiting in the anteroom a poor old man from tennessee and learned that he had been waiting three or four days to get an audience on which probably depended the life of his son under sentence of death for some military offense general fisk wrote his case in outline on a card and sent it in with a special request that the president would see the man in a moment the order came and past impatient senators governors and generals the old man went he showed his papers to mr lincoln who said he would look into the case and give him the result next day the old man in an agony of apprehension looked up into the president's sympathetic face and actually cried out tomorrow may be too late my son is under sentence of death it ought to be decided now his streaming tears told how much he was moved come said mr lincoln wait a bit and i'll tell you a story and then he told the old man general fist's story about the swearing driver as follows the general had begun his military life as a colonel and when he raised his regiment in missouri he proposed to his men that he should do all the swearing of the regiment they assented and for months no instance was known of the violation of the promise the colonel had a teamster named john todd who as roads were not always the best had some difficulty in commanding his temper and his tongue john happened to be driving a mule team through a series of mud holes a little worse than usual when unable to restrain himself any longer he burst forth into a volley of energetic oaths the colonel took notice of the offence and brought john to account john said he didn't you promise to let me do all the swearing of the regiment yes i did colonel he replied but the fact was the swearing had to be done then or not at all and you weren't there to do it as he told the story the old man forgot his boy and both the president and his listener had a hearty laugh together at its conclusion then he wrote a few words which the old man read and in which he found new occasion for tears but the tears were tears of joy for the words saved the life of his son lincoln pronounced this story funny the president was heard to declare one day that the story given below was one of the funniest he ever heard 
one of general fremont's batteries of eight para guns supported by a squadron of horse commanded by major richards was in sharp conflict with a battery of the enemy near at hand shells and shot were flying thick and fast when the commander of the battery a german one of fremont's staff rode suddenly up to the cavalry exclaiming in loud and excited terms bring up the jackasses bring up the jackasses for god's sake hurry up the jackasses in me the necessity of this order though not quite apparent will be more obvious when it is remembered that jackasses are mules carry mountain howitzers which are fired from the backs of that much abused but valuable animal and the immediate occasion for the shackasses was that two regiments of rebel infantry were at that moment discovered ascending a hill immediately behind our batteries the shackasses with the howitzers loaded with grape and canister were soon on the ground the mules squared themselves as they well knew how for the shock a terrific volley was poured into the advancing column which immediately broke and retreated two hundred and seventy-eight dead bodies were found in the ravine next day piled closely together as they fell the effects of that volley from the backs of the shack asses joke was on lincoln mr lincoln enjoyed a joke at his own expense said he in the days when i used to be in the circuit i was accosted in the cars by a stranger who said excuse me sir but i have an article in my possession which belongs to you how is that i asked considerably astonished the stranger took a jackknife from his pocket this knife said he was placed in my hand some years ago with the injunction that i was to keep it until i had found a man uglier than myself i have carried it from that time to this allow me to say sir that i think you are fairly entitled to the property the other one was worse it so happened that an official of the war department had escaped serious punishment for a rather flagrant offence by showing where grosser irregularities existed in the management of a certain bureau of the department so valuable was the information furnished that the culprit who gave the snap away was not even discharged that reminds me the president said when the case was laid before him of a story about daniel webster when the latter was a boy when quite young at school daniel was one day guilty of a gross violation of the rules he was detected in the act and called up by the teacher for punishment this was to be the old-fashioned furling of the hand his hands happened to be very dirty knowing this on the way to the teacher's desk he spit upon the palms of his right hand wiping it off upon the side of his pantaloons give me your hand sir said the teacher very sternly out went the right hand partly cleansed the teacher looked at it a moment and said daniel if you will find another hand in this schoolroom as filthy as that i will let you off this time instantly from behind the back came the left hand here it is sir was the ready reply that will do said the teacher for this time you can take your seat sir i'd have been missed by myself the president did not consider that every soldier who ran away in battle or did not stand firmly to receive a bayonet charge was a coward he was of opinion that self-preservation was the first law of nature, but he didn't want this statute construed too liberally by the troops. At the same time, he took occasion to illustrate a point he wished to make by a story in connection with a darkey who was a member of the 9th Illinois Infantry Regiment. This regiment was one of those engaged in the capture of Fort Donelson. It behaved gallantly and lost as heavily as any upon the hurricane deck of one of our gunboats said the president in telling the story i saw an elderly darkey with a very philosophical and retrospective cast of countenance squatted upon his bundle toasting his shins against the chimney and apparently plunged into a state of profound meditation as the negro rather interested me i made some inquiries and found that he had really been with the ninth illinois infantry at donelson and began to ask him some questions about the capture of the place were you in the fight had a little taste of it sah stood your ground did you 
nah sir i runs run at the first fire did you yes sir and would have run sooner had i knowed it war common why that wasn't very creditable to your courage i end my line sir cookin's my profession well but have you no regard for your reputation reputation's nothing to me by the side of life do you consider your life worth more than other people's it's worth more to me sir then you must value it very highly yes sir it does more dan all dis wood more dan a million of dollars sir for what would that be worth to a man wid the breath out of him self-preservation am de fust law wid me but why should you act upon a different rule from other men different men set different values in the laws a man is not in de market but if you lost it you would have the satisfaction of knowing that you died for your country that no satisfaction when feeling's gone then a patriotism and honor are nothing to you nothing whatever sir i regard them as among the vanities if our soldiers were like you traitors might have broken up the government without resistance yes sir i would have been no help for it i wouldn't put my life into scale against any government that ever existed for no government could place the loss to me do you think any of your company would have missed you if you had been killed maybe not sir a dead white man ain't much to these soldiers let alone a dead nigger but i'd have missed myself and that was the point with me i only tell this story concluded the president in order to illustrate the result of the tactics of some of the union generals who would be sadly missed by themselves if no one else if they ever got out of the army it all depended upon the effect president lincoln and some members of his cabinet were with a part of the army some distance south of the national capital at one time when secretary of war stanton remarked that just before he left washington he had received a telegram from general mitchell in alabama general mitchell asked instructions in regard to a certain emergency that had arisen the secretary said he did not precisely understand the emergency as explained by general mitchell but had answered back all right go ahead now he said as he turned to mr lincoln mr president if i have made an error in not understanding him correctly i will have to get you to countermand the order well exclaimed president lincoln that is very much like the happening on the occasion of a certain horse sale i remember that took place at the crossroads down in kentucky when i was a boy a particularly fine horse was to be sold and the people in large numbers had gathered together they had a small boy to ride the horse up and down while the spectators examined the horse's points at last one man whispered to the boy as he went by look here boy ain't that horse got the splints the boy replied mister i don't know what the splints is but if it's good for him he has got it if it ain't good for him he ain't got it now said president lincoln if this was good for mitchell it was all right but if it was not i have got to countermand it too swift to stay in the army there were strange queer odd things and happenings in the army at times but as a rule the president did not allow them to worry him he had enough to bother about a quartermaster having neglected to present his accounts in proper shape and the matter being deemed of sufficient importance to bring it to the attention of the president the latter remarked now this instance reminds me of a little story i heard only a short time ago a certain general's purse was getting low and he said it was probable he might be obliged to draw on his banker for some money how much do you want father asked his son who had been with him a few days i think i shall send for a couple of hundred replied the general why father said his son very quietly i can let you have it you can let me have it where did you get so much money i won it playing draw poker with your staff sir replied the youth the earliest morning train bore the young man toward his home and i've been wondering if that boy and that quartermaster had happened to meet at the same table admired the strong man 
Governor Hoyt of Wisconsin tells a story of Mr. Lincoln's great admiration for physical strength. Mr. Lincoln, in 1859, made a speech at the Wisconsin State Agricultural Fair. After the speech, in company with the governor, he strolled about the grounds looking at the exhibits. They came to a place where a professional strongman was tossing cannonballs in the air and catching them on his arms and juggling with them as though they were as light as baseballs. Mr. Lincoln had never before seen such an exhibition, and he was greatly surprised and interested. When the performance was over, Governor Hoyt, seeing Mr. Lincoln's interest, asked him to go up and be introduced to the athlete. He did so, and as he stood looking down amusingly on the man, who was very short, and evidently wondering that one so much smaller than he could be so much stronger, he suddenly broke out with one of his quaint speeches. Why, he said, why, I could lick salt off the top of your hat wished the army charged like that a prominent volunteer officer who early in the war was on duty in washington and often carried reports to secretary stanton at the war department told a characteristic story on president lincoln said he i was with several other young officers also carrying reports to the war department and one morning we were late in this instance we were in a desperate hurry to deliver the papers in order to be able to catch the train returning to camp on the winding dark staircase of the old war department which many will remember it was our misfortune while taking about three stairs at a time to run a certain head like a catapult into the body of the president striking him in the region of the right lower vest pocket the usual surprised and relaxed grunt of a man thus assailed came promptly we quickly sent an apology in the direction of the dimly seen form feeling that the ungracious shock was expensive even to the humblest clerk in the department a second glance revealed to us the president as the victim of the collision then followed a special tender of ten thousand pardons and the president's reply one's enough i wish the whole army would charge like that uncle abraham had everything ready you can't do anything with them southern fellows the old man at the table was saying if they get whipped they'll retreat to them southern swamps and bayous along with the fishes and crocodiles you haven't got the fish nets made that'll catch em look here old gentleman remarked president lincoln who was sitting alongside we've got just the nets for traitors in the bayous or anywhere hey what nets bayonets and uncle abraham pointed his joke with his fork spearing a fish ball savagely not as smooth as he looked mr lincoln's skill in parrying troublesome questions was wonderful once he received a call from congressman john ganson of buffalo one of the ablest lawyers in new york who, although a Democrat, supported all of Mr. Lincoln's war measures. Mr. Ganson wanted explanations. Mr. Ganson was very bald with a perfectly smooth face. He had a most direct and aggressive way of stating his views or of demanding what he thought he was entitled to. He said, Mr. Lincoln, I have supported all of your measures and think I am entitled to your confidence. We are voting and acting in the dark in Congress, and I demand to know think i have the right to ask and to know what is the present situation and what are the prospects and conditions of the several campaigns and armies mr lincoln looked at him critically for a moment and then said ganson how clean you shave most men would have been offended but ganson was too broad and intelligent a man not to see the point and retire at once satisfied from the field a small crop chauncey m depew says that mr lincoln told him the following story which he claimed was one of the best two things he ever originated he was trying a case in illinois where he appeared for a prisoner charged with aggravated assault and battery the complainant had told a horrible story of the attack which his appearance fully justified when the district attorney handed the witness over to mr lincoln for cross-examination mr lincoln said he had no testimony and unless he could break down the complainant's story he saw no way out 
he had come to the conclusion that the witness was a bumptious man who rather prided himself upon his smartness in repartee and so after looking at him for some minutes he said well my friend how much ground did you and my client here fight over the fellow answered oh about six acres well said mr lincoln don't you think that this is an almighty small crop of fight to gather from such a big piece of ground the jury laughed the court and district attorney and complainant all joined in and the case was last out of court never regret what you don't write a simple remark one of the party might make would remind mr lincoln of an apropos story secretary of the treasury chase happened to remark oh i'm so sorry that i did not write a letter to mr so-and-so before i left home president lincoln promptly responded chase never regret what you don't write it is what you do write that you are often called upon to feel sorry for a vain general in an interview between president lincoln and petroleum v nasby the name came up of a recently deceased politician of illinois whose merit was blemished by great vanity his funeral was very largely attended if general blank had known how big a funeral he would have had said mr lincoln he would have died years ago deathbed repentance a senator who was calling upon mr lincoln mentioned the name of a most virulent and dishonest official one who though very brilliant was very bad it's a good thing for b said mr lincoln that there is such a thing as a deathbed repentance no cause for pride a member of congress from ohio came into mr lincoln's presence in a state of unutterable intoxication and sinking into a chair exclaimed in tones that welled up fuzzy through the gallon or more of whiskey that he contained oh why should it, the spirit of mortal be proud my dear sir said the president regarding him closely i see no reason whatever End of part twenty six Part twenty seven of Lincoln's Yarns and Stories by Alexander K. McClure. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part twenty seven The Story of Lincoln's Life. When Abraham Lincoln once was asked to tell the story of his life, he replied, It is contained in one line of Gray's Elegy in a Country Churchyard The Short and Simple Annals of the Poor that was true at the time he said it as everything else he said was truth but he was then only at the beginning of a career that was to glorify him as one of the heroes of the world and place his name forever beside the immortal name of the mighty washington many great men particularly those of america began life in humbleness and poverty but none ever came from such depths or rose to such a height as abraham lincoln his birthplace in Hardin County, Kentucky, was but a wilderness, and Spencer County, Indiana, to which the Lincoln family removed when Abraham was in his eighth year, was a wilder and still more uncivilized region. The little red schoolhouse, which now so thickly adorns the country hillside, had not yet been built. There were scattered log schoolhouses, but they were few and far between in several of these mr lincoln got the rudiments of an education an education that was never finished for to the day of his death he was a student and a seeker after knowledge some records of his schoolboy days are still left us one is a book made and bound by lincoln himself in which he had written the table of weights and measures and the sums to be worked out therefrom this was his arithmetic for he was too poor to own a printed copy a youthful poet on one of the pages of this quaint book he had written these four lines of schoolboy doggerel abraham lincoln his hand and pen he will be good but god knows when the poetic spirit was strong in the young scholar just then for on another page of the same book he had written these two verses which are supposed to have been original with him time what an empty vapour tis and days how swift they are 
swift as an indian arrow fly on like a shooting star the present moment just is here then slides away in haste that we can never say their hours but only say their past another specimen of the poetical or rhyming ability is found in the following couplet written by him for his friend joseph c richardson good boys who to their books apply will all be great men by and by in all lincoln's schooling did not amount to a year's time but he was a constant student outside of the schoolhouse he read all the books he could borrow and it was his chief delight during the day to lie under the shade of some tree or at night in front of an open fireplace reading and studying his favorite books were the bible and aesop's fables which he kept always within reach and read time and again the first law book he ever read was the statutes of indiana and it was from this work that he derived his ambition to be a lawyer made speeches when a boy when he was but a barefoot boy he would often make political speeches to the boys in the neighborhood and when he had reached young manhood and was engaged in the labor of chopping wood or splitting rails he continued this practice of speech-making with only the stumps and surrounding trees for hearers at the age of seventeen he had attained his full height of six feet four inches and it was at this time he engaged as a ferry boatman on the ohio river at thirty-seven cents a day that he was seriously beginning to think of public affairs even at this early age is shown by the fact that about this time he wrote a composition on the american government urging the necessity for preserving the constitution and perpetuating the union a rockport lawyer by the name of pickert who read this composition declared that the world couldn't beat it when the dreaded disease known as the milk sick created such havoc in indiana in eighteen twenty nine the father of abraham lincoln who was of a roving disposition sought and found a new home in illinois locating near the town of decatur in macon county on a bluff overlooking the sangamon river a short time thereafter abraham lincoln came of age and having done his duty to his father began life on his own account his first employer was a man named denton offutt who engaged lincoln together with his stepbrother and john hanks to take a boatload of stock and provisions to new orleans offutt was so well pleased with the energy and skill that lincoln displayed on this trip that he engaged him as clerk in a store which offutt opened a few months later at new salem it was while clerking for offutt that lincoln performed many of those marvelous feats of strength for which he was noted in his youth and displayed his wonderful skill as a wrestler in addition to being six feet four inches high he now weighed two hundred and fourteen pounds and his strength and skill were so great combined that he could out-wrestle and out-lift any man in that section of the country during his clerkship in offutt's store lincoln continued to read and study and made considerable progress in grammar and mathematics offutt failed in business and disappeared from the village in the language of lincoln he petered out and his tall muscular clerk had to seek other employment assistant pilot on a steamboat in his first public speech which had already been delivered lincoln had contended that the sangamon river was navigable and it now fell to his lot to assist in giving practical proof of his argument a steamboat had arrived at new salem from cincinnati and lincoln was hired as an assistant in piloting the vessel through the uncertain channel of the sangamon river to the illinois river the way was obstructed by a mill dam lincoln insisted to the owners of the dam that under the federal constitution and laws no one had a right to dam up or obstruct a navigable stream and as he had already proved that the sangamon was navigable a portion of the dam was torn away and the boat passed safely through captain lincoln pleased him 
at this period in his career the black hawk war broke out and lincoln was one of the first to respond to governor reynolds call for a thousand mounted volunteers to assist the united states troop in driving black hawk back across the mississippi lincoln enlisted in the company from sangamon county and was elected captain he often remarked that this gave him greater pleasure than anything that had happened in his life up to this time he had however no opportunities in this war to perform any distinguished service upon his return from the black hawk war in which he said afterward in a humorous speech when in congress that he fought bled and came away he was an unsuccessful candidate for the legislature this was the only time in his life as he himself has said that he was ever beaten by the people although defeated in his own town of new salem he received all of the two hundred and eight votes cast except three failure as a businessman lincoln's next business venture was with william barry in a general store under the firm name of lincoln and barry but did not take long to show that he was not adapted for a business career the firm failed barry died and the debts of the firm fell entirely upon lincoln many of these debts he might have escaped legally but he assumed them all and it was not until fifteen years later that the last indebtedness of lincoln and barry was discharged during his membership in this firm he had applied himself to the study of law beginning at the beginning that is with blackstone now that he had nothing to do he spent much of his time lying under the shade of a tree poring over law books borrowed from a comrade in the black hawk war who was then a practicing lawyer at springfield gains fame as a storyteller it was about this time too that lincoln's fame as a storyteller began to spread far and wide his sayings and his jokes were repeated throughout that section of the country and he was famous as a storyteller before any one ever heard of him as a lawyer or a politician it required no little moral courage to resist the temptation that beset an idle young man on every hand at that time for drinking and carousing were of daily and nightly occurrence lincoln never drank intoxicating liquors nor did he at that time use tobacco but in any sports that called for skill or muscle he took a lively interest even in horse races and cockfights surveyor with no strings on him john calhoun was at that time surveyor of sangamon county he had been a lawyer and had noticed the studious lincoln needing an assistant he offered the place to lincoln the average young man without any regular employment and hard-pressed for means to pay his board as lincoln was would have jumped at the opportunity but a question of principle was involved which had to be settled before lincoln would accept calhoun was a democrat and lincoln was a whig therefore lincoln said i will take the office if i can be perfectly free in my political actions but if my sentiments or even expression of them are to be abridged in any way i would not have it or any other office with this understanding he accepted the office and began to study books on surveying furnished him by his employer he was not a natural mathematician and in working out his most difficult problems he sought the assistance of mentor graham a famous schoolmaster in those days who had previously assisted lincoln in his studies he soon became a competent surveyor however and was noted for the accurate way in which he ran his lines and located his corners surveying was not as profitable then as it has since become and the young surveyor often had to take his pay in some article other than money one old settler relates that for a survey made for him by lincoln he paid two buckskins which hannah armstrong foxed on his pants so that the briars would not wear them out about this time eighteen thirty three he was made postmaster at new salem the first federal office he ever held although the post office was located in a store lincoln usually carried the mail around in his hat and distributed it to people when he met them a member of the legislature the following year lincoln again ran for the legislature this time as an avowed whig 
of the four successful candidates lincoln received the second highest number of votes when lincoln went to take his seat in the legislature at vandalia he was so poor that he was obliged to borrow two hundred dollars to buy suitable clothes and uphold the dignity of his new position he took little part in the proceedings keeping in the background but forming many lasting acquaintances and friendships two years later when he was again a candidate for the same office there were more political issues to be met and lincoln met them with characteristic honesty and boldness during the campaign he issued the following letter new salem june thirteenth eighteen thirty six to the editor of the journal in your paper of last saturday i see a communication over the signature of many voters in which the candidates who are announced in the journal are called upon to show their hands agreed here's mine i go for all sharing the privilege of the government who assist in bearing its burdens consequently i go for admitting all whites to the right of suffrage who pay taxes or bear arms by no means excluding females if elected i shall consider the whole people of sangamon my constituents as well those that oppose as those that support me while acting as their representative i will be governed by their will on all subjects upon which i have the means of knowing what their will is and upon all others i shall do what my own judgment teaches me will best advance their interests whether elected or not i go for distributing the proceeds of the sales of public lands to the several states to enable our state in common with others to dig canals and construct railroads without borrowing money and paying the interest on it if alive on the first monday in november i shall vote for hugh l white for president very respectfully a lincoln this was just the sort of letter to win the support of the plain-spoken voters of sangamon county lincoln not only received more votes than any other candidate on the legislative ticket but the county which had always been democratic was turned whig the famous long nine the other candidates elected with lincoln were ninian w edwards john dawson andrew mccormick dan stone william f elkin robert l wilson joe fletcher and archer g herndon these were known as the long nine their average height was six feet and average weight two hundred pounds this legislature was one of the most famous that ever convened in illinois bonds to the amount of twelve million dollars were voted to assist in building thirteen hundred miles of railroad to widen and deepen all the streams in the state and to dig a canal from the illinois river to lake michigan lincoln favored all these plans but in justice to him it must be said that the people he represented were also in favor of them it was at this session that the state capital was changed from vandalia to springfield lincoln as the leader of the long nine had charge of the bill and after a long and bitter struggle succeeded in passing it begins to oppose slavery at this early stage in his career abraham lincoln began his opposition to slavery which eventually resulted in his giving liberty to four million human beings this legislature passed the following resolution on slavery resolved by the general assembly of the state of illinois that we highly disapprove of the formation of abolition societies and of the doctrines promulgated by them that the right of property in slaves is sacred to the slaveholding states by the federal constitution and that they cannot be deprived of that right without their consent that the general government cannot abolish slavery in the district of columbia against the consent of the citizens of said district without a manifest breach of good faith against this resolution lincoln entered a protest but only succeeded in getting one man in the legislature to sign the protest with him the protest was as follows revolutions upon the subject of domestic slavery having passed both branches of the general assembly at its present session the undersigned hereby protest against the passage of the same they believe that the institution of slavery is founded on both injustice and bad policy but that the promulgation of abolition doctrines tends rather to increase than abate its evils they believe that the congress of the united states has no power under the constitution to interfere with the institution of slavery in the different states 
they believe that the congress of the united states has the power under the constitution to abolish slavery in the district of columbia but that the power ought not to be exercised unless at the request of the people of the district the difference between these opinions and those contained in the above resolutions is their reason for entering this protest dan stone a lincoln representatives from the county of sangamon begins to practice law at the end of this session of the legislature mr lincoln decided to remove to springfield and practice law he entered the office of john t stewart a former comrade in the black hawk war and in march eighteen thirty seven was licensed to practice stephen t logan was judge of the circuit court and stephen a douglas who was destined to become lincoln's greatest political opponent was prosecuting attorney when lincoln was not in his law office his headquarters were in the store of his friend joshua f speed in which gathered all the youthful orators and statesmen of that day and where many exciting arguments and discussions were held lincoln and douglas both took part in the discussion held in speed's store douglas was the acknowledged leader of the democratic side and lincoln was rapidly coming to the front as a leader among the whig debaters one evening in the midst of a heated argument douglas or the little giant as he was called exclaimed this store is no place to talk politics his first joint debate arrangements were at once made for a joint debate between the leading democrats and whigs to take place in a local church the democrats were represented by douglas calhoun lamborn and thomas the whig speakers were judge logan colonel e d baker mr browning and lincoln this discussion was the forerunner of the famous joint debate between lincoln and douglas which took place some years later and attracted the attention of the people throughout the united states although mr lincoln was the last speaker in the first discussion held his speech attracted more attention than any of the others and added much to his reputation as a public debater mr lincoln's last campaign for the legislature was in eighteen forty in the same year he was made an elector on the harrison presidential ticket and in his canvass of the state frequently met the democratic champion douglas in debate after eighteen forty mr lincoln declined re-election to the legislature but he was a presidential elector on the whig tickets of eighteen forty four and eighteen fifty two and on the republican ticket for the state at large in eighteen fifty six marries a springfield bell among the social bells of springfield was mary todd a handsome and cultivated girl of the illustrious descent which could be traced back to the sixth century to whom mr lincoln was married in eighteen forty two stephen a douglas was his competitor in love as well as in politics he courted mary todd until it became evident that she preferred mr lincoln previous to his marriage mr lincoln had two love affairs one of them so serious that it left an impression upon his whole future life one of the objects of his affection was miss mary owen of green county kentucky who decided that mr lincoln was deficient in those little links which make up the chain of woman's happiness the affair ended without any damage to mr lincoln's heart or the heart of the lady story of ann rutledge lincoln's first love however had a sad termination the object of his affections at that time was ann rutledge whose father was one of the founders of new salem like miss owen miss rutledge was also born in kentucky and was gifted with the beauty and graces that distinguish many southern women at the time that mr lincoln and ann rutledge were engaged to be married he thought himself too poor to properly support a wife and they decided to wait until such time as he could better his financial condition a short time thereafter miss rutledge was attacked with a fatal illness and her death was such a blow to her intended husband that for a long time his friends feared that he would lose his mind his duel with shields just previous to his marriage with mary todd mr lincoln was challenged to fight a duel by james shields then auditor of state the challenge grew out of some humorous letters concerning shields published in a local paper 
the first of these letters was written by mr lincoln the others by mary todd and her sister mr lincoln acknowledged the authorship of the letters without naming the ladies and agreed to meet shields on the field of honor as he had the choice of weapons he named broadswords and actually went to the place selected for the duel the duel was never fought mutual friends got together and patched up an understanding between mr lincoln and the hot-headed irishman forms new partnership before this time mr lincoln had dissolved partnership with stuart and entered into a law partnership with judge logan in eighteen forty three both lincoln and logan were candidates for nomination for congress and the personal ill-will caused by their rivalry resulted in the dissolution of the firm and the formation of a new law firm of lincoln and herndon which continued nominally at least until mr lincoln's death the congressional nomination however went to edward d baker who was elected two years later the principal candidates for the whig nomination for congress were mr lincoln and his former law partner judge logan party sentiment was so strongly in favor of lincoln that judge logan withdrew and lincoln was nominated unanimously the campaign that followed was one of the most memorable and interesting ever held in illinois defeats peter cartwright for congress mr lincoln's opponent on the democratic ticket was no less a person than old peter cartwright the famous methodist preacher and circuit writer cartwright had preached to almost every congregation in the district and had a strong following in all the churches mr lincoln did not underestimate the strength of his great rival he abandoned his law business entirely and gave his whole attention to the canvas this time mr lincoln was victorious and was elected by a large majority when lincoln took his seat in congress in eighteen forty seven he was the only whig member from illinois his great political rival douglas was in the senate the mexican war had already broken out which in common with his party he had opposed later in life he was charged with having opposed the voting of supplies to the american troops in mexico but this was a falsehood which he easily disproved he was strongly opposed to the war but after it was once begun he urged its vigorous prosecution and voted with the democrats on all measures concerning the care and pay of the soldiers his opposition to the war however cost him a re-election it cost his party the congressional district which was carried by the democrats in eighteen forty eight lincoln's former law partner judge logan secured the whig nomination that year and was defeated makes speeches for old zack in the national convention at philadelphia in eighteen forty eight mr lincoln was a delegate and advocated the nomination of general taylor after the nomination of general taylor or old zack or rough and ready as he was called mr lincoln made a tour of new york and several new england states making speeches for his candidate mr lincoln went to new england in this campaign on account of the great defection in the whig party general taylor's nomination was unsatisfactory to the free soil element and such leaders as henry wilson charles francis adams charles allen charles sumner stephen c phillips richard h dana jr and anson burlingame were in open revolt mr lincoln's speeches were confined largely to a defense of general taylor but at the same time he denounced the free soilers for helping to elect Cass among other things he said that the free soilers had but one principle and that they reminded him of the yankee peddler going to sell a pair of pantaloons and describing them as large enough for any man and small enough for any boy it is an odd fact in history that the prominent whigs of massachusetts at that time became the opponents of mr lincoln's election to the presidency and the policy of his administration while the free soilers whom he denounced were among his strongest supporters advisers and followers at the second session of congress mr lincoln's one act of consequence was the introduction of a bill providing for the gradual emancipation of the slaves in the district of columbia joshua r giddings the great anti-slavery agitator and one or two lesser lights supported it but the bill was laid on the table 
after general taylor's election mr lincoln had the distribution of federal patronage in his own congressional district and this added much to his political importance although it was a ceaseless source of worry to him declines a high office just before the close of his term in congress mr lincoln was an applicant for the office of commissioner of the general land office but was unsuccessful he had been such a factor in general taylor's election that the administration thought something was due him and after his return to illinois he was called to washington and offered the governorship of the territory of oregon it is likely he would have accepted this had not mrs lincoln put her foot down with an emphatic no he declined a partnership with a well-known chicago lawyer and returning to his springfield home resumed the practice of law from this time until the repeal of the missouri compromise which opened the way for the admission of slavery into the territories mr lincoln devoted himself more industriously than ever to the practice of law and during those five years he was probably a greater student than he had ever been before his partner w h herndon has told of the changes that took place in the courts and in the methods of practice while mr lincoln was away lincoln as a lawyer when he returned to active practice he saw at once that the courts had grown more learned and dignified and that the bar relied more upon method and system and a knowledge of the statute law than upon the stump speech method of early days mr herndon tells us that lincoln would lie in bed and read by candlelight sometimes until two o'clock in the morning while his famous colleagues davis logan sweat edwards and herndon were soundly and sometimes loudly sleeping he read and re-read the statutes and books of practice devoured shakespeare who was always a favorite of his and studied euclid so diligently that he could easily demonstrate all the propositions contained in the six books mr lincoln detested office work he left all that to his partner he disliked to draw up legal papers or to write letters the firm of which he was a member kept no books when either lincoln or herndon received a fee they divided the money then and there if his partner were not in the office at the time mr lincoln would wrap up half of the fee in a sheet of paper on which he would write herndon's half giving the name of the case and place it in his partner's desk but in court arguing a case pleading to the jury and laying down the law lincoln was in his element even when he had a weak case he was a strong antagonist and when he had right and justice on his side as he nearly always had no one could beat him he liked an outdoor life hence he was fond of riding the circuit he enjoyed the company of other men liked discussion and argument loved to tell stories and to hear them laughing as heartily at his own stories as he did at those who were told to him End of a part 27. Part 28 of Lincoln's Yarns and Stories by Alexander K. McClure. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 28. Telling Stories on the Circuit. The court circuit in those days was the scene of many a storytelling joust, in which Lincoln was always the chief frequently he would sit up until after midnight reeling off story after story each one followed by roars of laughter that could be heard all over the country tavern in which the storytelling group was gathered every type of character would be represented in these groups from the learned judge on the bench down to the village loafer lincoln's favorite attitude was to sit with his long legs propped up on the rail of the stove or with his feet against the wall and thus he would sit for hours entertaining a crowd or being entertained one circuit judge was so fond of lincoln's stories that he often would sit up until midnight listening to them and then declare that he had laughed so much he believed his ribs were shaken loose the great success of abraham lincoln as a trial lawyer was due to a number of facts he would not take a case if he believed that the law and justice were on the other side when he addressed a jury he made them feel that he only wanted fair play and justice 
he did not talk over their heads but got right down to a friendly tone such as we use in ordinary conversation and talked at them appealing to their honesty and common sense and making his argument plain by telling a story or two that brought the matter clearly within their understanding when he did not know the law in a particular case he never pretended to know it if there were no precedents to cover a case he would state his side plainly and fairly he would tell the jury what he believed was right for them to do and then conclude with his favorite expression it seems to me that this ought to be the law some time before the repeal of the missouri compromise a lawyer friend said to him lincoln the time is near at hand when we shall have to be all abolitionists or all democrats when that time comes my mind is made up he replied for i believe the slavery question never can be compromised the lion is aroused to action while lincoln took a mild interest in politics he was not a candidate for office except as a presidential elector from the time of leaving congress until the repeal of the missouri compromise this repeal legislation was the work of lincoln's political antagonist stephen a douglas and aroused mr lincoln to action as the lion is roused by some foe worthy of his great strength and courage mr douglas argued that the true intent and meaning of the act was not to legislate slavery into any territory or state nor to exclude it therefrom but to leave the people perfectly free to form and regulate their domestic institutions in their own way douglas argument amounts to this said mr lincoln that if any one man chooses to enslave another no third man shall be allowed to object after the adjournment of congress mr douglas returned to illinois and began to defend his action in the repeal of the missouri compromise his most important speech was made at springfield and mr lincoln was selected to answer it that speech alone was sufficient to make mr lincoln the leader of anti-slavery sentiment in the west and some of the men who heard it declared that it was the greatest speech he ever made with the repeal of the missouri compromise the whig party began to break up the majority of its members who were pronounced abolitionists began to form the nucleus of the republican party before this party was formed however mr lincoln was induced to follow douglas around the state and reply to him but after one meeting at peoria where they both spoke they entered into an agreement to return to their homes and make no more speeches during the campaign seeks a seat in the senate mr lincoln made no secret at this time of his ambition to represent illinois in the united states senate against his protests he was nominated and elected to the legislature but resigned his seat his old rival james shields with whom he was once near to a duel was then senator and his term was to expire the following year a letter written by mr lincoln to a friend in paris illinois at this time is interesting and significant he wrote i have a suspicion that a whig has been elected to the legislature from egar if this is not so why then nix cum arus but if it is so then should you not make a mark with him for me for united states senator i really have some chance another candidate besides mr lincoln was seeking the seat in the united states senate soon to be vacated by mr shields this was lyman trumbull an anti-slavery democrat when the legislature met it was found that mr lincoln lacked five votes of an election while mr trumbull had but five supporters after several ballots mr lincoln feared that trumbull's votes would be given to a democratic candidate and he determined to sacrifice himself for the principle at stake accordingly he instructed his friends in the legislature to vote for judge trumbull which they did resulting in trumbull's election the abolitionists in the west had become very radical in their views and did not hesitate to talk of opposing the extension of slavery by the use of force if necessary 
Mr. Lincoln, on the other hand, was conservative and counseled moderation. In the meantime, many outrages growing out of the extension of slavery were being perpetrated on the borders of Kansas and Missouri, and they no doubt influenced Mr. Lincoln to take a more radical stand against the slavery question. An incident occurred at this time which had great effect in this direction. The Negro son of a colored woman in Springfield had gone south to work. He was born free, but did not have his free papers with him. He was arrested and would have been sold into slavery to pay his prison expenses had not Mr. Lincoln and some friends purchased his liberty. Previous to this, Mr. Lincoln had tried to secure the boy's release through the governor of Illinois, but the governor informed him that nothing could be done. Then it was that Mr. Lincoln rose to his full height and exclaimed, Governor, I'll make the ground in this country too hot for the foot of a slave, whether you have the legal power to secure the release of this boy or not. Helps to Organize the Republican Party The year after Mr. Trumbull's election to the Senate, the Republican Party was formally organized. A state convention of that party was called to meet at Bloomington, May 29, 1856. The call for this convention was signed by many Springfield Whigs, and among the names was that of Abraham Lincoln. Mr. Lincoln's name had been signed to the call by his law partner, but when he was informed of this action, he endorsed it fully. Among the famous men who took part in this convention were Abraham Lincoln, Lyman Trumbull, David Davis, Leonard Sweat, Richard Yates, Norman B. Judd, and Owen Lovejoy, the Alton editor, whose life, like Lincoln's, finally paid the penalty for his abolition views. The party nominated for governor William H. Bissell, a veteran of the Mexican War, and adopted a platform ringing with anti-slavery sentiment. Mr. Lincoln was the greatest power in the campaign that followed. He was one of the Fremont presidential electors, and he went to work with all his might to spread the new party gospel and make votes for the old pathfinder of the Rocky Mountains. An amusing incident followed close after the Bloomington Convention. A meeting was called at Springfield to ratify the action at Bloomington. Only three persons attended mr lincoln his law partner and a man named john payne mr lincoln made a speech to his colleagues in which among other things he said while all seems dead the age itself is not it liveth as sure as our maker liveth in this campaign mr lincoln was in general demand not only in his own state but in indiana iowa and wisconsin as well the result of that presidential campaign was the election of Buchanan as president, Bissell as governor, leaving Mr. Lincoln the undisputed leader of the new party. Hence it was that two years later he was the inevitable man to oppose Judge Douglas in the campaign for United States Senator. The Rail Splitter versus the Little Giant no record of Abraham Lincoln's career would be complete without the story of the memorable joint debate between the rail splitter of the Sangamon Valley and the Little Giant. The opening lines in Mr. Lincoln's speech to the Republican Convention were not only prophetic of the coming rebellion, but they clearly made the issue between the Republican and Democratic parties for two presidential campaigns to follow. The memorable sentences were as follows. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall. But I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all the one thing or the other. Either the opponents of slavery will arrest the further spread of it and place it where the public mind shall rest in the belief that it is in the course of ultimate extinction, or its abogus will push it forward till it becomes alike lawful in all the states, old as well as new, north as well as south. It is universally conceded that this speech contained the most important utterances of Mr. Lincoln's life. Previous to its delivery, the Democratic Convention had endorsed Mr. Douglas for re-election to the Senate, and the Republican Convention had resolved that Abraham Lincoln is our first and only choice for United States Senator to fill the vacancy about to be created by the expiration of Mr. Douglas's term of office. 
Before Judge Douglas had made many speeches in this senatorial campaign, Mr. Lincoln challenged him to a joint debate, which was accepted, and seven memorable meetings between these two great leaders followed. The places and dates were Ottawa, August 21st, Freeport, August 27th, Jonesboro, September 15th, Charleston, September 18th, Galesburg, October 7th, Quincy, October 13th, and Alton, October 15th. The debates not only attracted the attention of the people in the state of Illinois, but aroused an interest throughout the whole country equal to that of a presidential election. Were like crowds at a circus. All the meetings of the joint debate were attended by immense crowds of people. They came in all sorts of vehicles, on horseback, and many walked weary miles on foot to hear these two great leaders discuss the issues of the campaign. There had never been political meetings held under such unusual conditions as these, and there probably never will be again. At every place, the speakers were met by great crowds of their friends and escorted to the platforms in the open air where the debates were held. The processions that escorted the speakers were most unique. They carried flags and banners and were preceded by bands of music. The people discharged cannons when they had them, and when they did not, blacksmith's anvils were made to take their places. Oftentimes a part of the escort would be mounted, and in most of the processions were chariots containing young ladies representing the different states of the Union designated by banners they carried. Besides the bands, there was usually vocal music. Patriotic songs were the order of the day, the star-spangled banner and Hail Columbia being great favorites. So far as the crowds were concerned, these joint debates took on the appearance of a circus day, and this comparison was strengthened by the sale of lemonade, fruit, melons, and confectionery on the outskirts of the gatherings. At Ottawa, after his speech, Mr. Lincoln was carried around on the shoulders of his enthusiastic supporters, who did not put him down until they reached the place where he was to spend the night. In the joint debates, each of the candidates asked the other a series of questions. Judge Douglas's replies to Mr. Lincoln's shrewd questions helped Douglas to win the senatorial election, but they lost him the support of the South in the campaign for president two years thereafter. Mr. Lincoln was told when he framed his questions that if Douglas answers them in the way it was believed he would, that the answers would make him senator. That may be, said Mr. Lincoln, but if he takes that shoe, he never can be president. The prophecy was correct. Mr. Douglas was elected senator, but two years later only carried one state, Missouri, for president. His Buckeye Campaign After the close of this canvass, Mr. Lincoln again devoted himself to the practice of his profession, but he was destined to remain but a short time in retirement. In the fall of 1859, Mr. Douglas went to Ohio to stump the state for his friend, Mr. Pugh, the Democratic candidate for governor. The Ohio Republicans at once asked Mr. Lincoln to come to the state and reply to the little giant. He accepted the invitation and made two masterly speeches in the campaign. In one of them, delivered at Cincinnati, he prophesied the outcome of the rebellion if the Southern people attempted to divide the Union by force. Addressing himself particularly to the Kentuckians in the audience, he said, I have told you what we mean to do. I want to know now, when that thing takes place, what do you mean to do? I often hear it intimated that you mean to divide the Union whenever a Republican or anything like it is elected President of the United States. A voice, that is so. That is so, one of them says. I wonder if he is a Kentuckian. A voice, he is a Douglas man. Well then, I want to know what you are going to do with your half of it. Are you going to split the Ohio down through and push your half off a piece? Or are you going to keep it right alongside of us outrageous fellows? Or are you going to build up a wall some way between your country and ours, by which that movable property of yours can't come over here any more to the danger of your losing it? Do you think you can better yourselves on that subject by leaving us here under no obligation whatever to return those specimens of your movable property that come hither? 
you have divided the union because we would not do right with you as you think upon that subject when we cease to be under the obligations to do anything for you how much better off do you think you will be will you make war upon us and kill us all why gentlemen i think you are as gallant and as brave men as live that you can fight as bravely in a good cause man for man as any other people living that you have shown yourselves capable of this upon various occasions but man for man you are not better than we are and there are not so many of you as there are of us you will never make much of a hand at whipping us if we were fewer in numbers than you i think that you could whip us if we were equal it would likely be a drawn battle but being inferior in numbers you will make nothing by attempting to master us but perhaps i have addressed myself as long or longer to the kentuckians than i ought to have done inasmuch as i have said that whatever course you take we intend in the end to beat you first visit to new york later in the year mr lincoln also spoke in kansas where he was received with great enthusiasm and in february of the following year he made his great speech in cooper union new york to an immense gathering presided over by william cullen bryan the poet who was then editor of the new york evening post there was a great curiosity to see the western rail splitter who had so lately met the famous little giant of the west in debate and mr lincoln's speech was listened to by many of the ablest men in the east this speech won for him many supporters in the presidential campaign that followed for his hearers at once recognized his wonderful ability to deal with the questions then uppermost in the public mind first nomination for president the republican national convention of eighteen sixty met in chicago may sixteen in an immense building called the wigwam the leading candidates for president were william h seward of new york and abraham lincoln of illinois among others spoken of were salmon p chase of ohio and simon cameron of pennsylvania on the first ballot for president mr seward received one hundred and seventy three and a half votes mr lincoln one hundred and two votes the others scattering on the first ballot vermont had divided her vote but on the second the chairman of the vermont delegation announced vermont casts her ten votes for the young giant of the west abraham lincoln this was the turning point in the convention toward mr lincoln's nomination the second ballot resulted seward one hundred and eighty four and one half lincoln one hundred and eighty one on the third ballot mr lincoln received two hundred and thirty votes one and a half votes more would nominate him before the ballot was announced ohio made a change of four votes in favor of mr lincoln making him the nominee for president other states tried to follow ohio's example but it was a long time before any of the delegates could make themselves heard cannons planted on top of the wigwam were roaring and booming the large crowds in the wigwam and the immense throng outside were cheering at the top of their lungs while bands were playing victorious airs when order had been restored it was announced that on the third ballot abraham lincoln of illinois had received three hundred and fifty four votes and was nominated by the republican party to the office of president of the united states mr lincoln heard the news of his nomination while sitting in a newspaper office in springfield and hurried home to tell his wife as mr lincoln had predicted judge douglas position on slavery in the territories lost him the support of the south and when the democratic convention met at charleston the slaveholding states forced the nomination of john c breckinridge a considerable number of people who did not agree with either party nominated john bell of tennessee in the election which followed mr lincoln carried all of the free states except new jersey which was divided between himself and douglas breckinridge carried all the slave states except kentucky tennessee and virginia which went for bell and missouri gave its vote to douglas formation of the southern confederacy the election was scarcely over before it was evident that the southern states did not intend to abide by the result and that a conspiracy was on foot to divide the union 
Before the presidential election even, the Secretary of War in President Buchanan's cabinet had removed 150,000 muskets from government armories in the North and sent them to government armories in the South. Before Mr. Lincoln had prepared his inaugural address, South Carolina, which took the lead in the secession movement, had declared through her legislature her separation from the Union. Before Mr. Lincoln took his seat, other southern states had followed the example of South Carolina, and a convention had been held at Montgomery, Alabama, which had elected Jefferson Davis, president of the new Confederacy, and Alexander H. Stevens of Georgia, vice president. Southern men in the cabinet, senate, and house had resigned their seats and gone home, and southern states were demanding that southern forts and government property in their section should be turned over to them. Between his election and inauguration, Mr. Lincoln remained silent, reserving his opinions and a declaration of his policy for his inaugural address. Before Mr. Lincoln's departure from Springfield for Washington, threats had been freely made that he would never reach the Capitol alive, and, in fact, a conspiracy was then afoot to take his life in the city of Baltimore. Mr. Lincoln left Springfield on February the 11th in company with his wife and three sons, his brother-in-law, Dr. W.S. Wallace, David Davis, Norman B. Judge, Elmer E. Ellsworth, Ward H. Lehman, Colonel E. V. Sunder of the United States Army, and the President's two secretaries. Goodbye to the Old Folk Early in February, before leaving for Washington, Mr. Lincoln slipped away from Springfield and paid a visit to his aged stepmother in Coles County. He also paid a visit to the unmarked grave of his father and ordered a suitable stone to mark the spot. Before leaving Springfield, he made an address to his fellow townsmen, in which he displayed sincere sorrow at parting from them. Friends, he said, no one who has never been placed in a like position can understand my feelings at this hour, nor the oppressive sadness I feel at this parting. For more than a quarter of a century I have lived among you, and during all that time I have received nothing but kindness at your hands. Here I have lived from my youth until now I am an old man. Here the most sacred ties of earth were assumed. Here all my children were born, and here one of them lies buried. To you, dear friends, I owe all that I have, all that I am. All the strange checkered past seems to crowd now upon my mind. Today I leave you. I go to assume a task more difficult than that which devolved upon Washington. Unless the great God who assisted him shall be with and aid me, I must fail. But if the same omniscient mind and almighty arm that directed and protected him shall guide and support me, I shall not fail. I shall succeed. Let us all pray that the God of our fathers may not forsake us now. To him I commend you all. Permit me to ask that with equal sincerity and faith you will invoke his wisdom and guidance for me. With these words I must leave you, for how long I know not. Friends, one and all, I must now bid you an affectionate farewell. The journey from Springfield to Philadelphia was a continuous ovation for Mr. Lincoln. Crowds assembled to meet him at the various places along the way, and he made them short speeches, full of humor and good feeling. At Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, the party was met by Alan Pinkerton, who knew of the plot in Baltimore to take the life of Mr. Lincoln. THE SECRET PASSAGE TO WASHINGTON Throughout his entire life, Abraham Lincoln's physical courage was as great and superb as his moral courage. When Mr. Pinkerton and Mr. Judd urged the president-elect to leave for Washington that night, he positively refused to do it. He said he had made an engagement to assist at a flag-raising in the forenoon of the next day, and to show himself to the people of Harrisburg in the afternoon, and that he intended to keep both engagements. At Philadelphia, the President's party was met by Mr. Seward's son, Frederick, who had been sent to warn Mr. Lincoln of the plot against his life. 
mr judd mr pinkerton and mr layman figured out a plan to take mr lincoln through baltimore between midnight and daybreak when the would-be assassins would not be expecting him and this plan was carried out so thoroughly that even the conductor on the train did not know the president-elect was on board mr lincoln was put into his berth and the curtains drawn he was supposed to be a sick man when the conductor came round mr pinkerton handed him the sick man's ticket and he passed on without question when the train reached baltimore at half past three o'clock in the morning it was met by one of mr pinkerton's detectives who reported that everything was all right and in a short time the party was speeding on to the national capital where rooms had been engaged for mr lincoln and his guard at willard's hotel mr lincoln always regretted this secret passage to washington for it was repugnant to a man of his high courage he had agreed to the plan simply because all of his friends urged it as the best thing to do now that all the facts are known it is assured that his friends were right and that there never was a moment from the day he crossed the maryland line until his assassination that his life was not in danger and was only saved as long as it was by the constant vigilance of those who were guarding him End of part twenty eight Part twenty nine of Lincoln's Yarns and Stories by Alexander K. McClure. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part twenty nine. His Eloquent Inaugural Address. The wonderful eloquence of Abraham Lincoln, clear, sincere, natural, found grand expression in his first inaugural address, in which he not only outlined his policy toward the states in rebellion, but made that beautiful and eloquent plea for conciliation the closing sentences of mr lincoln's first inaugural address deservedly take rank with his gettysburg speech in your hands my dissatisfied fellow countrymen he said and not in mine is the momentous issue of civil war the government will not assail you you can have no conflict without being yourselves the aggressors you have no oath registered in heaven to destroy the government while i shall have the most solemn one to preserve protect and defend it i am loath to close we are not enemies but friends we must not be enemies though passion may have strained it must not break our bonds of affection the mystic cord of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of the union when again touched as surely they will be by the better angels of our nature follows precedent of washington in selecting his cabinet mr lincoln consciously or unconsciously followed a precedent established by washington of selecting men of almost opposite opinions his cabinet was composed of william h seward of new york secretary of state simon p chase of ohio secretary of the treasury simon cameron of pennsylvania secretary of war gideon e wells of connecticut secretary of the navy caleb b smith of indiana secretary of the interior montgomery blair of maryland postmaster general edward bates of missouri attorney general mr chase although an anti-slavery leader was a state's right federal republican while mr seward was a whig without having connected himself with the anti-slavery movement mr chase and mr seward the leading men of mr lincoln's cabinet were as widely apart and antagonistic in their views as were jefferson the democrat and hamilton the federalist the two leaders in washington's cabinet but in bringing together these two strong men as his chief advisers both of whom had been rival candidates for the presidency mr lincoln gave another example of his own greatness and self-reliance and put them both in a position to render greater service to the government than they could have done probably as president mr lincoln had been in office little more than five weeks when the war of the rebellion began by the firing on fort sumter greater diplomat than seward 
the war of the rebellion revealed to the people in fact to the whole world the many sides of abraham lincoln's character it showed him as a real ruler of men not a ruler by the mere power of might but by the power of a great brain in his cabinet were the ablest men in the country yet they all knew that lincoln was abler than any of them mr seward the secretary of state was a man famed in statesmanship and diplomacy during the early stages of the civil war when france and england were seeking an excuse to interfere and help the southern confederacy mr seward wrote a letter to our minister in london charles francis adams instructing him concerning the attitude of the federal government on the question of interference which would undoubtedly have brought about a war with england if abraham lincoln had not corrected and amended the letter he did this too without yielding a point or sacrificing in any way his own dignity or that of the country lincoln a great general throughout the four years of war mr lincoln spent a great deal of time in the war department receiving news from the front and conferring with secretary of war stanton concerning military affairs mr lincoln's war secretary edwin m stanton who had succeeded simon cameron was a man of wonderful personality and iron will it is generally conceded that no other man could have managed the great war secretary so well as lincoln stanton had his way in most matters but when there was an important difference of opinion he always found lincoln was the master although mr lincoln's communication to the generals in the field were oftener in the nature of suggestions than positive orders every military leader recognized mr lincoln's ability in military operations in the early stages of the war mr lincoln followed closely every plan and movement of mcclellan and the correspondence between them proves mr lincoln to have been far the abler general of the two he kept close watch of burnside too and when he gave the command of the army of the potomac to fighting joe hooker he also gave that general some fatherly counsel and advice which was of great benefit to him as a commander absolute confidence in grant it was not until general grant had been made commander-in-chief that president lincoln felt he had at last found a general who did not need much advice he was the first to recognize that grant was a great military leader and when he once felt sure of this fact nothing could shake his confidence in that general delegation after delegation called at the white house and asked for grant's removal from the head of the army they accused him of being a butcher a drunkard a man without sense or feeling president lincoln listened to all of these attacks but he always had an apt answer to silence grant's enemies grant was doing what lincoln wanted done from the first he was fighting and winning victories and victories are the only thing that count in war reasons for freeing the slaves the crowning act of lincoln's career as president was the emancipation of the slaves all of his life he had believed in gradual emancipation but all of his plans contemplated payment to the slaveholders while he had always been opposed to slavery he did not take any steps to use it as a war measure until about the middle of eighteen sixty two his chief object was to preserve the union he wrote to horace greeley that if he could save the union without freeing any of the slaves he would do it that if he could save it by freeing some and leaving others in slavery he would do that that if it became necessary to free all the slaves in order to save the union he would take that course the anti-slavery men were continually urging mr lincoln to set the slaves free but he paid no attention to their petitions and demands until he felt that emancipation would help him to preserve the union of the states the outlook for the union cause grew darker and darker in eighteen sixty two and mr lincoln began to think as he expressed it that he must change his tactics or lose the game accordingly he decided to issue the emancipation proclamation as soon as the union army won a substantial victory the battle of antietam on september seventeen gave him the opportunity he sought he told secretary chase that he had made a solemn vow before god that if general lee should be driven back from pennsylvania he would crown the result by a declaration of freedom to the slaves 
on the twenty second of that month he issued a proclamation stating that at the end of one hundred days he would issue another proclamation declaring all slaves within any state or territory to be forever free which was done in the form of the famous emancipation proclamation hard to refuse pardons in the conduct of the war and in his purpose to maintain the union abraham lincoln exhibited a will of iron and determination that could not be shaken but in his daily contact with the mothers wives and daughters begging for the life of some soldier who had been condemned to death for desertion or sleeping on duty he was as gentle and weak as a woman it was a difficult matter for him to refuse a pardon if the slightest excuse could be found for granting it secretary stanton and the commanding generals were loud in declaring that mr lincoln would destroy the discipline of the army by his wholesale pardoning of condemned soldiers but when we come to examine the individual cases we find that lincoln was nearly always right and when he erred it was always on the side of humanity during the four years of the long struggle for the preservation of the union mr lincoln kept open shop as he expressed it where the general public could always see him and make known their wants and complaints even the private soldier was not denied admittance to the president's private office and no request or complaint was too small or trivial to enlist his sympathy and interest a fun-loving and humor-loving man it was once said of Shakespeare that the great mind that conceived the tragedies of Hamlet, Macbeth, etc., would have lost its reason if it had not found vent in the sparkling humor of such comedies as The Merry Wives of Windsor and The Comedy of Errors. The great strain on the mind of Abraham Lincoln, produced by four years of civil war, might likewise have overcome his reason had it not found vent in the yarns and stories he constantly told no more fun-loving or humor-loving man than abraham lincoln ever lived he enjoyed a joke even when it was on himself and probably while he got his greatest enjoyment from telling stories he had a keen appreciation of the humor in those that were told to him his favorite humorous writer was david r locke better known as petroleum v nasby whose political sapphires were quite famous in their day nearly every prominent man who has written his recollections of lincoln has told how the president in the middle of a conversation on some serious subject would suddenly stop and ask his hearer if he ever read the nasby letters then he would take from his desk a pamphlet containing the letters and proceed to read them laughing heartily at the good points they contained there is probably no better evidence of mr lincoln's love of humor and appreciation of it than his letter to nasby in which he said for the ability to write these things i would gladly trade places with you mr lincoln was re-elected president in eighteen sixty four his opponent on the democratic ticket was general george b mcclellan whose command of the army of the potomac had been so unsatisfactory at the beginning of the war mr lincoln's election was almost unanimous as mcclellan carried but three states delaware kentucky and new jersey general grant in a telegram of congratulation said that it was a victory worth more to the country than a battle won the war was fast drawing to a close the black war clouds were breaking and rolling away sherman had made his famous march to the sea through swamp and ravine grant was rapidly tightening the lines around richmond thomas had won his title of the rock of chickamauga sheridan had won his spurs as the great modern cavalry commander and had cleaned out the shenandoah valley sherman was coming back from his famous march to join grant at richmond the confederacy was without a navy the kearsarge had sunk the alabama and farragut had fought and won the famous victory in mobile bay it was certain that lee would soon have to evacuate richmond only to fall into the hands of grant lincoln saw the dawn of peace when he came to deliver his second inaugural address it contained no note of victory no exultation over a fallen foe on the contrary it breathed the spirit of brotherly love and of prayer for an early peace 
with malice toward none with charity for all with firmness in the right as god gives us to see the right let us finish the work we are in to bind up the nation's wounds to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphans to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations not long thereafter general lee evacuated richmond with about half of his original army closely pursued by grant the boys in blue overtook their brothers in gray at appomattox courthouse and there beneath the warm rays of an april sun the great confederate general made his final surrender the war was over the american flag was floated over all the territory of the united states and peace was now a reality mr lincoln visited richmond and the final scenes of the war and then returned to washington to carry out his announced plan of binding up the nation's wounds he had now reached the climax of his career and touched the highest point of his greatness his great task was over and the heavy burden that had so long worn upon his heart was lifted while the whole nation was rejoicing over the return of peace the savior of the union was stricken down by the hand of an assassin. End of a part twenty nine. Part thirty of Lincoln's Yarns and Stories by Alexander K. McClure. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part thirty. Warnings of his tragic death. From early youth, Mr. Lincoln had presentiments that he would die a violent death or rather that his final days would be marked by some great tragic event from the time of his first election to the presidency his closest friends had tried to make him understand that he was in constant danger of assassination but notwithstanding his presentiments he had such splendid courage that he only laughed at their fears during the summer months he lived at the soldier's home some miles from washington and frequently made the trip between the white house and the home without a guard or escort secretary of war stanton and ward layman marshal of the district were almost constantly alarmed over mr lincoln's carelessness in exposing himself to the danger of assassination they warned him time and again and provided suitable bodyguards to attend him but mr lincoln would often give the guards the slip and mounting his favorite riding horse old abe would set out alone after dark from the white house or the soldier's home while riding to the home one night he was fired upon by someone in ambush the bullet passing through his high hat mr lincoln would not admit that the man who fired the shot had tried to kill him he always attributed it to an accident and begged his friends to say nothing about it now that all the circumstances of the assassination are known it is plain that there was a deep laid and well-conceived plot to kill mr lincoln long before the crime was actually committed when mr lincoln was delivering his second inaugural address on the steps of the capitol an excited individual tried to force his way through the guards in the building to get on the platform with mr lincoln it was afterward learned that this man was john wilkes booth who afterwards assassinated Mr. Lincoln in Ford's Theater on the night of the 14th of April. Lincoln at the Theater The manager of the theater had invited the president to witness a performance of a new play known as Our American Cousin, in which the famous actress Laura Keene was playing. Mr. Lincoln was particularly fond of the theater. He loved Shakespeare's plays above all others, and never missed a chance to see the leading Shakespearean actors as our american cousin was a new play the president did not care particularly to see it but as mrs lincoln was anxious to go he consented and accepted the invitation general grant was in washington at the time and as he was extremely anxious about the personal safety of the president he reported every day regularly at the white house mr lincoln invited general grant and his wife to accompany him and mrs lincoln to the theater on the night of the assassination and the general accepted but while they were talking he received a note from mrs grant saying that she wished to leave washington that evening to visit her daughter in burlington general grant made his excuses to the president and left to accompany mrs grant to the railway station 
It afterwards became known that it was also a part of the plot to assassinate General Grant, and only Mrs. Grant's departure from Washington that evening prevented the attempt from being made. General Grant afterwards said that as he and Mrs. Grant were riding along Pennsylvania Avenue to the railway station, a horseman rode rapidly by at a gallop and, wheeling his horse, rode back, peering into their carriage as he passed. Mrs. Grant remarked to the general, "'That is the very man who sat near us at luncheon today and tried to overhear our conversation. He was so rude, you remember, as to cause us to leave the dining-room.' Here he is again, riding after us. General Grant attributed the action of the man to idle curiosity, but learned afterwards that the horseman was John Wilkes Booth. Layman's Remarkable Request Probably one reason why Mr. Lincoln did not particularly care to go to the theater that night was a sort of half-promise he had made to his friend and bodyguard, Marshal Layman. Two days previous, he had sent Lehman to Richmond on business connected with the call of a convention for reconstruction. Before leaving, Mr. Lehman saw Mr. Usher, the Secretary of the Interior, and asked him to persuade Mr. Lincoln to use more caution about his personal safety and to go out as little as possible while Lehman was absent. Together they went to see Mr. Lincoln, and Lehman asked the President if he would make him a promise. I think I can venture to say I will, said Mr. Lincoln. What is it? Promise me that you will not go out after night while I am gone, said Mr. Lehman, particularly to the theater. Mr. Lincoln turned to Mr. Usher and said, Usher, this boy is a monomaniac on the subject of my safety. I can hear him, or hear of his being around at all times in the night, to prevent somebody from murdering me. He thinks I shall be killed, and we think he is going crazy. What does anyone want to assassinate me for? If anyone wants to do so, he can do it any day or night if he is ready to give his life for mine. It is nonsense. Mr. Usher said to Mr. Lincoln that it was well to heed Layman's warning, as he was thrown among people from whom he had better opportunities to know about such matters than almost anyone. Well, said Mr. Lincoln to Layman, I promise to do the best I can toward it. How Lincoln Was Murdered The assassination of President Lincoln was most carefully planned, even to the smallest detail. The box set apart for the President's party was a double one in the second tier at the left of the stage. The box had two doors with spring locks, but Booth had loosened the screws with which they were fastened so that it was impossible to secure them from the inside. In one door he had bored a hole with a gimlet so that he could see what was going on inside the box. An employee of the theater by the name of Spangler, who was an accomplice of the assassin, had even arranged the seats in the box to suit the purpose of Booth. On the fateful night the theater was packed. The presidential party arrived a few minutes after nine o'clock, and consisted of the President and Mrs. Lincoln, Miss Harris and Major Rathbone, daughter and stepson of Senator Harris of New York. The immense audience rose to its feet and cheered the President as he passed to his box. Booth came into the theater about ten o'clock. He had not only planned to kill the President, but he had also planned to escape into Maryland, and a swift horse, saddled and ready for the journey, was tied in the rear of the theater. For a few minutes he pretended to be interested in the performance, and then gradually made his way back to the door of the President's box. Before reaching there, however, he was confronted by one of the President's messengers, who had been stationed at the end of the passage leading to the boxes to prevent anyone from intruding. To this man, Booth handed a card, saying that the President had sent for him and was permitted to enter. Once inside the hallway leading to the boxes, he closed the hall door and fastened it by a bar prepared for the occasion, so that it was impossible to open it from without. Then he quickly entered the box through the right-hand door. The President was sitting in an easy armchair in the left-hand corner of the box nearest the audience. He was leaning on one hand, and with the other had hold of a portion of the drapery. There was a smile on his face. The other members of the party were intently watching the performance on the stage. 
the assassin carried in his right hand a small silver-mounted derringer pistol and in his left a long double-edged dagger he placed the pistol just behind the president's left ear and fired mr lincoln bent slightly forward and his eyes closed but in every other respect his attitude remained unchanged the report of the pistol startled major rathbone who sprang to his feet the murderer was then about six feet from the president and rathbone grappled with him but was shaken off dropping his pistol booth struck at rathbone with the dagger and inflicted a severe wound the assassin then placed his left hand lightly on the railing of the box and jumped to the stage eight or nine feet below booth brandishes his dagger and escapes the box was draped with the american flag and in jumping booth's spurs caught in the folds tearing down the flag the assassin falling heavily to the stage and spraining his ankle he arose however and walked theatrically across the stage brandishing his knife and shouted six semper terinus and then added the south is avenged for the moment the audience was horrified and incapable of action one man only a lawyer named stewart had sufficient presence of mind to leap upon the stage and attempt to capture the assassin booth went to the rear door of the stage where his horse was held in readiness for him and leaping into the saddle dashed through the streets toward virginia miss keene rushed to the president's box with water and stimulants and medical aid was summoned by this time the audience realized the tragedy that had been enacted and then followed a scene such as has never been witnessed in any public gathering in this country women wept shrieked and fainted men raved and swore and horror was depicted on every face before the audience could be gotten out of the theater horsemen were dashing through the streets and the telegraph was carrying the terrible details of the tragedy throughout the nation walt whitman's description walt whitman the poet has sketched in graphic language the scene of that most eventful fourteenth of april his account of the assassination has become historic and is herewith given the day april fourteenth eighteen sixty five seems to have been a pleasant one throughout the whole land the moral atmosphere pleasant too the long storm so dark so fratricidal full of blood and doubt and gloom over and ended at last by the sunrise of such an absolute national victory and utter breaking down of secession we almost doubted our senses lee had capitulated beneath the apple tree at appomattox the other armies the flanges of the revolt swiftly followed and could it really be then out of all the affairs of this world of woe and passion of failure and disorder and dismay was there really come the confirmed unerring sign of peace like a shaft of pure light of rightful rule of god but i must not dwell on accessories the deed hastens the popular afternoon paper the little evening star had scattered all over its third page divided among the advertisements in a sensational manner in a hundred different places the president and his lady will be at the theatre this evening lincoln was fond of the theatre i have myself seen him there several times i remember thinking how funny it was that he the leading actor in the greatest and stormiest drama known to real history stage through centuries should sit there and be so completely interested in those human jackstraws moving about with their silly little gestures foreign spirit and flatulent text so the day as i say was propitious early herbage early flowers were out i remember where i was stopping at the time the season being advanced there were many lilacs in full bloom by one of those caprices that enter and give tinge to events without being a part of them i find myself always reminded of the great tragedy of this day by the sight and odor of these blossoms it never fails on this occasion the theatre was crowded many ladies in rich and gay costumes officers in their uniforms many well-known citizens young folks the usual cluster of gas-lights the usual magnetism of so many people 
cheerful with perfumes music of violins and flutes and over all that saturating that vast vague wonder victory the nation's victory the triumph of the union filling the air the thought the sense with exhilaration more than all the perfumes the president came betimes and with his wife witnessed the play from the large stage boxes of the second tier two thrown into one and profusely draped with the national flag the acts and scenes of the piece one of those singularly witless compositions which have at the least the merit of giving an entire relief to an audience engaged in mental action or business excitements and cares during the day as it makes not the slightest call on either the moral emotional aesthetic or spiritual nature a piece in which among other characters so called a yankee certainly such a one as was never seen or at least like it ever seen in north america is introduced in england with a varied falderal of talk plot scenery and such phantasmagoria as goes to make up a modern popular drama had progressed perhaps through a couple of its acts when in the midst of this comedy or tragedy or none such or whatever it is to be called and to offset it or finish it out as if in nature's and the great muse's mockery of these poor mimics comes interpolated that scene not really or exactly to be described at all for on the many hundreds who were there it seems to this hour to have left little but a passing blur a dream a blotch and yet partially described as i now proceed to give it there is a scene in the play representing the modern parlor in which two unprecedented ladies are informed by the unprecedented and impossible yankee that he is not a man of fortune and therefore undesirable for marriage-catching purposes after which the comments being finished the dramatic trio make exit leaving the stage clear for a moment there was a pause a hush as it were at this period came the death of abraham lincoln great as that was with all its manifold trains circling around it and stretching into the future for many a century in the politics history art etc of the new world in point of fact the main thing the actual murder transpired with the quiet and simplicity of any commonest occurrence the bursting of a bud or pod in the growth of vegetation for instance through the general hum following the stage pause with the change of position etc came the muffled sound of a pistol shot which not one hundredth part of the audience heard at the time and yet a moment's hush somehow surely a vague startled thrill and then through the ornamented draperied starred and striped spaceway of the president's box a sudden figure a man raises himself with hands and feet stands a moment on the railing leaps below to the stage falls out of position catching his boot heel in the copious drapery the american flag falls on one knee quickly recovers himself rises as if nothing had happened he really sprains his ankle unfelt then and the figure booth the murderer dressed in plain black broadcloth bareheaded with a full head of glossy raven hair and his eyes like some mad animals flashing with light and resolution yet with a certain strange calmness holds aloft in one hand a large knife walks along not much back of the footlights turns fully toward the audience his face of statuesque beauty lit by those basilisk eyes flashing with desperation perhaps insanity launches out in a firm and steady voice the words sic semper terinus and then walks with neither slow nor very rapid pace diagonally across to the back of the stage and disappears had not all this terrible scene making the mimic ones preposterous had it not all been rehearsed in blank by booth beforehand a moment's hush incredulous a scream a cry of murder mrs lincoln leaning out of the box with ashy cheeks and lips with involuntary cry pointing to the retreating figure he has killed the president and still a moment's strange incredulous suspense 
and then the deluge then that mixture of horror noises uncertainty the sound somewhere back of a horse's hooves clattering with speed the people burst through chairs and railings and break them up that noise adds to the queerness of the scene there is inextricable confusion and terror women faint quite feeble persons fall and are trampled on many cries of agony are heard the broad stage suddenly fills to suffocation with a dense and motley crowd like some horrible carnival the audience rush generally upon it at least the strong men do the actors and actresses are there in their play costumes and painted faces with mortal fright showing through the rouge some trembling some in tears the screams and calls confused talk redoubled trebled two or three manage to pass up water from the stage to the president's box others try to clamber up etc etc in the midst of all this the soldiers of the president's guard with others suddenly drawn to the scene burst in some two hundred altogether they stormed the house through all the tiers especially the upper ones inflamed with fury literally charging the audience with fixed bayonets muskets and pistols shouting clear out clear out such a wild scene or a suggestion of it rather inside the playhouse that night outside too in the atmosphere of shock and craze crowds of people filled with frenzy ready to seize any outlet for it came near committing murder several times on innocent individuals one such case was particularly exciting the infuriated crowd through some chance got started against one man either for words he uttered or perhaps without any cause at all and were proceeding to hang him at once to a neighboring lamp-post when he was rescued by a few heroic policemen who placed him in their midst and fought their way slowly and amid great peril toward the station-house it was a fitting episode of the whole affair the crowd rushing and eddying to and fro the night the yells the pale faces many frightened people trying in vain to extricate themselves the attacked man not yet freed from the jaws of death looking like a corpse the silent resolute half-dozen policemen with no weapon but their little clubs yet stern and steady through all those eddying swarms made indeed a fitting side scene to the grand tragedy of the murder they gained the station house with the protected man whom they placed in security for the night and discharged in the morning and in the midst of that night pandemonium of senseless hate infuriated soldiers the audience and the crowd the stage and all its actors and actresses its paint pots spangles gaslights the life blood from those veins the best and sweetest of the land drips slowly down the death's ooze already begins its little bubbles on the lips such hurriedly sketched were the accompaniments of the death of president lincoln so suddenly and in murder and horror unsurpassed he was taken from us but his death was painless the assassin's bullet did not produce instant death but the president never again became conscious he was carried to a house opposite the theatre where he died the next morning in the meantime the authorities had become aware of the wide-reaching conspiracy and the capital was in a state of terror on the night of the president's assassination mr seward secretary of state was attacked while in bed with a broken arm by booth's fellow conspirators and badly wounded the conspirators had also planned to take the lives of vice president johnson and secretary stanton booth had called on vice president johnson the day before and not finding him in left a card secretary stanton acted with his usual promptness and courage during the period of excitement he acted as president and directed the plans for the capture of booth among other things he issued the following reward reward offered by secretary stanton war department washington april twenty eighteen sixty five major general john a dix new york the murderer of our late beloved president abraham lincoln is still at large 
fifty thousand dollars reward will be paid by this department for his apprehension in addition to any reward offered by municipal authorities or state executives twenty five thousand dollars reward will be paid for the apprehension of g w atzerodt sometimes called port tobacco one of booth's accomplices twenty five thousand dollars reward will be paid for the apprehension of david c harold another of booth's accomplices a liberal reward will be paid for any information that shall conduce to the arrest of either the above-named criminals or their accomplices all persons harboring or secreting the said persons or either of them or aiding or assisting their concealment or escape will be treated as accomplices in the murder of the president and the attempted assassination of the secretary of state and shall be subject to trial before a military commission and the punishment of death let the stain of innocent blood be removed from the land by the arrest and punishment of the murderers all good citizens are exhorted to aid public justice on this occasion every man should consider his own conscience charged with this solemn duty and rest neither night nor day until it be accomplished edwin m stanton secretary of war booth found in a barn booth accompanied by david c harold a fellow conspirator finally made his way into maryland where eleven days after the assassination the two were discovered in a barn on garrett's farm near port royal on the rappahannock the barn was surrounded by a squad of cavalrymen who called upon the assassins to surrender harold gave himself up and was roundly cursed and abused by booth who declared that he would never be taken alive the cavalrymen then set fire to the barn and as the flames leaped up the figure of the assassin could be plainly seen although the wall of fire prevented him from seeing the soldiers colonel conger saw him standing upright upon a crutch with a carbine in his hands when the fire first blazed up booth crept on his hands and knees to the spot evidently for the purpose of shooting the man who had applied the torch but the plays prevented him from seeing any one then it seemed as if he were preparing to extinguish the flames but seeing the impossibility of this he started toward the door with his carbine held ready for action his eyes shone with the light of fever but he was pale as death and his general appearance was haggard and unkempt he had shaved off his moustache and his hair was closely cropped both he and harold wore the uniforms of confederate soldiers booth shot by boston's corbett the last orders given to the squad pursuing booth were don't shoot booth but take him alive just as booth started to the door of the barn this order was disobeyed by a sergeant named boston corbett who fired through a crevice and shot booth in the neck the wounded man was carried out of the barn and died four hours afterward on the grass where they had laid him before he died he whispered to lieutenant baker tell mother i died for my country i thought i did for the best what became of booth's body has always been and probably always will be a mystery many different stories have been told concerning his final resting place but all that is known positively is that the body was first taken to washington and a post-mortem examination of it held on the monitor montauk on the night of april twenty seventh it was turned over to two men who took it in a rowboat and disposed of it secretly how they disposed of it none but themselves know and they have never told fate of the conspirators the conspiracy to assassinate the president involved altogether twenty-five people among the number captured and tried were david c harold g w azerot lewis payne edward spangler michael o'laughlin samuel arnold mrs surratt and dr samuel mudd a physician who set booth's leg which was sprained by his fall from the stage box of these harold azerot payne and mrs surratt were hanged dr mudd was deported to the dry tortugas while there an epidemic of yellow fever broke out and he rendered such good service that he was granted a pardon and died a number of years ago in maryland 
john surratt the son of the woman who was hanged made his escape to italy where he became one of the papal guards in the vatican at rome his presence there was discovered by archbishop hughes and although there were no extradition laws to cover his case the italian government gave him up to the united states authorities he had two trials at the first the jury disagreed the long delay before his second trial allowed him to escape by pleading the statute of limitation spangler and o'laughlin were sent to the dry tortugas and served their time ford the owner of the theatre in which the president was assassinated was a southern sympathizer and when he attempted to reopen his theatre after the great national tragedy secretary stanton refused to allow it the government afterward bought the theatre and turned it into a national museum president lincoln was buried at springfield and on the day of his funeral there was universal grief henry ward beecher's eulogy no final words of that great life can be more fitly spoken than the eulogy pronounced by henry ward beecher and now the martyr is moving in triumphal march mightier than when alive the nation rises up at every stage of his coming cities and states are his pallbearers and the cannon speaks the honors with solemn progression dead 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 he yet speaketh is washington dead is hampton dead is any man that was ever fit to live dead disenthralled of flesh risen to the unobstructed sphere where passion never comes he begins his illimitable work his life is now grafted upon the infinite and will be fruitful as no earthly life can be pass on thou that hast overcome ye people behold the martyr whose blood as so many articulate words please for fidelity for law for liberty abraham lincoln's family abraham lincoln was married on november four eighteen forty two to miss mary todd four sons being the issue of the union robert todd born august one eighteen forty three removed to chicago after his father's death practiced law and became wealthy in eighteen eighty one he was appointed secretary of war by president garfield and served through president arthur's term was made minister to england in eighteen eighty nine and served four years became counsel for the pullman palace car company and succeeded to the presidency of that corporation upon the death of george m pullman edward baker born march tenth eighteen forty six died in infancy william wallace born december twenty one eighteen fifty died in the white house in february eighteen sixty two thomas known as tad born april four eighteen fifty three died in eighteen seventy one mrs lincoln died in her sixty fourth year at the home of her sister mrs ninian w edwards at springfield illinois in eighteen eighty two she was the daughter of robert s todd of kentucky her great-uncle john todd and her grandfather levi todd accompanied general george rogers clark to illinois and were present at the capture of kaskaskia and vincennes in december seventeen seventy eight john todd was appointed by patrick henry governor of virginia to be lieutenant of the county of illinois then a part of virginia Colonel John Todd was one of the original proprietors of the town of Lexington, Kentucky. While encamped on the site of the present city, he heard of the opening battle of the Revolution and named his infant son Settlement in its honor. Mrs. Lincoln was a proud, ambitious woman, well-educated, speaking French fluently, and familiar with the ways of the best society in Lexington, Kentucky, where she was born December 13, 1818. She was a pupil of Madame Mantelli, whose celebrated seminary in Lexington was directly opposite the residence of Henry Clay. The conversation at the seminary was carried on entirely in French she visited springfield illinois in 1837 remained three months and then returned to her native state in 1839 she made springfield her permanent home 
she lived with her eldest sister elizabeth wife of ninian w edwards lincoln's colleague in the legislature and it was not strange she and lincoln should meet stephen a douglas was also a friend of the edwards family and a suitor for her hand but she rejected him to accept the future president she was one of the bells of the town she is thus described at the time she made her home in springfield eighteen thirty nine she was one of the average height weighing about a hundred and thirty pounds she was rather compactly built had a well-rounded face rich dark brown hair and bluish-gray eyes in her bearing she was proud but handsome and vivacious she was a good conversationalist using with equal fluency the french and english languages when she used a pen its point was sure to be sharp and she wrote with wit and ability she not only had a quick intellect but an intuitive judgment of men and their motives ordinarily she was affable and even charming in her manners but when offended or antagonized she could be very bitter and sarcastic in her figure and physical proportions in education bearing temperament history in everything she was the exact reverse of lincoln that mrs lincoln was very proud of her husband there is no doubt and it is probable that she married him largely from motives of ambition she knew lincoln better than he knew himself she instinctively felt that he would occupy a proud position some day and it is a matter of record that she told ward layman her husband's law partner that mr lincoln will yet be president of the united states mrs lincoln was decidedly pro-slavery in her views but this never disturbed lincoln in various ways they were unlike her fearless witty and austere nature had nothing in common with the calm imperturbable and simple ways of her thoughtful and absent-minded husband she was bright and sparkling in conversation and fit to grace any drawing-room she well knew that to marry lincoln meant not a life of luxury and ease for lincoln was not a man to accumulate wealth but in him she saw position in society prominence in the world and the grandest social distinction by that means her ambition was certainly satisfied for nineteen years after her marriage she was the first lady of the land and the mistress of the white house after his marriage by dint of untiring efforts and the recognition of influential friends the couple managed through rare frugality to move along in lincoln's struggles both in the law and for political advancement his wife shared his sacrifices she was a plucky little woman and in fact endowed with a more restless ambition than he she was gifted with a rare insight into the motives that actuate mankind and there is no doubt that much of lincoln's success was in a measure attributable to her acuteness and the stimulus of her influence his election to congress within four years after their marriage afforded her extreme gratification she loved power and prominence and was inordinately proud of her tall and ungainly husband she saw in him bright prospects ahead and his every move was watched by her with the closest interest if to other persons he seemed homely to her he was the embodiment of noble manhood and each succeeding day impressed upon her the wisdom of her choice of lincoln over douglas if in reality she ever seriously accepted the latter's attentions mr lincoln may not be as handsome a figure she said one day in lincoln's law office during her husband's absence when the conversation turned on douglas but the people are perhaps not aware that his heart is as large as his arms are long lincoln monument at springfield the remains of abraham lincoln rest beneath a magnificent monument in oak ridge cemetery springfield illinois before they were deposited in their final resting place they were moved many times on may four eighteen sixty five all that was mortal of abraham lincoln was deposited in the receiving vault at the cemetery until a tomb could be built in eighteen seventy six thieves made an unsuccessful attempt to steal the remains from the tomb the body of the martyred president was removed later to the monument 
a flight of iron steps commencing about fifty yards east of the vault ascends in a curved line to the monument an elevation of more than fifty feet excavation for this monument commenced september nine eighteen sixty nine it is built of granite from quarries at biddeford maine the rough ashlers were shipped to quincy massachusetts where they were dressed and numbered thence shipped to springfield it is seven hundred and twenty one feet from east to west a hundred and nineteen and a half feet from north to south and a hundred feet high the total cost is about two hundred and thirty thousand dollars to may first eighteen eighty five all the statuary is orange colored bronze the whole monument was designed by larkin g meade the statuary was modeled in plaster by him in florence italy and cast by the ames manufacturing company of chicopee massachusetts a statue of lincoln and the coat of arms were first placed on the monument the statue was unveiled and the monument dedicated october fifteenth eighteen seventy four infantry and naval groups were put on in september eighteen seventy seven an artillery group april thirteenth eighteen eighty two and a cavalry group march thirteenth eighteen eighty three the principal front of the monument is on the south side the statue of lincoln being on that side of the obelisk over memorial hall on the east side are three tablets upon which are the letters u s a to the right of that and beginning with virginia we find the abbreviations of the original thirteen states next comes vermont the first state admitted after the union was perfected the states following in the order they were admitted ending with nebraska on the east thus forming the cordon of thirty-seven states composing the united states of america when the monument was erected the new states admitted since the monument was built have been added the statue of lincoln is just above the coat of arms of the united states the grand climax is indicated by president lincoln with his left hand holding out as a golden scepter the emancipation proclamation while in his right he holds the pen with which he has just written it the right hand is resting on another badge of authority the american flag thrown over the fasces at the foot of the fasces lies a wreath of laurel with which to crown the president as the victor over slavery and rebellion on march tenth nineteen hundred president lincoln's body was removed to a temporary vault to permit of alterations to the monument the shaft was made twenty feet higher and other changes were made costing a hundred thousand dollars april twenty four nineteen o one the body was again transferred to the monument without public ceremony end of part thirty end of lincoln's yarns and stories by alexander k mcclure